The Mystery of Belicena Vilca by Nimrod de Rosario First Book The Disappearance of Tafi de Valle Chapter 1 I met Belicena Vilca when she was interned in the neuropsychiatric hospital, Dr. Javier Patron Isla, in the city of Salta, under diagnosis of irreversible senile dementia. Being medic of the B Pavilion of Incurable Patients, I had to pay attention to the referred patient for a long year in which I applied all the resources that the psychiatric science and my extensive experience in the profession gave to attempt, vainly, her recuperation. As will be seen later, her story was written by herself while she remained in that joyless confinement. She dedicated to that purpose all the available times, which was a lot because the medical joint had authorized her to write, due to the activity redounded in evident therapeutic results on the mood of the patient. Although no one knew to what referred her rights, and if they revealed some logical coherence, information which possession would have been helpful to confirm or correct to adverse diagnosis. Two reasons avoided to know the content of her writings. The first, and main reason, consisted that the patient wrote in Chequa, Santanguino, a language which is only spoken in her natal region. In secrecy, it seems Belicena Vilca translated the writings into Spanish a few days before she died. The second reason was the homicidal zeal that she put to avoid the reading of the texts, which ended one day in a violent incident with a nurse who dared to look at one of its pages. But as what concerned her was to maintain her calm, and the writing contributed to maintain her in that state. They opted to not contradict her maniac desires, and they allowed her to hide the writings in a briefcase from which she was never separated. However, part of her story was related to me by herself, during her convalescence, either through large monologues that were frequently on her psychoanalytic sessions, in the days in which some mental stability allowed this therapy, or involuntarily, when the narcosis treatment plunged her into a heavy stupor, where, however, never decreased her oral activity. Naturally, it was not possible to give credit to her statements, not only due to her diseased condition, but for the tenor of them, which were incredible and hallucinative. Her writings would never be qualified with more justice as an own story of a madwoman. The alienated situation of Belicena Vilca surely will discourage the readers about the veracity of the narrated events. It is comprehensible because just one year ago, I'd have made all possible to avoid the divulgation of the material that prudence and the professional ethic counsel to maintain in the reserved ambits of the clinical history and the personal expedient. But while this was happening, the sudden death of Belicena Vilca came to derange this rational perspective, and took me to think that history registers the pass of venerable figures by the cells of famous madhouses. I remember Nietzsche, Ezra Pound, Antonin Artaud, the chess player Morphy, the mathematician Cantor, and many others. I reasoned that those famous personages suffered from an acute schizophrenia as my patient, which means that the consciousness remains fragmented but not dissolved and it is possible, eventually, that some temporal lucidity states can occur where the behavior is more or less normal. I said to myself that if Cantor elaborated the brilliant theory of the transinfinite numbers in the material hospital, and if Nietzsche, during his ten years of internee, could quote Homer, Epodocles, and almost any classic by Rott, and the ancient Greek was possible, in an infinite fewer way, that the narration of Belicena Vilca was real in part. Of course, this apparently inconsistent sologism will surprise the reader, but all this I thought very quickly, very quickly because Belicena Vilca was murdered. Chapter 2 The unpleasant incident perturbed the impeccable march of the hospital submerging us in an indescribable state of discomfort and anguish. Specially affected was our director, the eminent Dr. Cortez who feared that the scandal could reach to smirch the name of the illustrious location excellence that the hospital had. Fact that, according to his clear logic, would influence in the checks that the powerful family of the deceased gave monthly. I will not fatigue the reader with the details because this case was very commented by the news, and if it is desired can consult the newspaper, El Geraldo, from Salta, in the editions of the week from the 7th to the 15th day of January in 1980, where you will find all the information. I will only remember here the essential, due to the development of the veridical case, requires to consider the strange circumstances in which the crime occurred, and the mystery that surrounded it. 
and that still persists because the police didn't achieve to clarify it and dignified functionaries manifest doubts about if that will be possible one day because two elements so absurd as irrational intervene in a definitive way in the fatal denouncement impeding any possibility to realize coherent conjectures the first is a verified unobjectionable fact the crime was committed in a cell for psychotic patients hermetically closed by a heavy steel door between zero hundred hours and o two hundred hours of january sixth without anyone absolutely anyone who would have entered during that lapse this was proved happily due to the fortuitous incident in the last night before january fifth i e day of celebration of the three wise men part of the staff went to distribute gifts to the children's hospital and the orphanage san francisco de assis within them was our distinguished dr cortez who at twenty-three hours was already back still wearing the santa claus costume and, and disposed to effectuate the daily journey that since countless years he realized through all the pavilions to pick up the final reports hence the own dr cortez saw for the last time belicena vilca alive at twenty-three fifty hours when due to a hysterical crisis on its second phase she promoted a general disorder in the b pavilion running desperately in the reduced pace of the cell with fixed and exorbitant eyes while she was screaming pachachut qui ye pachachut qui ye words which in that moment were incomprehensible for me even if we recognized that it was about the chechua language otherwise the attack was symptomatically abnormal to her dr cortez ordered an immediate dose of valium submerging the unfortunate belicena vilca in a stupper from which she could only get out for a moment to see the death closer just as suggested the tremendously horrifying expression which was twitched on her countenance when she was found already dead three hours later appears the mystery the first element that disconcerted and surprised the experimented cups after that the patient was attended at, at zero hundred hours all of us moved aside from the cell being thus closed by dr cortez who inadvertently saved the key in one of his customs of santa claus forgetting later to deposit it on the general keychain at three in the morning when the nurse in turn makes the habitual round she noticed the missing of the key what no one knew how to explain she deduced from this that the key was taken by dr cortez and as the duplicates are in his office she had no other alternative than to call him to his house it was not necessary because the operator of the internal commutator informed that the doctor was still in the hospital although he was just about to leave Warning him of this mistake, he decided to go up to the B pavilion to give the key and realize a brief ocular inspection. It means that during those three hours, the key, unique medium to open the blinded door of the cell, was in power of Dr. Cortez. But the director of the hospital was a man of a recognized social trajectory, whose moral virtues had always been exalted as an example worthy of emulation, and from whom, at last, no one would dare to doubt, neither the experimented policeman, Mayadana, in charge of the investigation finally dr cortez opened the door of the cell accompanied by me and the nurse garcia exactly at o oh, three hundred hours a penetrating and sweet smell was the first that caught our attention it was a fragrance like sandal incense which was out of place that we looked at each other perplexed but just for a moment because what came next concentrated all of our attention belicena vilca lying on her bed undoubtedly dead since some time ago with her neck swollen due to the strangulation that she was submitted the homicidal arm a rope ivory-colored was still enlaced on her head but already released and the two extremities falling gently over her chest were the corners up to the corners of the bed was such a horrible spectacle that the experimented nurse garcia exclaimed a terror screaming as she staggered back needing to be held by her shoulders although my legs were not strong at all and it was not for less the dead had her hands closed over the blankets on both sides of the body position where they had to be at the moment of death and that the cadaveric rigidity conserved what indicated that she didn't defend herself against the mysterious murderer he infused such terror that even looking how he passed the rope around her neck and then feeling it closing and cutting her breath she only desperately clung to the blankets such deduction was confirmed by the contemplation of the gesture of her visage big and exorbitant eyes a half-closed mouth allowing to see the swollen tongue which seemed to be broken on on an unfinished word something that may will never be pronounced again perchance the mysterious pachachut kui i will expose now the second absurd and irrational element which as it intervened with the weight of the concrete mo removed any hope to obtain a soon and simple solution i will explain it better the incomprehensible fact that the door was locked at the moment of the crime first element could be disregarded establishing the logic hypothesis 
even if they were improbable that the killer had another key, or the existence of a conspiracy of the medical staff, etc. After all, such hypothesis was formulated by the police in what they pretended was to despoil the case from any mystery or supernatural illusion. But the ivory-colored rope, second element, was a too tangible object to be ignored. The second element was the evidence that something sinister and irrational had been ir had been irresistibly installed among us. It was about a rope of one meter long, made of hair, apparently human, braided and tied. But the exceptional was represented by two gold medals, one on each side, turning madly in the two small cones of gold. The medals by themselves constituted the most absurd of the set, exactly equal in their form to a Star of David but were not, however, their engravings and inscriptions. One of them had chiseled a four-leaf clover wrought in the central hexagon. The other showed a fruit which undoubtedly corresponded to a pomegranate. I found them similar to the Masonic jewels that I saw in an exposition on the Rotary Club, but the familiarity ended when I remembered and reasoned that the only point of resemblance between these and them was the Star of David that, as everybody knows, is formed by two intertwined equilateral triangles. This is a symbol adopted since millenniums ago by the Hebrew people to identify themselves, as can be verified today seeing it in the flag of the State of Israel. The subsequent parts of the medals had inscriptions, but these, farther to clarify something, increased our confusion, because they were written in two different languages. One phrase, horizontally engraved in the center, was written in Hebrew characters, even though the signs were not the same on each medal. Surrounding these words was another inscription in Latin letters this time identical for both jewels. In that moment no one could clarify to what language they belonged. Ada, Ais, Side, Traoi, Mac, Which. The Hebrew words on their part said, In the pomegranate and in the clover. As will be understood, this curious bejeweled rope gave all the sensation to be something of a ceremonial or religious use. Attribute to the officer Maidana noticed immediately because at the first moment when he examined, he couldn't avoid an expression of repugnance and exclamation, Pah! This is something Jewish! Second day. I will start from the pact of blood. The same means that the white Atlanteans mixed their blood with the representatives of the native populaces who were also of white race, generating the first dynasties of warrior kings of divine origin. They were, would affirm then, because they descended from the white Atlanteans, who declared to be sons of gods. But the warrior kings had preserved that divine legacy, supporting it in a spiritual and bloody aristocracy, protecting their racial purity. That is what they would make for millenniums, until the enemy strategy operating through the foreign cultures achieved to blind or derange them, and this took them to break the pact of blood, and such fail of compromise with the sons of the gods was, as you will see next, doctor, cause of great ills. Of course the blood pact included something more than the genetic legacy. In first place was the promise of the wisdom. The white Atlanteans had assured to their descendants and future representatives that the loyalty of the mission would be rewarded by the liberator gods with the highest wisdom that allowed the spirit the return to the origin beyond the stars. It means that the warrior kings and members of the blood aristocracy would become also wise warriors, men of stone as the white Atlanteans, just complying the mission and respecting the pact of blood. On the contrary, the oblivion of the mission or the betrayal to the pact of blood would bring serious consequences. It was not about a punishment of the gods or something like that, but the loss of the eternity that is, an irreversible, spiritual fall, even worse than the one that incarcerated the spirit to the matter. The liberator gods, according to the particular description that the white Atlanteans made of the native populaces, didn't punish, neither forgive their acts nor judge, because they were beyond all law. Their gazes only repaired in the spirit of men, on their spirituality, and their will to abandon the matter, those who loved the creation, those who wanted to remain subjected to the suffering and pain of the animal life, those who, by sustaining these illusions or other similar, forgot the mission or betrayed the pact of blood, would face no punishment, no, was just assured the loss of the eternity, unless that it could be considered a punishment, the implacable indifference that the gods exhibit to all the traitors, 
referred to the wisdom the native populaces received in every case a direct proof that they could acquire a superior knowledge, a concrete evidence which talked more than the incomprehensible arts employed in the megalithic constructions. And this proof was undeniable, which situated the native populaces over any other that had not made pacts with the Atlanteans, consisted in the comprehension of the architecture, in the form to domesticate and govern the animal populations useful to men. Indeed, since the departure of the white Atlanteans, the native populaces counted to sustain themselves in their place, and to comply with their mission, with the powerful help of the agriculture and the animal breeding. No matter what they were before, collectors, hunters, or just looter warriors, the magic enclosure of the fields and the plotting of the walled cities had to be realized in the land using a stone plow, and that the white Atlanteans gave to the native populaces for that purpose. It was a lytic instrument designed and constructed by them, from which they never had to separate, in which they would use only to found the agricultural and urban sectors of the occupied space. Naturally, this was a proof of the wisdom, but not the wisdom itself. And what about the wisdom? When would be obtained the knowledge that allowed the spirit to travel beyond the stars? Individually, it depended of the will employed to return to the origin and the orientation of that will. Anyone could leave in any moment, and from any place if the wisdom from the will to return and the orientation towards the origin was acquired. The combat against the potencies of the matter would need to be resolved. In this case, personally, that would constitute a feat of the spirit and would be taken in great value by the liberator gods. Collectively, otherwise, the wisdom of the liberation of the spirit that would make possible the departure of all the wise warriors to Katagar and from there towards the origin would be obtained only when the theater of operations of the essential war be transferred again to the earth. Then the liberator gods would come back to manifest themselves unto men to guide the forces of the spirit in the final battle against the potencies of the matter. Until then, the wise warriors would have to comply effectively with the mission to prepare for the final battle. And then, when they had been summoned by the gods to occupy their battle position, the wise warrior would have to demonstrate altogether the wisdom of the spirit. Just as the white Atlanteans affirmed, that would be unavoidable if the native spirits fulfilled their mission and respected the blood pact, because, then, the highest wisdom would coincide with the strongest will to return to the origin, with the highest courage disposed to fight against the potencies of the matter, and with the maximum spiritual hostility against the non-spiritual. Collectively, the highest wisdom would be revealed at the end, during the final battle, in a moment when all the wise warriors would be able to recognize each other simultaneously. How? The opportunity would be recognized directly with the pure blood, in an inner perception, or through the stone of Venus. To the warrior kings of each allied populace, that's to say, to their offspring, the white Atlanteans also had a stone of Venus, a gem similar to an emerald of the size of a child's fist. Such stone which had been brought to the earth by the liberator gods was not faceted at all but finely polished, showing over a sector of the surface a light concavity in which center was observed the sign of the origin. According to what the white Atlanteans revealed to the warrior kings, before the fall of the extraterrestrial spirit in the matter existed in the earth an animal man extremely primitive, son of the creator god of all the material forms, that animal had an anemic essence, i.e., a soul capable to reach immortality, but lacked of the eternal spirit that characterized the liberator gods or the own creator god. However, the animal man was destined to obtain evolutionarily a high grade of knowledge with respect to the work of the creator, knowledge which was resumed in the sign of the serpent. In other words, the serpent represented the highest knowledge for the animal man. After the mystery of the fall, the spirit remained incorporated to the animal man, prisoner of the matter, and emerged the necessity of its liberation. The liberator gods, who in this were such terrible as the damn creator god captivating spirits, only attended, as I said, to those who disposed of the will to return to the origin and exhibited orientation towards the origin. To those brave spirits, the gods said, You have lost the origin and you are a prisoner of the serpent. With the sign of the origin comprehend the serpent, and you will be free again in the origin. Hence, the wisdom consisted to understand the serpent, 
With the sign of the origin, this is the reason of the importance of the legacy that the White Atlanteans gave by the Pact of Blood. The pure blood, blood of the gods, and the stone of Venus, in which concavity was observed the sign of the origin. That legacy undoubtedly could save the spirit if, with the sign of the origin, the serpent is understood, just as the gods ordained. But to obtain the wisdom for the liberation of the spirit would not be an easy task, because in the stone of Venus was not engraved the sign of the origin. Over it, on its concavity, it could only be seen, and was seen only by who respected the pact of blood due to, in reality, what existed as divine legacy of the gods was a symbol of the origin in the pure blood. The sign of the origin, observed in the stone of Venus, was just the reflection of the symbol of the origin present in the pure blood of the warrior kings, of the wise warriors, of the sons of the gods, of the semi-divine men, who, attached to the animal body and to a material soul, had an eternal spirit. If the pact of blood was betrayed, if the blood turned impure, the symbol of the origin would be debilitated and would not be possible to see the sign of the origin over the stone of Venus any more would be lost in this manner the possibility to comprehend the serpent, the maximum wisdom, and with it the chance to be incorporated in the essential war. On the contrary, if the pact of blood was respected, if the pure blood was preserved, then the stone of Venus could be denominated with justice, mirror of the pure blood, and those who could see over it in the sign of the origin would be initiates in the mystery of the pure blood, real wise warriors." The White Atlanteans affirmed that their continental advance was guided directly by a great white chief that they called Nabutan. The chief was only seen by them, and for whom they felt a deep respect and veneration, had fame to have been who revealed to the own White Atlanteans the sign of the origin. Naturally, the sign of the origin would be incommunicable because it can only be seen by who has previously, in his blood, the symbol of the origin. The stone of Venus, mirror of the pure blood, allowed to obtain an external reflect of the symbol of the origin. But such reflect, the sign of the origin, could not be communicated neither by initiation nor by any other social function if the receptor lacked from the legacy of the symbol of the origin. Even amongst the white Atlanteans, it was a time where only a few, individually, achieved to know the symbol of the origin. The difficulty was represented by the impossibility to establish a correspondence between the uncreated and the created, like if the matter was impotent to reflect the uncreated. In fact, the stones of Venus had been structurally modified by the liberator gods to accomplish its function. With the purpose to resolve this problem and provide to their race the highest wisdom, even higher than the lytic wisdom knew by them, Nabutan had descended to hell. At least that was what the white Atlanteans related. Here he fought against the potencies of the matter, but he didn't achieve to force them to reflect the symbol of the origin and make it able to be seen by all the members of his race. It seems that was Freya, his divine wife, who resolved the problem. She expressed the sign of the origin through the dance. All the movements of the dance proceeded from the movement of the birds, of their archetypes. The discovery of Freya allowed Nabutan to comprehend the sign of the origin with the language of the birds and to express it in the same way. But this was not a language composed by sounds, but by significant movements, which were realized by some groups of birds, especially the wade birds, like the heron or the crane, or the gallinaceous, like the partridge, the peafowl, or the pheasant. According to Nabutan, to understand the symbol of the origin were required exactly thirteen plus three runes. In other words, an alphabet of sixteen signs denominated runes or varunes. Thanks to Navotan and Freya, the White Atlanteans were Haruspex, from the Aves Spire, i.e., they were gifted to comprehend the sign of the origin observing the flight of the birds, the language of the birds of the matter. In this form would be synthesized the wisdom of Navotan, who understands the alphabet of sixteen runes, would comprehend the language of the birds, who understands the language of the birds, would comprehend the sign of the origin. Who understands the sign of the origin would comprehend the serpent, and who comprehends the serpent with the sign of the origin could be free in the origin. It is clear that the White Atlanteans didn't trust in the perdurability of the language of the birds, which, notwithstanding it, they transmitted to the descendants of the blood pact. They anticipated that, in case of triumph of the cultural pact of the swarthy Atlanteans, the sacred language would be forgotten soon by the men. 
In such case, the only guarantee that at least some individually achieved to see the sign of the origin would be constituted by the stone of Venus. With great success, they based on the fulfillment of the mission. Thus, when the white Atlanteans bade farewell to my ancestors, Dr. Signagel, they suggested an appropriate form to assure the fulfillment of the mission. First of all, the pact of blood would be needed to be respected without expectations and maintain, for it, an aristocracy of the pure blood. From this aristocracy, which started with the descendants of the white Atlanteans, were already selected the first kings and the wise warriors who would guard the plow of stone and the stone of Venus. In fact, in the beginning every populace was outbreeding. In fact, in the beginning every populace was outbreeding divided in three groups. Each one of them had the right to use the lytic instruments and contributed, for it common custody, a wise warrior. They conserved the instruments inside a secret grotto, and when they had to be used, they transported the three of them all together. The three groups of the populace, of course, obeyed to a same king. As the centuries passed by, the reason of the cultural defeat that I will later expose, the triple division of the populace was forgotten. Even if it lasted for a long time, the custom to entrust the custody of the lytic instruments to the three wise warriors, or Vrayas. In consequent place, all the kings and the noble by blood would be initiates in the mystery of the pure blood. The initiation would be at the sixteen years old, when they would be faced to the stone of Venus, and it would be tried to make them see in it the sign of the origin. Who could see it would dispose in that moment of the enough wisdom to perform the self-liberation of the spirit and return to the origin. But, if the wise warrior was a king or a hero and wanted to postpone his spiritual liberation in order to seek the liberation of the race, two would be the steps to follow. The first one consisted to comply with the command of the liberator gods and comprehend the serpent with the sign of the origin, communicating then the reached wisdom to the remaining initiates. Once seen the sign of the origin, the second step of the initiate demanded to not part the attention from the stone of Venus, because on it, over its concavity, some day would be seen the lytic sign of Katagar, i.e., an image that would signalize the path towards the city of the liberator gods. This principle would give place to a secret intuition amongst the Iberians. About it I will talk a lot later, of the Noyals and Vrayas, initiates enshrined to protect in every moment and place the stone of Venus and await the manifestation of the origin. Thus was how the descendants or allies of the white Atlanteans who executed the first step in the comprehension of the serpent, and that was represented in the real form of a reptile or abstractly with the form of the spiral, they were universally considered Ophidian worshippers. Such confusion was malignantly employed to relate every kind of tenebrous intentions or acts. With this objective, the enemy associated the snake to the ideas that most repugnance or feared produced in the ignorant populaces of the earth. The night, the moon, the demonic forces, all what is creeping or subterranean, the occult, etc. In this form, by means of a slanderous and malicious vulgarization of their acts, because no one except the initiates knew about the existence of the stone of Venus and the sign of the origin, they achieved to blame the wise warriors of black magic, i.e., of the grossest magic arts, those who were practiced using the passions of the body and soul. Curious paradox! The initiates of the mystery of the pure blood accused of black magic and humanity? Those who just because understood the serpent, total symbol of the human knowledge, were out of what's human. Third Day The cultural pact, over which the swarthy Atlanteans based their alliances, was on its part essentially different to the pact of blood. Such agreement was founded in the perpetual maintenance of a cult. To be clear, the fundament of the alliance consisted in the indeclinable fidelity of a cult revealed by the swarthy Atlanteans. The cult demanded the unconditional worship of the members of the native populace to a god in the fulfillment of his will, which would be manifested through his representatives. The priestly caste formed and instructed by the swarthy Atlanteans should not be interpreted with this that the swarthy Atlanteans initiated the native populaces and the cult of their own god do that they affirmed to be the terrestrial expression of god which was the creator god of the universe they said to be inherent to god and to have a higher destiny to comply on the earth 
additionally to the destruction of the work of the white Atlanteans. Their own mission consisted in the establishment of a great civilization from which would emerge, in the end times, a chosen people of God. Also inherent with this would reign over all the countries of the earth. Some angels that the damn white Atlanteans dominated, traitor gods of the spirit, would support the chosen people with all their power. But was written that such synarchy could not be fulfilled without the expulsion from the earth of the enemies of the creation, who tried to discover the plans of God to men, and make them rebel and draw aside from his designs, then would overcome the final battle between the Son of Light and the Son of Darkness, i.e., between those who worship the Creator God with the heart and those who comprehend the serpent with the mind. In sum, the swarthy Atlanteans were the expression of God. They didn't propose themselves as the object of the cult, neither exposed to the native populace as their concept of God, which would be reduced to an auto-vision that the Creator God would experience since his manifestation in the swarthy Atlanteans. Otherwise, they revealed to the native populace as the name and the aspect of some celestial gods, which were not but faces of the Creator God. Other manifestations of him in heaven, the stars of the firmament, and all the visible or invisible celestial body expressed to these gods, according to the particular psychology of each native population, would be then the revealed God. To some of them, the most primitive would be shown God as the sun, the moon, a planet or star, or a particular constellation. To others, more evolved, would be told, in that or such star resided the god of their cults. In this case, they were authorized to represent their god through a fetish or idol which symbolized his hidden face, which was perceived by the highest priests in his astral residence. Anyway, being God a star, or behind a star, or manifested in the surrounding world, in the whole creation, in the swarthy Atlanteans, or in any other priestly caste, the materialism of such conception is evident. Just by deepening a little on it would become patent the matter, placed, as always, a real extreme of the creation of God, when not as the same substance of God constituting the natural reference of the gods, the essential support of the divine existence. It is undoubtedly that the swarthy Atlanteans worshipped the potencies of the matter because all which was sacred for them, such indications, for example, that they signalized to the native populaces in the cult, was founded in matter. In fact, the sanctity which was obtained by the priestly practice proceeded from an inexorable sanctification of the body, and the consequent power, demonstrative of the priestly superiority, consisted in the dominion of the forces of the nature or, in a last instance, of every force. But the forces were not but the manifestations of the gods. The forces emerged from the matter, or were guided by it, and its formalization was equivalent to its deification. This is the wind, the fire, the thunder, the light, could not be nothing else but gods or the will of the gods. The dominion of the forces was, in this way, a communion with the gods. And for this reason, the highest priestly sanctity which was demonstrated by the dominion of the soul, being this conceived as body or as force, meaning also the most abject submission to the potencies of matter. The movement of the stars denoted the acts of the gods. The divine plans were developed with such movements in which every rhythm, period, or cycle had a decisive meaning for the human life. Therefore, the swarthy Atlanteans divinized time under the form of the astral or natural cycles, and they transmitted to the native populaces the beliefs in the eras or great years. During a great year which was concreted one part of the plan that the gods had plotted for the men, their terrestrial destiny, the last great year, which would last for approximately twenty-six thousand years, would have started many years before, when the swan of the sky had approached to the earth and the man of the Atlantis saw descending the god Sanat. He came to be king of the world, sent by the sun god Ton, the father of mankind, who is son of the dog god Sin. The Swarthy Atlanteans glorified the moment when Sanat arrived to the earth, and they diffused among the native populations the symbol of the swan as a sign of such primordial remembrance. Thenceforth, the symbol of the swan, and later, of every pilmpid bird, was universally considered as an evidence that some determined native populace had concerted the cultural pact. It means that even though the worshipped god was different, Beleno, Lug, Bran, Proteo, etc., the common identification with the symbol of the swan revealed the institution of the cultural pact. 
Subsequently, after the departure of the Atlanteans, the struggle between the native populaces would be symbolized as a struggle between the swan and the serpent, because the conflict was between the followers of the symbol of the swan and those who understood the symbol of the serpent. Of course, the meaning of this allegory was only known by the initiates. The god Sanat had installed himself in the throne of the ancient kings of the world, existent since millions of years before the Corn Palace of the White Island Gig, subsequently known in the Tibet as Chang Shambhala, or Dejong. From there he had disposed to govern countless souls, because the White Island was in the land of the dead. However, to the White Island only arrived the souls of the priests, of those who in all the eras had worshipped the Creator God. The king of the world, chaired with white fraternity or a white brotherhood, constituted by holier priests, dead or alive, and supported in their work over mankind with the power of those mysterious angels, seraphim, nephilim, that the white Atlanteans qualified as traitor gods to the spirit of men. According to the white Atlanteans, the seraphim, nephilim, were only two hundred, but their power was so huge that they reigned over all of the occult hierarchy of the earth. They counted to exert such power with the authorization of the Creator God, and they were blindly obeyed by the initiated priest of the cultural pact, who were parts of the occult hierarchy or white hierarchy of the earth. In some, in Chang Shambhala, in the White Island, existed the White Fraternity, on whose head were the Seraphim Nephilim and the King of the World. It must be clarified that the witness predicated over the insular mansion of the king of the world or his fraternity was not referring to a racial quality of the dwellers or members, but to the illumination that unfailingly they would have in regard to the other men. The light, indeed, was the most divine thing, but the internal light, visible for the eyes of the soul or the solar light, which sustained life and was perceived with the senses of the body and the devotion shows, one more time, the metaphysical materialism which sustained the swarthy Atlanteans. According to them, in the grade that the soul evolved and elevated toward the Creator God, its light increased. That is to say, increased its aptitude to receive and give light, to become finally impure light. Naturally, that light was something created by God. That is, a finite thing, the limit of the perfection of the soul, something that could not be overpassed without contradicting the plans of the gods, without falling into the most abominable heresy. The White Atlanteans, adversely, affirmed that in the origin beyond the stars existed an uncreated light, which could only be seen by the spirit, that infinite light was imperceptible to the soul. However, although invisible, before it the soul felt as facing the most impenetrable blackness, an infinite abyss, and remained plugged in an uncontrollable horror, and that was because the uncreated light of the spirit transmitted to the soul the intuition of the eternal death in which it, as every created thing, would end its existence at the end of the super-great year of manifestation of the Creator God, one Mahamanvantara. Hence, the whiteness of the fraternity to which belonged the swarthy Atlanteans not proceeded from the color of the skin of their members, but from the light of their souls. The white fraternity was not racial, but religious. Its rows were nourished only by initiated priests, who occupied always a fair place, according to their devotion and obedience to the gods. The blood of the living had a relative value for them. If with their purity they maintained themselves attached to the allied native populace, then they would have to preserve it. Moreover, if the protection of the cult required of the miscegenation with the other population, it could be degraded with no problems. The cult would be the access of the existence for the native populace, and all would be subordinated to it in importance. All, at the end, would be sacrificed by the cult. In first place, the pure blood of the allied populaces of the white Atlanteans was part of the mission, a duty of the cultural pact. The spilled pure blood produced joy in the gods and they claimed their offerings. For this reason, the initiated priests had to be sacrificer of the pure blood. They had to exterminate the wise warriors or destroy their genetic legacy. They had to neutralize the pact of blood. I have described hitherto the main characteristics of both pacts. I couldn't avoid the employment of obscure or unusual concepts, but you will have to comprehend, appreciated, doctor, that I don't have the necessary time to enter in major details. However, before to continue with the history of my people and my family, I will make a commentary referring to the consequences that the alliances with the Atlanteans brought to the native populations. 
If in something stood out the priestly castes formed by the swarthy Atlanteans, apart from their fanaticism and cruelty, was in the art of the deceit, they made literally any sacrifice if it contributed to the preservation of the cult, the fulfillment of the mission, such high purpose that satisfied the will of the gods, justified any of the employed methods, and that converted them in masters of the deceit. And for this reason must not surprise that many times they simulated to be kings, or they shielded behind nobles and kings, if that favored their plans. But this can't confuse anyone, kings, nobles, and lords, if their acts aimed to maintain a cult or if they affirmed the heresy of the wisdom, undoubtedly was treating about camouflaged priests, or even if their social functions appeared to be the opposite. The principle to establish the filiation of an allied population of the Atlanteans consists in the opposition between the cult and the wisdom, the sustenance of a cult to the potencies of the matter, the gods who situate themselves over men and approve their miserable earthly existence, the creator gods or determiners of the fate of men, puts automatically their worshippers in the mark of the cultural pact, being or not the priests at sight. On the contrary, the gods of the white Atlanteans required nor cult nor priests. They talked directly in the pure blood of the warriors, and they, just hearing their voices, became wise. They had not come to comfort men in their miserable condition of being a slave in the earth, but to incite the human spirit to the rebellion against the creator god of the material prison, and recover the absolute freedom in the origin beyond all the stars. Here would be always a servant of the flesh, condemned to the suffering and pain of life. There would the god who was before such a powerful as all and, of course, would be no peace for the spirit while the return towards the origin was not fulfilled. Meanwhile, the original freedom was not reconquered. The spirit was a stranger in the earth and prisoner of the earth, except for the one who was asleep, confused in an extreme loss, bewitched by the illusion of the great deceit. In the earth, the spirit could only be permanently manifested in war against the potencies of matter that had him prisoner. If the peace was in the origin, here could only be war for the awake spirit. That is to say, for the wise spirit, and the wisdom could only be contrary to every cult that obeyed men to bow down before a god. The creator gods never talked about peace, but of war and strategy. Hence, the strategy consisted to be an alert state and preserve the sight agreed with the white Atlanteans, until the day in which the operation theater of the essential war be transferred again to the earth. And this was not peace, but the preparation for the war. But to comply with the mission, the pact of blood maintains people in an alert state that demanded some technique, a special way of life that allowed them to live as strangers in the earth. The white Atlanteans had transferred to the native people a similar way of life. Many of its guidelines would be actually incomprehensible. However, I will try to expose the most evident principles in which it was based to achieve the proposed objectives. Simply concerned to three concepts, the principle of occupation, the principle of enclosure, and the principle of the wall. Three concepts complemented by such legacy of the Atlantean wisdom, which were the agriculture and the animal breeding. In first place, the allied populations of the white Atlanteans would never forget the principle of the occupation of the territory, and would have to prescend definitively from the principle of the property of the land sustained by the followers of the swarthy Atlanteans. In other words, the dwelled land was land occupied and not land owned. Occupied to whom? To the enemy, the potencies of the matter. The conviction of this main restriction would be enough to maintain the alert state because the occupant populace was in this form conscious that the enemy would try to recover the territory by means of any type, under the form of the native populations, allies of the swarthy Atlanteans, as another invader populace or as the adversity of the forces of nature. To believe in the property of land, on the contrary, meant to put the guard down in front of the enemy lose the alert state, and succumb to its power of illusion. Understanding and accepting the principle of occupation, the native populaces could proceed in second term to fence the occupied territory or, or at least signalize its area. Why? Because the principle of the enclosure allowed to separate the occupied state from the enemy territory. Out of the occupied and fenced area was extended the territory of the enemy. Only then, when was disposed of an occupied and fenced area, was possible to sow and realize the production of the land. In fact, in the strategic way of life inherited of the white Atlanteans, the native populaces were obeyed to act according to a strict order, that no other principle allowed to alter. 
In third place, after the occupation and fence, only then could be practiced the cultivation. The reason of this stringency was the capital importance that the white Atlanteans attributed to the cultivation as an act able to liberate the spirit or increase the slavery to the matter. The correct formula was this. If a population of pure blood realized the cultivation over an occupied land and not forgetting that the enemy remained outside, thereupon inside of the fence would be free to elevate the spirit and acquire the highest wisdom. On the contrary, if the land was cultivated believing on its property, the potencies of the matter would emerge from the earth and would seize from men and would integrate them in their context, converting them in an object of the gods. In consequence, the spirit would suffer a worse fall in the matter, accompanied with the most harmful illusion, because he would believe to be free on its property when would only be a piece of the organism created by the gods. Who cultivates the land without occupying and fencing it previously would feel to be his owner or would want to be, and would be devoured by the regional context and experience the illusion to be part of it. The property implies a double relation, reciprocal and inevitable. The property belongs to the owner in the same way he belongs to the property. It is clear, could not be possession without a previous pertaining to the property that would be appropriated later. But who feels to be part of the earth would remain unguarded before the illusion power of the enemy. He would behave as a stranger in the earth, as the spiritual man who cultivates the strategic enclosure, because he would not root and love the earth. He would believe in the peace and he would aspire such illusion. He would feel a part of the nature and would accept that the whole is work of the gods. He would dwarf in his home and would be astonished due to the greatness of the creation, which surrounds him everywhere. He would never conceive an exit of the creation. Before it, such ideas would plunge him into an unnamed horror because on it he would be into it an abominable heresy an insubordination of the will of the Creator which could end in predictable punishment. He would submit to the destiny, to the will of the gods who decides it, and would worship them to gain the favor or to appease their wrath. He would be softened by the fear and would have no force, not enough to oppose the gods, not even to fight against the animic and animal part of himself, but neither to achieve that the spirit dominate it and become in the Lord of himself. Finally, he would believe in the property of the land, but he would belong to the earth, and would comply step by step what is signalized by the enemy strategy. The beginning of the wall was the factual application of the principle of the enclosure, its real projection. According to the lytic wisdom of the Atlanteans, there were many worlds where the spirit remained prisoner, and in each one of them the principle of the wall required a different concreteness. In the physical world, its correct application conduced to the stone wall, the most effective strategic force against any pressure of the enemy. For this reason, the native populaces were going to comply the mission and participated in the Pact of Blood, which instructed by the white Atlanteans in the construction of walls of stone as fundamental ingredient of their way of life. All who occupied and fenced the land to practice the cultivation with a purpose to sustain the place of some work of the white Atlanteans had able to raise stone walls. But the elevation of the walls, not dependent only on the characteristics of the occupied land, but on its construction, had to intervene secret principles of the lytic wisdom, principles of the strategy of the essential war, principles that only the initiated and the mystery of the pure blood, the wise warriors, could know. It will be better understood the reason of this condition if I say that the white Atlanteans advised to look with one eye to the wall and with the other to the origin. What would only be possible if the wall was referred in some way to the origin? The principle to establish the filiation of an allied populace of the Atlanteans consists in the opposition between the cult and the wisdom. But what are the factual evidences, the concrete proofs, in other words, which is more evident to determine if it treats about a cult or wisdom? In every case, must be observed if there exists the temple or the wall of war. Due to the practice of a cult is inextricably associated with the existence of a corresponding temple. The temple is the factual fundament of the cult its material extreme, and as the practice of the wisdom is inextricably associated with the existence of a strategic wall, the wall of war is the factual fundament of the strategic way of life, the material seat, the principle. This principle explains the fact that the white fraternity has sustained in the earth, in every historic time, communities and secret orders specialized in the construction of temples, which would closely collaborate with the priests of the cultural pact. 
and this explains also the fact that the lords of Agartha sustain, through the history, the order of stone wall constructors, orders integrated exclusively by the white descendants of the white Atlanteans, who dominate the lytic wisdom and the strategy of the essential war. Fourth Day for all we have seen, will be evident that the strategic mode of life could only proceed from a type of culture rather austere. In fact, the populaces of the Pact of Blood never stood out for any other cultural value but for the ability for the war. Because these populations at the beginning behaved like real strangers in the earth, they occupied the region where they lived, perhaps for centuries, but always thinking to leave, always preparing for the war, always distrusting of the reality of the world and demonstrating an essential hostility against the strange gods. Must not surprise, then, that they fabricated few utensils and even less sumptuary objects. However, although scarce, they were enough perfect to remember that there were constructors, gifted of skillfully artisans. To prove it would be sufficient to observe the production of weapons, where they always stood out. They were fabricated in quality, and mass always crescent, being proverbial the fear and respect produced by them and the populaces of the cultural pact who experienced the efficacy of their offensive power. The populations of the cultural pact, contrarily to the occupants of the earth, believed in the property of the ground, loved the world, and worshipped the proprietary gods. Their cultures were always abundant in the production of utensils and sumptuary and ornamental articles. Among them was accepted that the work of the land was despicable for men, even if it was practiced by obligation. Their major ability was instead in the commerce, what would serve them to diffuse their cultural objects and to impose the worship of their gods. According to their beliefs, men had to be resigned to their luck and tried to live in the best form in this world, such as the will of the gods, which could not be challenged, and to please that will, the correct was to serve his representatives in the earth the priests and the kings of the cult. The kings transmitted to the populations the voice of the gods and begged to the gods for the favor of the population, stopped the arm of the king's lovers of war and interceded for the populaces with the exaction of taxes became excessive. They were the authors of the land and sometimes they distributed justice. What ills would not abate over the population if the priests were not there to appease the wrath of the gods? On the other hand, according to them, it was not necessary to search the wisdom to progress culturally and reach a high grade of civilization, it was enough to seek the perfection of knowledge, for example, it was sufficient to surpass the utilitarian value of a utensil and then stylize it until transforms it into an artistic or sumptuary object. The wisdom was property of the gods, and they hated that men invaded the dominions. Men should not comprehend, just know and develop what they know. Until, in a limit of excellence of the thing, this guide to the knowledge of other things, that would be also necessary to improve, multiplying in this way the amount and quality of the cultural objects, and evolving, to form more complex of culture and civilization, thanks to the priests because they condemned the heresy of the wisdom but approved with enthusiasm the application of the knowledge and the production of objects that would make more pleasant the human life. The civilizations of refined customs and exquisite luxuries significantly contrasted with the austere way of life of the populations of the blood pact. In the beginning, that difference, which was logic, not produced any effect in the populations of the pact of blood. Always suspicious of what could debilitate their warrior way of life, one fall would be produced, prophesied the wise warriors. If they allowed that the foreign cultures contaminated their customs, this certainly allowed them to resist for many centuries, while in the world the civilizations of the cultural pact grew and extended. Nevertheless, with the pass of the centuries and due to numerous and varied reasons, the populations of the pact of blood ended succumbing to the culturally populations of the cultural pact. Without being necessary to enter in details, it can be considered that two were the main causes of that result. By the part of the populations of the pact of blood, some collective fatigue that unnerved the warrior will, something like the stupper that for the moments usually invades the sentinels during the long surveillance. That fatigue, that stupor, that volitional weakness was leaving them unarmed in front of the enemy. By the part of the populations of the cultural pact, a diabolic strategy, perpetrated by the priests, based on the exploitation of the warrior fatigue through the temptation of the illusion, in this way, the populations of the Pact of Blood were tempted with the illusion of the peace, the illusion of the truce, the illusion of the cultural progress, the illusion of the comfort, 
of the enjoyment, the luxury, etc. Perhaps the most effective arm was the temptation of the beauty priestess love, specially trained to turn on the asleep passions of the warrior kings. With the temptation of the illusion, the priests were trying to make blood alliances with the combatant populaces, seal the treaties of peace with the consumption of weddings between members of the reigning royalties. Naturally, as it was about mating between individuals of the best lineages and of the same race, usually the degradation of the pure blood not occurred. What were searching the priests with these unions, the cultural domination above the populations of the pact, they had really clear that pure blood, by itself, was not to maintain the wisdom in the absence of the spiritual will to be free in the origin, will that was debilitated due to the war fatigue. The wisdom would make the spirit free in the origin and more powerful than the Creator, but in this world, where the spirit is chained to the animal man, the cult of the Creator God would end dominating the wisdom, burying it under the veil of terror and hate. Once culturally submitted, the priests would have time to degrade the pure blood of the populations of the pact of blood and to fulfill their own cultural pact, that's to say, destroy the works of the white Atlanteans. In my country, Dr. Signagel, things happen in that way. The kings, tired to fight and wait for the return of the liberator gods, were tempted by the illusion of a peace that assured them multiple advantages. If they allied the populations of the cultural pact, they would have access to their advanced culture would share their refined customs, would enjoy the use of many cultural objects, would dwell in more comfortable houses, etc., and the alliances would be sealed with convenient weddings, unions that would maintain safe the dignity of the kings and would not obey them to concede, and the first opportunity the wisdom to the cult. They believed naively that they were making a truce in which they didn't lose anything, and where they had much to gain, and that belief— that blindness, that madness, that incomprehensible fatigue, that stupor, that spell was the ruin of my people and the worst fail to the pact of the blood, with the white Atlanteans, a lack of honor. Oh, what madness! To have believed that the cult and the wisdom could be reunited in just one hand. The result, the disaster, I'd say, was that the priests crossed the walls and established themselves amongst the wise warriors. There they intrigued until imposing their cults and achieved to make them forget the wisdom, and finally they avidly devoted themselves to the rescue of the Stones of Venus, which remitted with promptitude to the white fraternity through messengers who traveled to far regions. Only a few initiates had the honor and courage to refuse such condemnable claudication, and disposed the means to preserve the Stone of Venus and what remained of the wisdom. Within those initiates was one of my distant ancestors, who engraved the stone of Venus, and the garniture of an iron sword, was a weapon of imposing beauty and notable symbolism. In addition to be the support of the stone of Venus, the crossword was upward, opened in two iron quillions, that protected the hilt and gave to the set the form of inverted trident. The hilt, on its part, was of white bone like ivory, but coiled, and was affirmed with conviction that it belonged to the horn of the barbell unicorn, mythical animal which represented the spiritual man. And the pommel, made of iron as the blade, had also a pair of elevated quillions that formed a second inverted trident. In the Middle Ages, as will be seen later, other initiates engraved in the blade the inscription, Honor et Mortis. While this initiate established the law that such weapon had only been in the hands of the kings of the original lineage, the offspring of the white Atlanteans, vainly were, in this case, the attempts made by generations of priests to destroy the wise sword. It was conserved, while it was possible, and later, when it was not possible. It was occulted until the days of Lito de Tarsus, the ancestor who came to America in 1534. I repeat— the madness to gather in one lineage cult and the wisdom produced a disaster in the populations of the Pact of Blood, the interruption of the initiatic chain. It was in this way, in one moment, when the gods of the cult had imposed the voice of the pure blood faded away and the initiates lost the possibility to hear the liberator gods. The will to return to the origin had been debilitated long time ago, and now they had no orientation. Without the voice and without orientation towards the origin, there was no wisdom to transmit. The sign of the origin would not be seen any more in the stone of Venus. The initiates realized suddenly that something had been disengaged between them and the liberator gods. And they understood too late that the future of the mission and the pact of blood deepened as never before of the struggle between the cult and the wisdom, but a struggle that since then would not be fought out but inside, 
in the field of the blood. What made the initiates when they understood that irreversible reality, the shadows that abated the spirit to counteract it? Almost everyone did the same, starting from the beginning, that what exists in this world is just a gross imitation of the things of the real world, and due to the impossibility to find the origin and the path towards the real world, they opted to use the last remains of the wisdom to impress in the lineages of purest blood, a familiar mission, consistent in the unconscious comprehension, with the sign of the origin of an archetype. It must be averted, the modest of this objective, the ancient initiates, the wise warriors, were capable to comprehend the serpent with the sign of the origin, and the serpent is a symbol which contains all the archetypes created by the god of the universe, symbol that was consciously understood with the uncreated sign of the origin. The initiates proposed, and there was no other option, that a family would work, blindly, on one created archetype, trying that the symbol of the origin present in the blood one day would be comprehended casually and would reveal the truth from the uncreated form. In some, Dr. Signagel, to some lineages who had divine blood of the white Atlanteans flowing through their veins was assigned a familiar mission, an objective to reach through the pass of countless generations that would go perpetually repeating a same tragedy, turning around a same archetype. As the alchemist stir the lead, the members of the chosen family would repeat untiringly the proofs established by the ancestors, until one of them, one day, turning around a circle traveled a thousand times beneath other skies, would reach to fulfill the familiar mission, purifying in this manner his astral blood. Thus this would produce a transmutation that would allow to resolve the involution of the Kali Yuga, or Dark Age, return to the origin and obtain the wisdom again. It is obvious to clarify that the familiar mission would be secret and that it is actually unknown for the members of the offspring of the White Atlanteans. The mission demanded the fulfillment of a specific guideline which content would not have necessary relation with the objectives of the cultural community where the chosen lineage belonged. Inclusive, according to the period, the guideline could result incomprehensible or just collide against the cultural canons in vogue. But nothing of this would matter because the mission was impressed in the familiar blood and the tree of the lineage, and the descendants' branches would go inevitably tending to the guideline, in an unconscious and superhuman effort to surpass the spiritual fall. Of course, the specific guideline described the archetype that would have been understood in the blood, with the symbol of the origin, to transcend it and reach to the uncreated form. To some families, for example, was commended the perfection of a stone, a vegetable, of an animal, of a symbol, of a color, of a sound, of a determined organic function, or of an instinct, etc. The perfection of the suggested thing required to penetrate on its intimate essence until touch the metaphysical limits. In other words, till the adaptation of the flawless form of the created archetype. Thereby, considering that the created archetype is just a mere copy of the uncreated form would be possible to orientate again towards the origin, if it was understood the archetype with the symbol of the origin present in the pure blood. And there was the wisdom. Thus, the familiar mission not finished with the simple transcendental apprehension of the created archetype, but it required its spiritual recreation. Starting by an existent quality in the world, he would back over it one and again, untiringly, for eons, until penetrating in its intimate essence and realize its archetypal perfection. It would be recreated then to the quality and the spirit and would be comprehended with the symbol of the origin. Only with this condition would be appropriated for the existence of the spirit. Only thus the spirit would exist beyond the created. Not perceiving the illusion of the created, but recreating what is perceived in the spirit and comprehending it with the uncreated. At complying it with the familiar mission, the astral blood, not the hemoglobin, would be purified and would make possible the transmutation which is own of the Hyperborean initiates or wise warriors, that transforms men into immortal superhuman. In the course of such, not evolutive way, the convoked ones, the called to fulfill the familiar mission, will be able to create magically many things. The initiates in the mystery of the pure blood would obtain, for example, a magic wine, a soma, homa, or amrita. After a millinery distillation of the liquor, this one is incorporated to the blood, recreated as transmutating nectar. Also, the manipulation of the sound permits to arrive to a superior harmony, to a music of the spheres, the spirit vibrating in a unique note. Om recreates the ineffable essence of the logos, the creator verb 
and also such nectar as this sound, or the other similar archetypal forms, which can be created in the spirit and understood by the symbol of the origin, comprehended by the uncreated, opening thus the doors of the origin and the wisdom. Your family, Dr. Signigal, was destined to produce an archetypal honey, the exquisite squash of the sweet. Since distant times your ancestors had worked all the forms of the sugar, from the cultivation to the refinement, from the grossest molasses to the most excellent honey. One day the empirical usage was exhausted in a metaphysical sugar, that is, an archetype incorporated in the astral blood of the family, giving birth to a slow process of the interior refinement that ends with you. Today the metaphysical sugar has been adjusted to the archetypal perfection, and the effort of thousands of ancestors have been condensed in you. The searched sweetness is in your heart. It is your turn to make the last step of the transmutation, recreate the archetypical sugar in the spirit, and comprehend it with the symbol of the origin. But I am not to have to talk about it, because your ancestors will make present one day, all together, and will claim you the fulfillment of the mission. Fifth Day Now, as I already communicated you these indispensable antecedents, I'll enter completely in the history of my family, Dr. Signagel. The same as I anticipated descends directly from the White Atlanteans and, of course, of the ancient Hyperborean lineages. Thousands of years ago, the Iberians were also victims of that war fatigue, which was causing a widespread amnesia in the offspring of the White Atlanteans. First it was flexibilizing the austerity of the customs, and was allowed the confusion of the urban habits of the cultural packed populations with this strategic way of life. Such cultural penetration had decisive incidents in the demoralization of the population, in the loss of the warrior alert. Then the alliances of blood were sealed, which according to the deceit that the last wise warriors suffered, would accomplish the illusions of the peace, the riches, the comfort, the progress, etc., Logically, with the princes and princesses of the populaces of the cultural pact, came the priests to impose their cult to the traitor gods and the potencies of the matter. The warriors lost in this form their spirituality. They knew the fear and speculated with the value of life. They were still capable to fight, but only until the limits of fear, like the animals, and of course, they would become fearful of the gods, respectful of their supreme wills that no one would dare defy. They would not elevate them, the gaze from the earth, neither would seek the origin. Thence, only the heroes would realize the feats that the warriors not dared to realize. Sad place of expectation reserved to the heroes when in days of the White Atlanteans the entire race was a community of heroes. The triumph of the cult produced the oblivion of the wisdom. The spirit went sleeping in the pure blood, and only those wise warriors who still had a rest of lucidity realized the desperate attempt to impress the familiar mission. In the case of our lineage, Dr. Signigel, the insanity to collect in just one hand the cult and the wisdom took my ancestors to a demential proposal. They established as guideline the perfection of the cult, that is to say, that the thing which would be perfected by us would not be fortuity, as the color or the sound, but the own cult imposed by the priests, the worship to a deity revealed by the swarthy Atlanteans, and I'm referring precisely to Belisana the goddess of the fire. But every cult is a description of the archaeotype. The familiar mission required then the demential objective to improve the cult until it adjustment with its archaeotype, which became soon a goddess, that's to say, an aspect of the creator, and, as culmination was ordained to recreate in the spirit such archaeotype, that goddess, and comprehend it with the uncreated symbol of the origin. That was as to pretend that the spirit of a descendant member of the family lineage would include one day the Creator God, and the whole universe, to comprehend it later with the symbol of the origin. In other words, that was like demanding at the end the highest wisdom, the fulfillment of the commandments of the White Atlanteans, comprehend the serpent with the symbol of the origin. I could not assure you if this hallucinative proposal was a consequence of the madness of my ancestors or obeyed to a higher inspiration, a request that the liberator gods made to the lineage. Per adventure, they knew, since the beginning, that one of us would reach to realize the familiar mission and would awake as a wise warrior in the same moment of his liberation, on the earth, the final battle. 
because if we discard a mad act of the wise warriors and we accept that they worked totally conscious of what they supposed to obtain, it doesn't explain the difficulty of such mission, unless that its fulfillment would contribute to the strategy of the essential war and was trusted in the help of the invisible guide of the liberator gods. Perhaps, then, the Liberator Gods wanted to count during the final battle with initiates capable to confront them face to face, and had decided to prove some lineages as my own, with the appropriated instrument for it. This is the comprehension of the archaeotype of the Gods. This necessity is understood through an ancient idea that the White Atlanteans transmitted to the wise warriors of my community. According to this revelation, the Liberator Gods were uncreated spirits who existed freely out of every material determination. But spirits chained in matter, in the animal man, had lost the origin and, with it, the capacity to perceive the uncreated. Only could relate themselves with the created, with the archetypical forms due to this Liberator Gods only could employ as clothing some archetypes of gods to manifest unto men. Naturally, such manifestations would only take place in front of the Hyperborean initiates, because only the initiates would be capable to transcend the clothing, the forms of the created archetypes, and resist face to face the terrible presences of the liberator gods. Being in this way, perchance, they wanted that some initiates of my lineage would reach some day, presumably during the final battle, to put in contact with the Hyperborean goddess, who is usually manifested through Belisana to whom the white Atlanteans called Freya and the ancient Hyperborean Lilith. Whatever could be the case, because of the madness or the divine inspiration, the truth is that the guideline of such mission determined that our family became fervently devoted to the perfection of the cult, to the goddess of Belisana. Surely such special dedication to the cult was savior because, for many generations, was believed that our lineage was of priests. Really, the first descendants in the familiar mission were not so different to the most fanatic priest worshippers on the fire. However, through the past of generations were emerging members who penetrated more and more in the essence of the igneous. The goddess Belisana was represented, in the primitive cult, by the flame of a perennial lamp of the swarthy Atlanteans. The perennial lamps was given to the priests to seal the blood alliances between the populations of the cultural pact and the pact of blood and as the safest magic medium to impose the cult over the wisdom. Thereby, amongst the Iberians of my community, a wise warrior married with an Iberian princess, who is also priestess of the cult of the goddess Belisana, and received as a dowry that lamp, which flame was never extinguished. Absurdly, my family possessed then the wise sword, with the stone of Venus of the white Atlanteans, and the perennial lamp with the flame of the swarthy Atlanteans. But the wise sword would not play its role yet. It was only a jealousy preserved, as a familiar tradition, because the faculty to see the sign of the origin on the stone of Venus was lost. Instead, to the perennial lamp, to the worship of the sacred flame, was given all the attention. Thus, some descendants achieved to improve the divine flame, approaching it more and more to the igneous archetype of the goddess, and also some descendants achieved to isolate and comprehend the essence of the igneous incorporating the fire archetype in the familiar blood. When this occurred, some ancestors prudently abandoned the cult of the flame, and they withdrew to the Signori of the south of Spain. They left the perennial lamp to the other familiars, who were incapable to miss the cult, and conserved the wise sword, that for them didn't mean anything. Of course, those who remained in the custody of the perennial lamp continued being kings or priests because the people were completely devoted to the worship of the goddess Belisana. Those who drew my direct ancestors had to concede and return all their rights to the royal succession. However, they maintained some power as lords of the house of Tarsus, near the Huelva in Andalusia. Thenceforth, they adopted the barbel unicorn as the symbol of the house of Tarsus. In the beginning, they represented that mystical fish in their shields of primitive blazons. But in the Middle Ages, as will be seen later, was heretically incorporated to the familiar armorial bearings. The Barbel Knight, Barbus Equus, is the commonest of the rivers from Spain, especially the Odiel, which circulated a few meters from Tarsus, receives the fish same name due to the four chins that it has in, in the lower jaw, which is very protruding. However, the barbel that the Lord of Tarsus was referring to was a fish provided by a frontal horn and five chins. The myth that justified the symbol affirmed that the barbel moving through the river Odiel was similar to the soul 
transisting through the transcendental time of life, was an animal representation of the man. But the white Atlantean offspring were not like the animal men because they possessed an uncreated spirit, or in other words, the Kala Chakra Ki. Naturally, the uncreated spirit was not possible to be represented, and because of this was insinuated leaving if not finished, and the representations of the barbel unicorn, the tip of the horn. Beyond the horn, in an infinite distance, was the uncreated spirit, absurdly related to the created matter, and the beard of the barbel, of course, meant the legacy of Navutan, the number of Venus. Naturally, the lords of Tarsus proceeded practicing the worship of Belisana, because until Lito de Tarsus there was no one who understood the familiar mission, and also because that was established and sanctioned by the laws of my people. But the secret objective of the familiar mission inexorably impulsed their participants to recreate spiritually the igneous archetype, and that marked them with an unequivocal signal. They acquired a fame of being a family of mystics and adventurers, when not of dangerous madmen. And there was some truth in that fable due to that fire in the blood, uncontrolled in a beginning, caused the strongest extremes of violence and passion. Existed those who experienced in their lives the most terrible hate and the most sublime love that humanely could be conceived. And all that experience was condensed and synthesized in the tree of the blood and was genetically transmitted to the heritors of the lineage. With the pass of time, the extreme tendencies were gradually separating and periodically lords were pure love or pure courage, i.e., great mystics or great warriors. Amongst the first were those who assured that the ancient goddess had installed in their hearts and that her flame turned them on in a love ecstasy. Within the seconds, those who adversely affirmed that she had frozen their hearts, she had infused such courage that now they were as hard as the rocks of Tarsus. Also the ladies intervened in the selection. They felt the fire in the blood as a god, which they identified as Beleno, the husband of Belisana. Really, this Beleno, god of fire that the Greeks knew as Apollo, the Hyperborean, was an igneous archetype employed since the days of the Atlantis by the most powerful of the liberator gods as clothing to be manifested unto men. I'm referring to the great chief of the Hyperborean spirits, Lucifer, who defy the power of wisdom, the power of the illusion of the creator god, to envoy by the unknowable god, the real Christos of uncreated light. Was missing then that the lineage of the lords of Tarsus gave birth to the child who would comply with their familiar mission, who would recreate in the spirit the fire of the gods and comprehend it with the symbol of the origin. I anticipate you, Dr. Signagel, that only two had such possibility in eminent grade. Lito de Tarsus, in the sixteenth century, and my son Noyo, in the present. But let's go step by step. Sixth day. The mountain range, Katochar, has always been rich in gold and silver. While my people were strong in the Iberian Peninsula, the riches permitted the lords of Tarsus to live with great splendor. The strategic mode of life had been forgotten thousands of years ago, before to acquire the rights of such signiori, and the land was not occupied any more to practice the magic cultivation. In that period was believed in the property of the land, in the power of gold. All the kingdoms were infested of merchants who offered, for gold, the most beautiful things. Spices, woven, dresses, utensils, jewels, and even weapons. Weapons that before were manufactured by each combatant population, being the most perfect the ones accumulated by the populations of the Pact of Blood. Then could be purchased to the dealers by a handful of gold and the lords of Tarsus with their gold and silver, which were brought to the peasants, the half of their feast. The other half, less than the necessary to subsist, corresponded as is logic to the lords of Tarsus for being the owners of the land, and the excess of those ailments with the gold and silver which abounded would pass to the ports of Huelva, which was then named Onuba, to become in goods of the most varied spices. The Phoenicians, descendants of the red race of the Atlantis, were counted amongst the populations which had associated since the beginning to the cultural pact. In the past they had been sworn foes of the Iberians. Only a hundred years before my family arrived to the Signiori of Tarsus, the Phoenicians had occupied the citadel of Tarshish, which was enclaved near to the confluence of the rivers Tinto and Odiel. Finally, after a brief but fierce war, my people recovered the territory, although conditioned by a peace agreement which allowed the free market of the Red Race. From Tarshish to Onuba, in little fluvial transports or in caravans, and from Onuba to the Middle East in foreign ships, 
The Phoenicians monopolized the trading of goods due to the presence of merchants from other populaces was incomparably minor. Without judging here the cultural pact that such commercial trade caused and the customs of my people, the truth is that the lords of Tarsus governed a calm population, was becoming famous for its richness and prosperity. But that illusory peace soon came to be perturbed, and not precisely as could be concluded in the superficial observation, but the gold of Tarsus would awake the greed of the foreign populaces and conquerors. Such greed existed, and invaders and conquerors were many. However, the main reason of all problems, and finally the ruin of the house of Tarsus, was the advent of the Golems. Since the 8th century BC, approximately, when Sargon, king of Assyria, destroyed the kingdom of Israel, the Golems started to appear in the Iberian Peninsula. First they came accompanying the Phoenician merchants and landed in all the ports of the Mediterranean Sea, but then was proved that they also advanced by land, behind a Scythian population that they dominated Asia Minor. The population, which was of our same race, crossed Europe from east to west and arrived to Spain two centuries later when the destructive work of the damn golems was advanced enough. The golems, for their part, clearly evidenced that they belonged to another race, and they affirmed it with pride. They were members, they conceded, of the chosen people by the Creator God to reign over the earth. Their masters were the Egyptian priests, and they came thereby in representation of the swarthy Atlanteans, all the native populations of the peninsula which arrived with the golems. Not remembered the strategic way of life, and they were in power of priests of different cults. The mission of the Golems consisted in to demonstrate their priestly authority and unify the cults. For it they disposed of diabolic powers they evoked undoubtedly to the swarthy Atlanteans, and a cruelty with no limits. Then the Creator God and the potencies of the matter sent them to reaffirm the cultural pact. Times were ready for men to receive a new revelation, a knowledge that would bring more peace, progress, and civilization than the reached, thence by the populations of the cultural pact and the idea that one day would make those goods permanent and would end forever with the evil and wars that revelation that knowledge that idea was synthesized in the next concept the singularity of god behind the plurality of the cults the golems indeed had to come to illuminate the populations and the priests of all cults relating to the multiplicity of god and the necessary union that this one maintains on his own sphere this would be the formula Above all things are the gods, and above all the gods is the one. For this reason they not pretended to replace the gods, or change their names, neither to alter the forms of the cults. Is natural, they said, that God has many names, because he exhibits many faces. It is comprehensible also the existence of many cults to worship the different faces of God. Nothing of this offends God, nothing of this questions his unity, but when the one will show inflexible with men where he won't accept apologies, where he will put his thousand justness eyes, will be in the sacrifice of the cult. Because whatever could be the form of the cult, the sacrifice is one. That's to say, the sacrifice participates from the one. According to this newfangled revelation, the unity of the Creator was proved in the ritual sacrifice, and the worship of the Creator for every cult was demonstrated by the ritual sacrifice. O oh, doctor, even if today those cults seem to be distant practices of ancient times, I can't think without shudder with horror in the thousands of thousands of human victims produced by the discovery of the golems. I will refer now to a tough aspect of the behavior of the golems. Perhaps the key is in the fact that they considered the Creator God, in His absolute unity, as masculine. The One, in fact, was a male God, and nothing was above or below Him to equilibrate or neutralize that polarity. They admitted a relative cosmic androgyny until a specific level, dwelled by gods and goddesses, properly mated. But in the summit, as creator and lord of the other gods, was the one, who was not androgyny, neither neuter but masculine. The one not admitted goddesses beside him, because he by himself was enough to exist, was a lonely male god. With such aberrant conception must not surprise that the golems were also lonely men. However, even if the key of their behavior is here, it must not be so easy to derive from this the principle that took them to the practice between the onanism and the ritual sodomy. Because there usually dwelled in forests, away from the population, and their depraved practices, many believed that the golems came from Phrygia, where existed an ancient cult of the male bibi, which was also related to the sodomite priests. There the priests castrated themselves voluntarily, and the temple was guarded by a court of eunuchs. Others suppose that they came from India, 
where it was known since ancient times a cult of phallus worshippers. But the golems didn't come from Phrygia, neither from India, but from Canaan. And they not practiced the castration, neither the worship of the phallus, but simply the sodomy. They had exiled the women in the same way that their god had dethroned all the goddesses. They had solitary life, and usually exempt from pleasures, except the ritual sodomy which represented the self-sufficiency of him. Logically, even if the golems were extremely tolerant to the form of the cults, and the only in what they didn't transgress was in what concerned to the unity of God in the sacrifice, is understood that they manifested predilection from the populations which their cults personified male gods, and some contempt to the worshippers of the goddesses. Very soon this attitude of indifference or contempt was not just a rejection that the golems dispensed to the goddess, would enter in collision with such particular form that the Iberian people had adopted in the cult of Belisana. But they counted, certainly, with the support of the potencies of matter. In other form, their success could not be explained. Due to, in relatively short time, they achieved to dominate the populaces of Hispania, an inclusive Hiberenia, Britain, Armorica, and Gaul. Even by the increasing power of the Golem, their sinister doctrine would have not produced any harm to the lords of Tarsus, always disposed to accept all that contributed to improve the practice of the cult. Were not the sacrifices of the one what determined the luck of my family, but other activity that the Golems realized with great energy? They attempted by every means to fulfill the second part of the cultural pact. It means that, even though it was not necessary to make the war with the populations of the Pact of Blood any more, because they were already culturally defeated, still remained intact many megalithic works of the White Atlanteans, and that constituted a sin that cried to heaven. The populations of the Cultural Pact missed to their compromises with the gods, and that guilty would be severely punished. Nevertheless, and by luck for them, existed a solution to practice the sacrifice with the major rigor and help the golems in the fulfillment of the mission. In other words, the native populations had now to be consecrated to the sacrifice, sacrifice themselves and sacrifice, and as a reward the golems would release them from the divine punishment, executing the destruction of the megalithic works or their neutralization. This would be all if it was not because the gods had made a warning, and who disobeyed it would risk to be destroyed without mercy and an exemplary punishment of men. What would not be forgotten in no way thence, due to the patience of the gods, was exhausted, was the remembrance of the pact of blood in the quest for the wisdom. There was the forbidden, the abominable for the eyes of the gods, but the most forbidden and most abominable, an irredeemable sin, was without doubts the desire to conserve the stone of Venus, would suffer the sentence of the extermination, i.e., he would pay with the destruction of his lineage, with the annihilation of all the members of his lineage. It is not necessary to say that the golems obtained very soon almost all of the stones that still continued in the hands of the native populations. Contrarily to the priests of the cult, they only remitted some of them to the white fraternity. Others were reserved to be used in magical acts because they boasted to know their secrets and use it in behoof of their plans. And to them dominated pejoratively serpent eggs. The lords of Tarsus, it is very clear, never trusted in the golems, neither were intimidated by their threats. But the wise sword was a reality that had converted in popular legend, and which could not be seriously denied. The golems suspected from the beginning that in such arm existed a secret vestige of the pact of blood. Because the lords of Tarsus, not acceded to give it voluntarily, and that it could not be bought at any price, decided to apply against them all the resources of the magic, the diabolic powers of the power of matter. And here the surprise of the golems was huge because they realized that such powers couldn't do anything against the demential fire that turned on the blood of the lords of Tarsus. The madness, warrior or mystical, which distinguished them as unpredictable and indomitable men, situated them also out of the reach of the magic spells of the golems. They had no other choice, according to their demonic designs, than to appropriate by force the wise sword and condemn the house of Tarsus to the extermination sentence. This was, Dr. Signagel, the real reason of the continuous state of war that the lords of Tarsus had to live onwards, what meant the definitive loss of the illusory sovereignty enjoyed until then, and not the greed that foreign populaces and conquerors would have fed by their riches. On the contrary, not existed in the whole world a king, lord, or simple adventurer of war that the golems not tried to allure with the conquest of Tarsus, with a fabled booty in silver and gold that would win who tries the feat and where their intrigues which caused the constant siege of pirates and bandits. 
while they could the lords of tarsus resisted the pressure by their own means that's to say with the concourse of the warriors of my population but when this was not possible any more especially when they knew that the phoenicians of tyre were concentrating a powerful mercenary army on the balearics to invade and colonize tarsus they had no other choice than to accept help naturally interested of a foreign populace they requested help to lydia a pelasgian nation from the aegean sea integrated by eminent navigators whose overseas ships landed in onuba two or three times every year to merchandise with the people of tarsus they had the defect that there were also merchants and producers of dispensable goods and they were accustomed to practices and habits more culturally advanced than the primitive iberians but in compensation they exhibited the important attribute that they were of the same race and demonstrated an undoubted ability for war for pelasgians history has known a group of populations established in different mediterranean and tyrrhenian coasts of the aegean peninsula and from asia minor thereby to find a common origin amongst all them it is necessary to go back to the beginning of history to the subsequent times of the atlantean catastrophe when the white atlanteans instituted the pact of blood with the natives of the iberian peninsula really in that time was only one native populace which was separated according to the atlanteans exogamy laws in three big groups the iberians the basques and the one that would be later the pelasgians each one of those big groups was subdivided internally in three in every tribal social organization of the villages populations and kingdoms that unique population would be known after the departure of the white atlanteans as vitrions or vitrions that is to say breeders by the name soon would be changed in vitrions or vetrions and due to the influence of other populaces especially the phoenicians in virons or girons the giant giron with a pair of legs i e was just one racial base but triple form above the waist that's to say with three bodies and three heads it came from an ancient pelasgian myth in which the original population was represented with the triple exogamy division imposed by the white atlanteans through the pass of the centuries the three big groups of the native population were identified by their particular names and the original unity was forgotten the rivalries and intrigues stimulated since the cultural pact contributed to it finishing each group convinced of their racial and cultural individuality to the iberians i already mentioned because from them i descend and i will continue quoting them in this history from the basques i will not tell anything except that they promptly betrayed the pact of blood and allied to the cultural pact ere that they would pay with great suffering and a high strategic confusion because they were a population of very pure blood concerning to the pelasgians the case is quite simple after the departure of the white atlanteans they were massively accompanied by the pelagasians to whom they had entrusted the work to transport them to the sea of anatolia there they bade farewell to the atlanteans and decided to stay in the zone giving place with the time to a numerous formation of a confederation of populations successive invasions obeyed them in many opportunities to abandon their settlements but as they became an excellent navigators they knew how to go out fine from all their misfortunes however those emplacements would bring them again in direction to the iberian peninsula and the moments when occurred the alliance with the lydian century eight b c other groups of pelasgians already occupied italy and the gaul under the name of etruscans tyrrhenian truscans taruscos ruscos resnos etc the group of the lydian that the lords of tarsus convoked still remained in asia minor although resisting on that age a terrible food shortage they recognized by the traditions the propinquity which connected them to the iberians but they affirmed to descend from manes legendary ancestor who was no other than manu the flawless archetype of the animal man imposed in their cults by the priests of the cultural pact once achieved the agreement with the ambassadors of the king of lydia which included the well-known princess interchange tens of pelasgian ships started to arrive in the ports of tarsus they came replete of fearsome warriors but also brought many families of settlers disposed to establish definitively amongst those distant relatives who great fame had for their riches and prosperity that pacific invasion didn't enthuse my people too much but they couldn't do anything about it because everyone comprehended the immenseness of the phoenician danger that peril didn't disappear until they warned the change of situation and evaluated the cost that would suppose now the conquest of tarsus in this time the golems were eluded but they would not forget the wise sword neither the lords of tarsus nor the sentence of extermination that was over them 
In such circumstances, the alliances with the Pelasgians was a success in every perspective. The Lydian people were counted amongst the first populations of the Pact of Blood that had defeated the taboo of iron and knew the secret of the smelting and rot. In that time, the swords of iron were the most powerful weapons on the earth. However, even though they were remarkable merchants, they never sold an iron weapon, which were only produced in right quantity for their own use. They fabricated instead a high number of bronze weapons to sell in barter. Therefore, their interest to stay in Tarsus, where the copper veins of high quality were well known since legendary times, when the Atlanteans were crossing the western sea and extracted the copper with the aid of the ray of Poseidon. The copper was not almost exploited by the lords of Tarsus, dazzled by the gold and silver that bought everything. The association with the Lydian essentially modified that criterion and introduced in the population a newfangled lifestyle based on the production of cultural objects, massive destined exclusively for the commerce. A deterrent wall of stone rose around the ancient citadel of Tarsus that the Pelasgians called Tartessos, which ended giving the name to the country with a perimeter that comprised now an area of four or five times larger. The old citadel was transformed in a huge market, and in the new fortified spaces, the ateliers and factories emerged every day. The woven dresses, footwear, utensils, potteries, furniture, gold objects, silver, copper, and bronze practically not existed commodity that could not be bought in Tartessos. And except for the tin, indispensable for the bronze industry, which was taken from Albion, all, even the food, was produced in Tartessos. Evidently, by influence of the cultural pact, the alliance between my population and the Lydian culminated in a civilizing explosion. Thereupon, the Signiori of Tarsus was converted in the kingdom of Tartessos, and, in a few centuries, it expanded through all Andalusia. The Tartessians found then important cities, as Manes, today called Torre del Mar, or Masita, which the usurper Carthaginesis renamed as Carthage, Cartagena, the fleet reached to be such powerful as the Phoenician and its commerce, highly competitive for the best quality of products, achieved to put in grave danger the economy of the Red Men. Recently, since the 6th century BC, due to the Greek colonization and the expansion of the Phoenician colony of Carthage, declined a little the commercial and maritime Mediterranean supremacy of the Tartessians. I must insist that the fact of being close relatives facilitated enormously in the integration with the Pelasgians. That could be specially proved in the case of the cult, where there were almost no difference between the two populaces because the Lydian worshipped also the goddess of fire, who they knew as Belilith. In few words for Lydian, Beleno was Bel, and Belisana was Belilith. Also, because they came from a region where the cultural pact had major influence, presented some differences in the language and in the sacred alphabet. The ancient Pelasgian language, that in Mai was still spoken with great purity, had suffered in the Lydian. Had suffered in the Lydian the influence of the Semitic and Asiatic languages. However, that sailor jargon was more adequate for the overseas commerce that they practiced. The other difference was in the alphabet, since thousands of years that my people had forgotten the language of the birds. However, the last initiates and the priests of the flame conserved the sacred alphabet of the thirteen plus three vrunes which they represented with sixteen signs formed by straight lines and had associated with a common language. In this way was disposed from thirteen consonants and three vowels. The vowels were only known by the lords of Tarsus because they expressed the Pelasgian name, secret, of the goddess Moon, something like Loa. Well, the newness that brought the Lydian was a sacred alphabet composed by thirteen plus five letters, i.e. by eighteen signs which represented quiet sounds of the common language. They had also thirteen consonants, but the vowels were five, and the two added, the Lydian, could not suppress them any more without losing more than the half of their words. The most important of all this, something that would have to be agreed immediately, was the name of the goddess and the number of the sacred alphabet. In regard to the first, it was agreed to refer to the goddess and the successive by an older name, which was common to the two populaces, Pyrene. Since then, Belisana and Belilith would be for the Tartessians the goddess of fire, Pyrene. Referring to the second, the lords of Tarsus were affected in that moment by the enemy pressure. They had no other choice than to accept the imposition of the sacred alphabet of eighteen letters. The only solace, they said with irony, consisted in that the number eighteen was most pleasant for the goddess then sixteen. Otherwise, the Lydian had suffered a similar luck to my people. In some moments of their history they were defeated by the war fatigue and finally yielded to the populaces of the cultural pact.
and the last of their initiates achieved then to impress the familiar missions, even in the highest number of lineages, than those that existed among my people. That explained the enormous amount of families of artisans specialized in the most varied occupations that integrated the population of the Lydian. Seventh day. The mountain ranges of Sierra Morena are part of the divisory Marianica, which separates the south of Andalusia from the rest of the Iberian Peninsula, from the Mediterranean, in front of the Belares, up to the Gordo Hill and the base level of the river Guadiana, its land relief has an approximated longitude of 600 kilometers, and the occidental extreme, giving origin to the river Odiel, which goes from the east to the southeast of the Sierra de Aracena, in one of its hills is enclaved the Templar Castle from which I will refer later. Many chains of minor mountain ranges extended to the south. One of them is the one of the River Tinto, from where comes the river of the same name. Other is Catochar, settlement of the main mines of the House of Tarsus. The rivers Tinto and Odiel extend toward the Golfo de Cadiz and converge a few kilometers before the coast, forming a wide estuary. In the fringe of the terrain that is between both rivers, over the base level of the Odiel, is established there since ancient times the fluvial and maritime city of Onuba, today called Huelva. And some 25 kilometers from Onuba, Odiel above, was located the ancient citadel of Tarsus, and the environs of the actual village of Valdeverde del Camino. The river Tinto, red wine colored, or Pinto, receives the name due to its waters, descend crimson stained by the iron minerals that collects in Sierra Aracena. The Odiel otherwise was always a sacred river for the Iberians, and due to this they identified it with the most important Vrun, the Vrun that represents the name of Navutan, the great chief of the White Atlanteans. It seems that Navutan meant Lord, Na, Vutan. In the language of the White Atlanteans, the different Indo-German populations which participated in the Pact of Blood but when they fell to the strategy of the cultural pact, they concluded that it was referring to a god and they worshipped him under different names, all derived from Nabutan. In this way, he was called Nabu from Nabutan, Wotan from Navutan or Navothan, Odan or Odin from Navodan or Navodin, Odiel or Odal from Navodiel or Navodal, etc. Five kilometers to the north of the citadel of Tarsus, in the mountain ranges system of the Sierra Catochar, is located the hill Char, name that means fire and verb in divers Iberian dialects. On its peak existed an ash forest which was venerated by the Iberians in memory of Navotan. There the white Atlanteans had erected an enormous menhir, signalized with his rune. They had planted it in the middle of the forest, in a site where strangely existed a little group of apple trees and the days of the lords of Tarsus only survived one of those trees, and no one knew to explain if the others disappeared by natural causes or by intentional deforestation. The one that remained planted was like twenty steps from the men here, and was seen with no doubts that it was a tree many times centennial. All the pre-Greek Mediterranean antiquity knew the existence of the apple trees of Tarsus, where the devotees of the goddess of fire usually realized annual pilgrimages. In a beginning, indeed, the ashes and apple trees were associated to Navotan and Freya, respectively. Later, after the alliance of blood with the populaces of the cultural pact, the priests consecrated the apple tree of Tarsus to the goddess Belisana and established the custom to celebrate the cult around its old trunk. For it, they constructed a stone altar composed by two columns and a transversal paving stone, whereon the perennial lamp was placed. That immortal fire represented the goddess and the apple tree the path to follow. While the priests were teaching, the Creator God wrote the cult in the seed of the apple tree. The tree was just a part of the required message to the destiny of man. The flower, for example, was equivalent to the heart of man. The seed of the soul and its form and its color expressed the promise of the goddess. But the other part of the mission was written in the rose bush, and the promise of the goddess also gleamed on its flower. On its form and color, the apple tree and the rose bush were not only plants of the same family, but they really consisted in just one plant was the promise of the goddess, what divided the seed of the apple tree to produce many different flowers, flowers that would reveal the path of the perfection to those men who consecrate to her and embrace her cult. Of course, the myth that described the cult would only be revealed by the priests to those they consider to be prepared for the initiation in the priesthood. That's to say, to those who would be also priests. The meaning, the secret, of the promise would be this. 
the apple tree and the rose bush, corresponded to two states or phases in the human life, as the childhood and the adulthood, for example. When he was as a child, men had his heart similar to the flower of the apple tree, which was externally white and rosy and widely unfolded. And when he would be as an adult, that is, initiated as a priest of the cult, or when he could be capable to officiate as a priest, he would have the heart as the flower of the rose bush, which color was as the fire of the goddess, and was never completely unfolded except to die. For this reason existed in the world just one apple tree and many rose bushes, because many would be the perfections that the man who began the priesthood of the goddess would be able to reach. The story of the apple tree was already written, otherwise the story of the rose bush was always being written, and the best part was not written yet. Would come to the world some day men with such a perfect heart that then would come the most beautiful rose bushes as never had been seen before in the earth. With this explanation, will be understood why the priests had permitted that an old climbing rose bush would have rolled as a serpent on the apple tree trunk of Tarsus. Undoubtedly, such disposition of the two trees was necessary to represent the secret meaning of the cult. The ritual obeyed to worship the fire of the goddess and to admire the flower of the apple tree, intensely wishing that the goddess comply her promise and make turn the heart of the priest as the flower of the rose bush. But the population, who usually ignored this interpretation of the cult, came from every part of the apple tree of Tarsus to realize the offerings before the fire altar of the goddess. When my ancestors acquired the rights of the Signiori of Tarsus, which in that time was very reduced and devastated by the recent war against the Phoenicians, they took naturally the responsibility of the local cult. Although they didn't have the perennial lamp, Practically, they not introduced reforms in what referred to the promise because they accepted as a fact that the heart was related with the flower of the apple tree, and that the worship to the goddess would produce an analogous transformation to the flower of the rose bush. Only in what treated about the fire was appreciated the first visible effect that the familiar mission was acting in the lords of Tarsus. They added to the title of the goddess the word cold. That's to say that Belisana was now the goddess of the cold fire. They explained that change as a local revelation of the goddess. She had spoken to the lords of Tarsus and the communication. She affirmed that her fire would be installed in the heart of men and would transmute them. And that fire in the beginning, extremely warm, finally would turn colder than the ice and would be that cold fire what would produce the mutation of the human nature. It must be seen in this change, something more than a simple aggregation of words was the first time that in a cult appeared the possibility to face and overcome the fear, in other words, to the feeling that in all cults claimed the submission of the believer. The fear to the gods is an indispensable and necessary feeling to maintain alive, to ensure the terrestrial authority of the priests, if not men are afraid of them. Finally, he will rebel against the gods, but before he would rebel against the priests of the gods, however this change would not be seen, if before it is not clarified something that today is not so obvious. The fact that in all the Indo-Germanic languages, cold and fear have the same root. What can still be intuited, for example, in the word. Here the author gives an example in a Spanish word which can't be appreciated in the English translation. Escalofrío. That means chill of terror. With the Spanish word frío, cold. Well, in that time the word frío was synonymous of fear. And in consequence... What the new cult meant was that a terror without name would be installed in the heart of the believer as grace of the goddess, and that terror would produce the perfection. In this way, Balisana, the goddess of the cold fire, had converted also in the goddess of terror, a title that, even if the lord of Tarsus couldn't know it, belonged in very ancient times to the same goddess, because the wife of Nabutan was also known as Freya, who infuses terror to the soul and succor to the spirit. After the arrival of the Iberian Peninsula, the Golems tried many times to occupy the sacred forest and control the cult of the goddess of the cold fire, but they were always refused by the jealous and obstinate mystical madness of the lords of Tarsus. Even they reached to offer a genuine perennial lamp of the swarthy Atlanteans, knowing that they didn't have one, and that they were obeyed to permanently watch the flame of their primitive lamp of oil and asbestos. It is not necessary to clarify that they offered it in turn of the unification of the cult and the institution of the ritual sacrifice, and that such proposal resulted unacceptable for the lords of Tarsus. The reason is obvious at this part of the narration, and it is also evident that such resistance, unusual for who had imposed all over the native populaces, added to their impossibility in the appropriation of the wise sword. 
while was permanently exasperating them against the lords of Tarsus. The reaction of the Golems unchained that international campaign, encouraging the conquest of Tarsus, what ended in the dangerous Phoenician invasion attempt from the Balearics and Gades or Cadiz. But the lords of Tarsus convoked the Lydian and made the Phoenicians desist from their conquest project, at least for the next four centuries. From the alliance between Iberians and Lydian emerged the Empire of Tartessos, which soon expanded through all Andalusia, and deprived the Phoenicians of coast colonies and their territory. The Belares and the Isla de Leon, settlements of Gades, remained isolated of mainland because the Tartessians were only allowed to maintain an exiguous commerce through their own ports. What would be the next reaction of the Golems, before such might which was developing out of their control, and that was all frustrating their plans? Before, to give answer to that, estimated and paradoxically patient Dr. Signigel, I must make you aware of the consequences that the presence of the Lydian produced to the cult of the cold fire. To understand the next, we only need to remember that the Lydian were more educated than the Iberians, that's to say, more culturally civilized. Instead, the more uneducated Iberians, in other words, more barbarous, were more spiritually cultivated than the Lydian. They possessed more wisdom than knowledge. Those differences would produce that the Lydian princes, now from the same family of the lords of Tarsus, would accept without deepening in the esoteric meaning of the cult of the goddess of the cold fire, therefore would be denominated by common agree Pyrene, and would employ all their effort to improve the exoteric form of the cult. Such application goes always in detriment of the esoteric part, and as could not be another way, with the time would result fatal for the Tartessians. But this you will see then, as I announced, I am going step by step. The Lydians, as in other industries, were skilled artisans of stone. What do you believe that they made in their eagerness in the development of the exterior form of the cult? They decided, before of the horror of their Iberian relatives, that nothing could make to avoid it to carve the menier in the sacred forest with the image of Pyrene. The sculpture would contribute in the sustaining of the cult, they explained, due to the necessity of the Lydian people of a more specifically image of the goddess. Her representation as the flame was too abstract for them. The menier consisted in a brute stone olive-colored, of some five meters of elevation and of truncated cone form. The Lydian proposed to employ it completely to carve the head of the goddess. According to their project, the nape had to be in front of the apple tree, in such form that the divine face would see directly to the population, and the people distributed in a surrounding clear space from where was performed the ritual scene, would see the face of the goddess and behind it the apple tree of Tarsus. Two master sculptors working in the carving, one on the sculpt of the face and the other the serpentine forelocks. Meanwhile, other three assistants were occupied to make the cavity of the nape, connecting with the eyes of the goddess. The work was not finished before five years. Even when the iron tools of the Lydian allowed to advance a lot in the beginning, the proposed polished termination demanded them many years of work. Really, the Tartessians would continue polishing for decades the head of Pyrene, until it endow an impressive realism. The necessity that the Lydian felt in the contemplation of a figure manifestation of the goddess was common in that period. The populations of the cultural pact were experimenting then a widespread fall in the exoterism of the cult. What took them to worship the most formal and apparent aspects of the deity? The populations presaged that the gods were retiring from inside, but they could only detain from outside. For that reason, they were desperately clung to the bodies and the divine faces, and to any natural form which represented them. Being in this way must not surprise the intense religious fever that awakes in populations and the extraordinary geographic diffusion that the cult of the cold fire produced after the transformation of the Menir. Apart from the Tartessians, prideful depositaries of the promise of the goddess, people from a thousand different populations pilgrimaged toward the sacred forests of Tartessos to be present in the ritual of the cold fire. Among others were the Iberians and Ligurians coming from all the corners of the peninsula, and the brilliant Pelasgians from Tyrrhenia, and the portly Berbers from Libya, and the silent Spartans, Lacedaemonia, and the tattooed Picts from the Albion, etc., and all those who reached to Pyrene came disposed to die. To die, yes. Due to that was the condition of the promise, the requirement of her grace. As all her worshippers knew, the goddess had the power to convert men in gods, to elevate them to the heaven of the gods. But, as all also knew, 
The strange chosen ones that she accepted had previously to pass through the test of the cold fire, that's to say, through the experience of her fatal gaze, and such experience ended generally in the physical death of the chosen one, according to what their adepts knew, and without that such certainty affected in nothing the fascination for her. There were much more chosen ones who had died than the provenly reborn. Those who received her fatal gaze certainly fell, and many, most of them, never stand up. But some of them did, and that remote possibility was enough for the worshippers of the goddess to risk everything. Those who would awake from the death would be those who really had given their hearts to the cold fire of the goddess, and those who she would reward taking them as husbands. For her grace, when reborn, the chosen one would not be a man of flesh and bones, but a man of a mortal stone, a son of the death. Thus titles in the beginning constituted an enigma for the lords of Tarsus, who introduced the reform of the cold fire in the ancient cult of Belisana, because they affirmed to have received directly from the goddess in a mystical inspiration, although they supposed that was referring to a superior condition of men, near to the gods of the great ancestors. But then, when amongst the same lords of Tarsus existed men of stone, the answer became suddenly clear but occurred that such answer was not suitable for the asleep men, neither to the chosen ones, who with the most fervor worshipped the goddess. The men of stone would silent to the secret, of which would only talk amongst them and would form a college of Tartessian hierophants to preserve it. Therefore would be the Tartessians hierophants, that's to say my ancestors, transmuted by the cold fire who would control the march of the cult. Eighth Day In the period when the ritual of cold fire was not celebrated, the Tartessian hierophants allowed the pilgrims to reach the clear space of the sacred forest and contemplate the colossal effigy of Pyrene. There they could deposit the offerings and meditate if they were disposed to face the death of the test of the cold fire, or if they preferred to return to their illusory reality of their common life. By the moment, the goddess could not harm them, because her eyes were closed and no one was communicating her sign of death. But even for this conviction, many remained frozen affright before the revealed ancient countenance, and were no less those who escaped in that moment or died of terror right there. Though is due to that menhir was placed there by the white Atlantean demigods thousands of years before. But in the days of the alliance with the Lydian, not existed anyone over the earth capable to emulate such feat, to translate through thousands of kilometers a giant stone, and deposit it in the middle of an extensive ash forest, without deforesting the zone. It is understood, then, that the pilgrims received the intermediate impression that such terrible sculpture was made by the gods. But not only the menhir was the work of the gods, because the confirmation of the countenance proceeded from that notable capacity to degrade the divine that exhibited the Lydian, Craftily, the Tartessians were always worried to inform about the origin of the disquieting sculpture. Who achieved to recover from the first impression, and became aware in the details of the extraordinary countenance, had to appeal to all his forces to not be won, earlier or later, by the panic. Remember, Doctor, that for their worshippers, what they had in front was not just a mere representation of an inert stone, but the alive image of the goddess. Pyrene was manifested in the countenance, and the countenance participated of her, and was that heretic countenance was stole the breath. Probably if someone would have achieved with a powerful abstraction act to separate the face from the head of the goddess, would have found it of beautiful traits. In first place, and although the green coloration of the stone due to the form of the traits, it undoubtedly belonged to the white race. In the next order would need to be recognized in the general countenance an archetypical Indo-Germanic beauty, or directly Aryan. The oval of the visage rectangular, broad forehead, thick eyebrows, horizontal and slightly curved, the eyelids, as we already said, that the eyes remained closed, demonstrated by their expression a frontal gaze, of orbed and perfect eyes, the nose straight and proportionate, strong and prominent chin, strong and thin neck, the mouth with the lower lip thicker and a little more protrusive than the upper, was perchance the most beautiful note, and curved in a scarcely outlined smile, in an unequivocal gesture of cosmic irony. Naturally, no one without the needed capacity of abstraction would be aware of these signalized traits. On the contrary, undoubtedly all his attention would be absorbed immediately by the hair of the goddess. In this primary observation, 
surely would neutralize the aforementioned aesthetic appreciation. When contemplating the head on its junction, hair and face, the goddess presented that frightening aspect which produced panic in the Redu pilgrims. But what was in her hair able to paralyze those rude pilgrims, normally habituated to danger? Serpents. Serpents of exceptional realism. Her hair was composed by eighteen serpents of stone, eight of different length, fell on both sides of the face, and the other two, much smaller, were curly on her forehead. Each pair of eight serpents were the same height, two in the height of the eyes, two in the nose, two in the mouth, and two in the chin, emerging from a previous level of hair. The other eight serpentines returned and situated their heads within the anterior, and each serpent, when separating from the other forelocks, formed in the air with its body two opposed curves, as an S, which permitted to announce the next movement, the mortal attack, and the two serpents of the forehead, although smaller, also evidenced identical aggressive attitude. In sum, when the countenance of the smiling goddess was admired frontwards, emerged with strength the arch of the eighteen serpent heads of her hair. And all the heads were forward turned, accompanying with her eyes the gaze without eyes of the goddess, and all the heads had the jaw horribly opened, exposing the mortal fangs and abysmal throats. Therefore, must it not surprise that such impressive apparition of the goddess terrified her most loyal worshippers. Logically, such composition had an esoteric meaning that only the hierophants or initiates knew, although eventually they disposed of an acceptable exoteric explanation. In this last case they notified to the traveler, who sometimes could be an allied king or an important ambassador to whom the knowledge could not be totally denied that the eighteen serpents represented the letters of the Tartessian alphabet, which they pretended to have received from the goddess. During the ritual, the initiates affirmed to hear the serpents of the goddess reciting the sacred alphabet. The esoteric truth behind all this was that the eighteen letters really corresponded to the eighteen runes of Nabutan, and that with them could be understood the sign of the origin, and with this the serpent, highest symbol of the human knowledge, but such truth was scarcely intuited by the Tartessian hierophants, due to in those days no one saw the sign of the origin, neither remembered the runes of Nabutan. When incorporating the reform of the cold fire, the lords of Tarsus had received the word of the goddess, that the house of Tarsus, offspring of the white Atlanteans, would not be extinguished, while the lost wisdom would be recovered by one of their members. And to comply her word, less than ever they should detach from the wise sword." That moment not reached yet, and no descendant of the house of Tarsus understood the depth meaning of the esoteric truth that revealed the stone head of Pyrene. So for them was also an unquestionable truth, the fact that the eighteen serpents represented the letters of the Tartessian alphabet. The two smaller serpents, for example, corresponded to the two letters included by the Lydian, and its pronunciation remained in secret. The same for the name of the goddess Moon, composed by the three vowels of the Iberians. In this case, the two vows permitted to know the name that goddess Pyrene gave to herself when she manifested as cold fire in the heart of men, i.e., I am, something like you or I. Every year when the winter solstice was coming, the hierophants determined the nearest full moon, and in that night was celebrated in Tartessos the ritual of the cold fire. Would not be many the chosen ones who, finally, would dare to defy the test of the cold fire and almost all the cases a group that could be counted with the hand of fingers. The menier was aligned towards the west of the apple tree of Tarsus, in such way that the goddess moon would invariably appear behind the tree, and would transit through the sky until reached the zenith, placed from where would totally illuminate the countenance of the goddess, and behind the apple tree of Tarsus. When the brighter countenance of the goddess moon was placed over the sacred forest, the chosen ones remained in silent, with the legs crossed and expressing with the hands the mudra of the cold fire. And that moment was only permitted, the chew willow's leaf. A part of this they had to remain in rigorous quietude, until the zenith of the full moon. The dramatic tension grew instant by instant, and in that point reached such intensity that the terror of the chosen ones seemed to have extended through the environment and turned breathable. Not only the terror was breathable, but it was epidermally perceived as though some dreadful presence had sprouted from the rays of the moon and had oppressed with a cold and startling embrace. 
invariably was reached that climax at the beginning of the ritual. Then a hierophant moved to the back part of the stone head and ascended through a little stair, which was carved in the rock of the menhir, and then placed in the interior of it. The stair, which counted eighteen steps and ended in a circular platform, allowed the access to a frustum platform. This was a narrow precinct of one or two meters of elevation, excavated exactly behind the face and scarcely illuminated from the floor by the perennial lamp. Over the floor platform, in fact, existed a tiny stove made of stone, in which furnace was placed. Since the Lydian improved the form of the cult, the perennial lamp, a slab permitted to cover the upper part of the stove and moderate the exiguous light way out. Now this light was minimum due to the hierophant was prepared to realize a crucial operation of the ritual, to effectuate the aperture of the eyes of the goddess. To make it, they just had to displace inwards both pieces of stone connected each other, which usually remained perfectly assembled in the face, and produced the illusion that some stony eyelids covered the bulb of the eyes. Those heavy pieces required the strength of two men to be placed in that position. But once there was enough to release the tether, and they slid over the ramp that occupied all the interior area. The scene must be imagined. The ashes fence of the sacred forest forming a clear space, and on its center huge and imposing, the apple tree of Tarsus, and the statue of the goddess Pyrene, and before the goddess countenance, in a position which exalts even more the colossal size and the disturbing serpentine hair, the chosen ones with a fixed gaze and anxious heart awaiting her manifestation, the personal call the doors of the test of the cold fire, from above goddess Loa spills silver flashes of light over that square, suddenly coming from a near forest. A group of beautiful dancers interpose between the Chosen Ones and the goddess Pyrene, with the body naked of clothing and only with ornamental objects, bracelets and rings and hands and foots, necklaces and colored belts, large pendant rings, bands in the forehead which let the hair fall freely. They came jumping at the rhythm of the Syrinx, and never stopped in any moment, but they immediately started a frenetic dance. Previously they had practiced the ritual libation of an aphrodisiac nectar, and due to this their eyes are brilliant of desire and their gestures insinuating and less vicious. The hips and bellies never stop to move and can be seen at every moment. In a thousand different positions, firm breasts shacked as the flight of pigeons and wet mouths are longed open. All the dance is an irresistible temptation to the pleasure of the carnal love. Of course, the displayed eroticism by the dancers had by objective to sexually excite the chosen ones, turning in them the warm fire of the animal passion. Such dance was a vestige of the ancient culture of fire, and its culmination in the other periods would have ended in an unbridled orgy. But the reform of the cold fire had changed things and was now forbidden the ritual intercourse and was demanded instead that the chosen ones experienced the warm fire in the heart. If any chosen one lacked of forces to refuse the treat of the dancers, he could join them and enjoy never-imagined delight. But this would not have saved him of the death, because he would be murdered later for his weakness. The demanded behavior to the chosen ones required to remain immutable until the conclusion of the dance, maintaining the gaze fixed in the countenance of the goddess. Let's go back to the scene. The volume of the music went increasing, and now is a choir of flutes and drums accompanying the cadence movements. The dancers pant, the dance becomes febrile, and the erotic expression arrives to its apogee. Behind them, the smile of the goddess seems more ironic than ever. The chosen ones are concentrated in Pyrene, but they can't avoid to perceive how among the mists of a dream, to the dancing feminine beauties who intoxicated them with passion, who dragged them to an inevitably worn and suffocating abyss, is then when it becomes necessary the intervention of the goddess, when the chosen ones with a will enervated, request in their hearts the fulfillment of her promise. And is in that moment, when, at a signal of the hierophants, the music stopped abruptly, the dancers moved aside quickly, and the eyes of the goddess opened to see her chosen ones. As a whiplash, a horror shudder affected the chosen ones. The eyes' lips had disappeared, and the goddess contemplates them from the empty basins, with the form of the apple tree leaf, of her eyes, the test of the cold fire had begun. A hierophant, with thunderous voice, recites the ritual formula. O Pyrene, goddess of smiling death, whose abode is beyond the stars, 
comest near to the chosen ones who claim to thee. O Pyrene, thou once lovest thy chosen ones, with a warm fire, and then thou killest them. Rememberest thy promise, killest them first with a cold fire, lovest them later in thine abode. O Pyrene, bringest death to the warm life in us. Let us meet Calibur, the cold death of thy gaze, and let us live in the death of thy cold life. O Pyrene, thou once gavest us the seed of the cereal, to sow it in the grove of infamy, killest that created life, and puttest into the heart of thy chosen ones. The gelid scene of the stone that speaketh, O Pyrene, white goddess, show us the naked truth. By caliber in thy gaze we will not be men but gods, of a heart of frozen stone. Caliber, the chosen ones claim to thee. Caliber, thy chosen ones love thee. Caliber, death released. Caliber, seed of frozen stone. Caliber, naked truth remembered. All occurs quickly, as if time has stopped. The warm fire of the animal passion becomes terror again. But now is a terror with no limits what overcomes, a terror which is death itself, the death caliber of Pyrena, the needed death that precedes the naked truth. The chosen ones are paralyzed in terror and with the heart frozen of fright. They contemplate absorbed the countenance of Pyrene, while still resonates in the air the last caliber. Of the hierophant, the eyes of the goddess, seem now the doors of another world, a world of infinite blackness, a world of essential cold which is the death of the warm life. Can't be transversed to those doors without dying of terror. But if something overpass, such thing lives in the death. If something survives to the caliber death is due to such thing, consists also in the essence of the cold of the infinite blackness. The caliber death fascinates and attracts towards a knot, which will be the matrix of the own self. The chosen ones precipitate with no doubts into the infinite blackness of the eyes of the goddess. But before traversing the doors of the death they reach to perceive, in an instant of supreme terror, that the sacred forest has transfigured and overflows of manifested life of a life that remained occult behind the illusion of the vivid existence, of a life which in that moment obscenely gushed from all things as a demonic orgasmic of nature. And they saw also how the apple tree of Tarsus, animated by a dimensional intelligence, shuddered in a diabolic laugh, and they saw the head of the goddess also vitalized, shining from a blinding white light that accentuated even more the infinite blackness of her eyes. And when entering into the infinite blackness, when the heart was frozen and the warm life died, they saw at last the hair of Pyrene boiling in serpents. And they heard the serpents whistling the letters of the sacred alphabet, and pronouncing with them uninterruptedly the names of all the created things. Was finally discovered, although useless for them, the highest knowledge permitted to the animal men, the content of the symbol of the serpent. But such knowledge was not of the interest of the chosen ones any more. Something of it has traversed the barriers of the caliber death, something that is not scare of the death, and has found himself with the naked truth which is himself. Because the infinite blackness that offers the caliber death of goddess Pyrene, where every created light turns off inevitably, is capable to reflect that thing which is the uncreated spirit. And the reflect of the spirit in the infinite blackness of the caliber death is the naked truth of oneself. In front of the infinite blackness the created life died of terror, and the spirit finds itself. For this reason, if the chosen one, after the reunion, recovers the life, will be carrier of a signal of death that will leave his heart frozen forever. The soul could not avoid being subjugated by the seed of the stone, of oneself, which grows and develops on it and transmutes the chosen one into a hyperborean initiate. A man of stone, the resurrected chosen one, will have a heart of ice and will exhibit an absolute courage, will love the flesh woman, but she will not achieve to turn on his heart the warm fire of the animal passion. So he will seek in the woman of flesh, the one who be able to reveal, in her infinite blackness, the naked truth of himself. To her, the caliber woman, he will love with the cold fire of the Hyperborean race and the caliber woman will respond with the cold love of the caliber death of Pyrene. Ninth Day Amongst the chosen ones who faced the test of the cold fire, three results could have been expected. First, that some of them were not approved by the test, 
that is to say, that they would have not passed through the effective experience of the death, either due to the initial terror not giving them place to the animal passion, or because the warm fire didn't turn into terror, or just because the terror avoided to see the infinite blackness face to face, or by any other reason, in second term, that some of them had really died, and the last, that some of them would have been resuscitated. In the first case, the chosen ones would be executed in the next night of the test of the cold fire, for the Tartessian hierophants should not present to the test the one who will not really be disposed to die, because from the test no one could leave alive. If someone died or resuscitated, who was reborn would not be who died, but a son of the death, someone who would carry a signal of the death and the death in himself. That is to say, a son of the death would be forgotten in the death by himself. Who assisted to the test and not died, nor deserved to live, the executioner woman from Tartessos would hand down the stone axe over his neck. She would kill him the next night of the test, in the copse of willows consecrated to the moon goddess Loa, at the riverside of the Odiel. What happened to them? No one certainly knew what would be their luck. If they really died forever, if they would resuscitate in another world, if they would reincarnate again in future lives, or if their souls would transmigrate to other beings. But how much lasted the test of cold fire? Only the hierophants and those who would have failed, and who would die too, knew it. Only they conserved the consciousness of the past time, those who were reflected in the infinite blackness and found the naked truth of themselves, received also a reflect of the eternity. The contemplation of oneself. What is a reflect of the eternal spirit is experienced in a unique instant, not possible to be encompassed by the time of the creation. The chosen ones who fixed the caliber death of Pyrene could never respond to that question. The experience of the eternity is indescribable. For this reason, those from the second group, those who really died, were considered very loved by the goddess, because she had retained them for the eternity, and were realized the same funerals of the wise warriors to them. They would have the right to be incinerated with the swords in their hands, and an ash urn with his ashes would later be thrown to the Occidental Sea. In the third case, when exceptionally some chosen one returned from the death, was immediately incorporated to the Hierophant's College of Tartessos. The fact constituted a motive of celebration in all the realm due to the population, who didn't understand esoteric quibblings, infallibly intuited that a son of the death meant a reward for the race. Even if he triumphed by himself in the test of the cold fire, the new Hierophant would now be considered as the exponent of a collective merit, of a racial virtue. But the ancient Hierophants who knew the secret received with same joy the resurrected Chosen One. There signalized a man of stone, a returned from the death, someone who in the death loved with the caliber cold fire of Perrine and now keeps the remembrance of love, someone who felt beyond the love of life, the love of the caliber death, that is to say, the non-death of the caliber death, and now has immortalized as a son of the death. He was received in this form. O Pyrene's chosen one, thou wast mortal but the love of a goddess, hath freed thee from life but the will of the Creator one, earthen thou wast, by the will of the caliber death of stone thou art, O son of the death, courage hath thy name, in silence remainest, thou just actest, and keepest in thine heart of ice the memory of love, but rememberest nay just revivest thyself, cold immortal fire, man of stone. And really, the man of stone would not talk, perhaps for many years. He won't do it because he would be occupied experiencing himself, because since the reborn inside of his heart over a deep fiber was burning the flame of the cold fire, and that flame, when was perceived, spoke with the voice of himself, and its words always started with the name of the goddess, I am, I am, I. When hearing the voice of himself affirming I am, the man of stone really was, that is to say, he had absolute existence out of the illusion of the material entities beyond the life and the death. For this reason the man of stone would not talk, or would talk little from now on. He was very closer to the wisdom of the white Atlanteans, and that wisdom could not be explained to the asleep man, who loved life and feared the liberator death. Perhaps at the end, during the final battle, he or other men of stone would talk clearly to the asleep men to summon them for the liberation of the material chains, and to fight for the return towards the origin of the Hyperborean race. 
Meanwhile, the man of stone will only act, will listen in silent the voice of the cold ice and will act, and his act will express the highest spiritual courage. Whatever he could make, his action will be founded in the absolute support of himself. Beyond the good and the evil, and any judgment or punishment coming from the world of the deceit would not affect him. And no variance of the great deceit, neither the warm fire of the animal passion, would grade him back to the dream of the life. Wise and brave as a god, the man of stone will only fight if it is necessary, and wait in silence, the final battle. He will crave for the origin, and will affect him, the nostalgia for the love of the goddess. He will seek for his original couple in the caliber woman, and... If he find her, he will love her with the cold fire of himself, and she will embrace him with the uncreated light of his eternal spirit, which will be infinite blackness for the created soul. In this third case, with security, Pyrene's promise would be fulfilled. Tenth Day I guess that you will wait, suffered Dr. Signagel, an answer to the missing question. What would be the next action of the Gullums before the Tartessian might? which was developing out of their control and was frustrating all their plans. This was the answer, very simple, although it will have to be clarified. The Golems directed against Tartessos the myth of Perseus. Rigorously it can be affirmed that the myth of Perseus, as many other legends that lately have been grouped under the general denomination of Greek myths, are really an ancient Pelasgian myth. With some Greek stories of Heracles occurred the same, for example, with such, where the hero fights against the giant Giron to steal his red oxes and witch hides, the Pelasgians, under an expensive symbol, an ancient incursion of the primitive Argive against the triple population of the Iberians, or Vitrons, with a finality to conquest the secret of the animal breeding, which they unknown or have lost. And the proof is in that those Argive enemies of the Girons were considered relatives of them, since the own Heracles was great-grandson of Perseus, but Perseus was great-grandfather of Heracles only in the Argive myth. Really, the theme is taken from a Pelasgian myth much older, of Iberic Atlantean origin, which refers to the adventure undertaken by a typical Hyperborean spirit to reach immortality and wisdom. In the primordial theme, the spirit of Perseus was not Argive, but natal of the Iberian Atlanteans. That's to say, from a population much more occidental. Because of this, his feat was not carried out by a mere mortal king, as Polydectes, but from a goddess of the wisdom, Freya, the wife of Navutan. All the names and functions of the gods were changed then, and disrupted by the populations of the cultural pact, remaining the story of Perseus on its own form. The theme is simple, and when I will expose it, you will substantiate that it can't proceed from any other place than from the Hyperborean wisdom of the White Atlanteans. A Hyperborean representation of the origin, as I mentioned before, was Thule, the isotropic core from where proceeded the spirit. In a similar way, for the first descendants of the White Atlanteans, the origin was Pontus, which later was personified as god of the sea and was identified with the wave. Surely due from this origin came their ancestors. This Pontus married with Gaia, the earth, who gave birth, amongst others, to Porces and Ceto. Prototypical symbols of the hybrid beings, half-animals, half-gods, and an undercurrent esoteric, this image alludes to the spirit provided by Pontus, the origin, to the animal son of the earth. The brother Porces and Ceto married at their time, next to a set of hybrid archetypes that gave birth to three women who born already old the Grier or Grey Sisters, i.e. the Greys. Naturally, the Grier or Grey Sisters are none other than the Vrayas, the wise warriors in charge of the custody of the Stone Plough and the Stone of Venus. They are old because they must be wise, and who ignores the meaning of the lytic instruments will affirm later that within the three of them just had one eye and one teeth. Perseus is the idealization of the captive spirit that attempts the feat of the liberation from the material prison. His objective is to discover the secret of the death, obtain the highest wisdom and find the original couple. Navutan and Freya inspire them to consult the Vrayas, and they, with the Stone of Venus, signalize him the path to follow. He must go to a sacred ash forest and claim for the help of the gods to face with success the death is what Perseus made and has produced the encounter with Navutan. The god informs him that the wisdom is in possession of his wife, Freya, 
though it is not easy to reach her because the death interposes in the steps of simple mortals. To smooth away the journey to Freya, Nabutan reveals to Perseus the secret of the flight, and give him the sign of the half-moon, i.e., the symbol of the Hyperborean pontiff. The wisest bridge-builders of the White Atlanteans, according to the White Atlanteans, the Hyperborean pontiffs, knew how to tend an infinite bridge between the spirit and the origin, Pontus. The grade of Hyperborean pontiff was confirmed by Vaitz, the lord of Katagar, when he gave to those who reached the door of the abode of the liberator gods the cap and the helm. On the forehead of that helm the pontiffs impressed the sign of the half-moon. It is tradition that the pontiffs dressed in this way, disposed of the faculty of turning culturally invisible. Not by the effect of that attire, of course, but for the wisdom that implies its possession. Navutan teaches to Perseus the language of the birds, and guides him up to the abode of Vides, who invest in him Hyperborean Pontiff. In his journey towards Freya, Perseus will keep in the hand a crop of crane, containing sixteen stones. Each one of them is engraved of rune. When approaching to Freya, Navutan advises the hero to not stop to look at the countenance of the death what would produce his instant destruction and to focus in the mirror that the goddess of wisdom means after the death only in this way he could overcome the death perseus complies the indications with exactitude and contemplating himself in the mirror of freya he achieves to comprehend the death and becomes a man of immortal stone at his return from the death perseus employs the language of the birds to comprehend the serpent with the sign of the origin then he acquires the highest wisdom and finds his original couple Hitherto the most important of the original theme transmitted to the native populaces by the White Atlanteans, it is evident that great part of it, miraculously remembered thanks to the familiar mission, was incorporated by the Lords of Tarsus in the reform of the Cold Fire. The Lydians later would contribute in its degradation through the perfection of the ritual form, which consisted in the demential attempt to exhibit externally, embodied in the matter, signs that can only be metaphysical. Of course that those who would do more to pervert the sense of the theme of the Perseus spirit would be the priests of the cultural pact. And after that, the sense was reinstated by the cult of the cold fire, without procrastination, would be accompanied by the golems with all their resources, involved in a war that they considered of life or death for the plans of the white fraternity that they served. In times of the cultural fall, the Pelasgians, long before the golems started their sinister displacement to Europe, the original theme was constellated as myth. The names were changing and the meanings were distorted and inverted. In the Argive myth, Perseus, under the commission of the tyrant Sephiros, for whom he recklessly promised to bring the head of Medusa, he moves to Tartessos because the monster lives in a forest of the Iberian Peninsula. Such location is not meaningless due to Vides. The lord of Katagar was called Ides Aids or Hades by the priests. The lord of Tar, that's to say, of the Tartarus, or Hell, thereafter Tarsus, Tartessos, etc., passed to designate infernal places. To this location contributed also, in great form, the golems, when they achieved to observe the sculpture of goddess Pyrene, and identified it in all the ancient world as the Gorgon Medusa. To the Argive Perseus helps Hermes and Athena, and who is still possible to recognize Navutan and Freya, Navutan indeed was called Hermes, Mercury, Wothan, etc., as Hermes, according to the Greeks, was son of an Atlantean woman, daughter of Atlantean, and of a god Zeus. What is not far from the genealogy of the great chief of the white Atlanteans was inventor of the alphabet, of the lyre and the syrinx, which he exchanged to Phoebus, the sun, by the caduceus, which he used to shepherd. If it is considered that the caduceus is a rod with two coiled serpents, that the sun represents the creator god, and the herd the animal man, it is easy to distinguish in the figure of Hermes, to the one who has understood, through a language, the symbol of the serpent that the creator god uses to shepherd his servants. And Freya, on the other hand, was known as Athena, Minerva, Aphrodite, Freya, etc. Of her, Greeks said, she had born already armed. So she was goddess of war, of wisdom and love. Since his inverse journey to Tartessos, the Argive Perseus started to behave as a clear exponent of the cultural pact. He doesn't consult the Vrayas, but he steal them, the common eye. 
These were sent to Alsis, i.e., a sacred forest, where he finds the Malay nymphs, which are not more than personifications of the ashes. The nymphs give him a bag of crane leather, where he will place the head of Medusa and winged sandals to fly. Hades lent him the helm of darkness, or cap of invisibility, and Hermes gave him a sickle of half-moon, form to cut the head of the monster. But what most reveals this forgery engendered by the priests of the cultural pact is the prevention of the Argive Perseus, who fears to become a man of stone. Because in the Aegean myth, it is not a subsequent wisdom, but the own gaze of Medusa which turns in stone. The wisdom, on the contrary, is not beyond the death, but out, with Perseus definitely independent and unattainable for him. It not allows him to reflect himself in his naked truth, just puts an objective mirror where the hero will contemplate death without being trapped by it. That is all the help that Athena gives him, seeing her in front of the mirror. Perseus will cut the neck of a Medusa with a sickle and will give death to the death, not obtaining with this feat the immortality. Athena's mirror is a protector shield. The head of Medusa, obtained in the purposeless feet of the Argive Perseus, is placed by the goddess in the middle of the shield, permitting to understand clearly that in this era, after the triumph of the cultural pact, the wisdom is shielded by the death, not existing any possibility for mortals to reach it. Of course, this is only a threat of the priests of the cultural pact to discourage the quest for the liberation of the spirit. Finally, as the Argive Perseus not reached the immortality, neither the wisdom, will not be able to comprehend the serpent, and due to this, he was obeyed to kill it too. What he will do at the return of his feet, when he fights against a dragon and releases Andromeda, with whom he procreates a numerous offspring. Finally, taking the risk to be mercilessly executed by the Tartessians, the golems achieved to infiltrate in the sacred forest and spy the ritual of the cold fire. Since that unfortunate day, the golems knew that they had found a countenance and a home for Medusa. In few years, by means of their unceasing preach, and the countless priests that helped them in all the populations of the cultural pact, it was popularized with renewed vigor the Argive legend of Perseus, the sons of Phorcys and Cedo, the Graiae, the Gorgons, and the serpent that guards the tree of the golden apples, live in a sacred forest of Tartessos, region which in that period belonged to the kingdom of Tartessos. Logically, won't be seen clearly the strategic advantage, which could mean for the golems the refloat and the adaptation of a myth. If we start from the erroneous principle that then no one believed that it already happened, to think in this would demonstrate the ignorance about the ideology of the golems. With their revolutionary conception of the unity of God in the ritual sacrifice, the golems sustained the amazing concept that the myths had prophetic character. That is to say, that the myths, and every argument coming from heaven or the gods, are never accomplished at all, are never totally realized, that they had blind faith in that if the circumstances and characters were repeated, the myth as a prophecy would be developed again in the earth. In synthesis, they affirmed, The thing that has been, it is that which shall be, and what has been done is which shall be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Thereby, in the Gollum judgment, it was prophesied the myth of the Argive Perseus. This would be infallibly fulfilled. Thereupon, the execution sentence that existed over the house of Tarsus would be also accomplished. Of course, we must not be deceived in regard to the activity of a myth described unto its minor details. Although in the credulous minds of the population, Perseus and Medusa were imagined as real characters, the kings and military chiefs who ambitioned the loot of Tartessos had clear that it was treating about representations. In the centuries of the Tartessian expansion, those who desired to emulate Perseus, for example, they knew well that the head of Medusa, which they had to cut, meant to destroy Tartessos. Something similar occurred when in the wars of the nineteenth century was proposed to destroy the bear, alluding to the conquest of Russia, or to humiliate the lion, instead of submit England. However, the fact that a king was aware of the allegoric sense of the myth, not rest him the capacity to act, on the contrary, increases the possibilities of being really accomplished. Who intelligently adopts the role of a character of the mythical argument, interprets the description of the myth as some kind of plan or project to be realized, 
though is not the character who acts to realize the character of the myth, but the own myth that, unconsciously, motorizes the character to fulfill the argument, who aspires to be Perseus, will end cutting the head of Medusa, even if he believes to be able of self-control because he knows the allegoric meaning of the character. In this way, Dr. Signagel, the Golems directed against Tartessos the myth of Perseus, as a reaction to the economic and military expansion which was developing out of their control and frustrated all their plans. The answer is now clear. In the subsequent century would be many the Perseus who would attempt the feat to conquest Tartessos and almost in every case integrating the warrior expeditions, guiding invader kings or pirate chiefs, reached the golems, Hermes' caricature, that would signalize the abode of the Graye and the location of the unique eye, that's to say, the wise sword. Due to the golems would never forget their main objective, steal the stone of Venus. That would be their part of the booty. The rest, gold and silver, docks and prosperous cities, all would be for the winner Perseus for the hero of the cultural pact, was not much what they requested, and would not be few who would answer to the intriguing proposals. However, even by this offensive which was founded in the universal action of the myth, and that obeyed the Tartessians to live in permanent war state, the kingdom defended itself with success until the third century, period, in which their might started to decline before other rising potencies, Carthage, Greece, and Rome, would write the end of the history. The Greeks of the pre-classic period were very receptive to the strategy of the Golems, and that guided them to undertake many conquest expeditions against the Tartessians. From their thriving colonies in Sicily, Italy, Gaul, and finally in the own Spain, they would have exterminated Tartessos if they had not had to watch their back from the rising power of Rome. The Romans, instead, were always friendly with the Tartessians, and scarcely permeable to the Golem influence. That must not surprise if it is remembered that through the veins of the Roman royalty circulated the blood of the Pelasgians, of Etruria, direct relatives of the Tartessians. Destiny would not reserve then, neither Greeks nor Romans, the feat of destroying Tartessos. Would be a man of Carthage, a Phoenician, a Red or Punic, the new Perseus, who would wield the iron sickle, inverted and perverted symbol of the half-moon, and he would cut the head of Medusa, giving fulfillment in this way to the prophecy of the Golems. In the twelfth century BC, when the Philistines occupied and looted it, starts the decay of Sidon, the most important Phoenician city, begins in this way the might of Tyre, and would not stop growing until Nebuchadnezzar, who after a siege of thirteen years dilapidated it definitely in 574 BC. But in that time, Tyre has been expanded through all the ancient world and possesses colonies, as Gadis, in the south of Spain, in the Sicilian coasts, in the Balearic Islands, in Sardinia, and since 814 BC, in the coasts of Africa, where was founded the rich and prosperous city of Carthage, with the commercial ruin of Tyre becomes preponderant, since the 6th century, the Carthaginian colony which has the greatest fleet of the Occidental Mediterranean. Carthage reached in history the joyless celebrity to have constituted an immoral society, composed by merchants whose only ambition was the richness which imposed their commerce with the protection of a mercenary army. Only a few warlords indeed, there were Carthaginians. The course of the army was integrated by men without homeland and law, that's to say, by soldiers whose homeland was of who paid more and whose law depended of the agreed payment. Although what most impressed always to the observers, in an analogic way, to the repugnance that caused in the Europeans in the 16th century, was to know, was to know the sanguinary Aztec cult of the palpitating hearts, was the cult of Moloch a deity for whom they had to offer permanent human sacrifices to appease his inextinguishable thirst of lives. In Tyre, the Phoenicians worshipped very similar gods to the other populations of Mesopotamia or Asia Minor. They gave cult to the goddess Astarte, or Tanit, who for the Assyrian Babylonian was Ishtar, or Inanna, or Nana, for the Greeks Lo, for the Egyptians Isis, and in other places was called Ashataroth, Cybele, Athena, Anatha, Hathar, etc., and also worshipped Adon, who is equivalent to the Phrygian Adonis. 
and adored in Melkart, who corresponded to Argive Heracles and offered sacrifices to Ba-Zabul, Bal-Sedon, Bal-Zaduk, Bal II, Bal-Tars, Bal-Ya, etc. All names of the Creator God who was represented as the Sun, as the planet Jupiter, or as any other force of the nature, was in the 6th century BC, when the king Ithobal, the first priest of Astarte, married his daughter Jezebel with King Ahab of Israel. That the Golems infiltrated in Tyre and tried to unify the cults in the sacrifice to the God One Two. Such attempt would not give great results until the next century, after the conquest of the Assyrian great king Sargon II over Canaan, and over the Golems moved to Carthage to officiate as priests of the cult of Moloch. It must be warned that the Carthaginian was the first population where the Golems established, a part of the European populations that were assigned to them by the white fraternity, to comply with their mission of unifying the cults, but would be the first and last due to, according to what they declared, their interest was only to work in the European cults. If they remained in Carthage, that was purely and exclusively to the Tartessian heresy, the necessity to orient Perseus to the population to cut the head of Medusa and fulfill their prophecies, was in this manner how, impulsed by the sinister design of the Golems, the cult of Moloch would reach to dominate by the terror to all the other powers of the government of Carthage. The king, the nobility, the state advisers, the military chiefs, all would end subjected to Moloch and his Golem priests. Finally, all the families of Carthage were obeyed to offer their firstborn child to be sacrificed in the mouth of Moloch, that's to say, to be thrown in the mouth of a metal idol that guided to an incandescent oven, and there would end their days, also the prisoners, the slaves, the accused of some crime, the consecrated virgins, or anyone that the golems wanted to eliminate. But the god was never satisfied. He demanded more, and more living proofs of the population faith in the ritual sacrifice. His law claimed a fee of blood hardly available. Peradventure Moloch was expecting a far greater sacrifice. Perchance he would be calm with the offering of the whole lineage that insulted him, with his extermination in his name of the lineage of the lords of Tarsus. With the outbreak of the Punic Wars in 264 BC, the Golems believed that the time to fulfill their prophecies had reached. And not only they believed it, but also the members of the White Fraternity who sent from Chang Shambhala two mysterious personages called Bera and Bersha. There were two priests of superior grade to whom they gave the title of Immortals, two priests who as in ancient ages belonged to the same race of the Golems. The White Fraternity had instructed them the mission to lead their plans. There were two supreme golems, due to they surpassed what their brothers of race could have demonstrated in regard to the cruelty and diabolic arts. In other powers, for example, they had the capacity to travel through time, dominion that my family proved bitterly every time when the same actors appeared in subsequent different centuries with the finality to provoke their destruction. In that occasion, Burra and Bersha placed in front to the golems of Carthage to lead personally the attack to Tartessos, because, apart from the race, they were all united by the same hate against the house of Tarsus. The general Hamlikar Barca would be the new Perseus, the instrument that the myth employed to be developed again in the earth, with the objective to make that this soldier demonstrate before the god one that he was ready to realize the feat, was impulsed to slay forty thousand men of his mercenary army who were previously incited to the rebellion when they suppressed their soldier payment. From the defile of the axe, a river of blood ended in this way in the jaws of Moloch, for satisfaction of the golems, and as clear sign that the prophecy could be accomplished. Then the government of Carthage, following the instructions of the golem priests, commissioned in 237 BC to Halmakar Barca the conquest of Spain. This invasion, the last that Tartessos would resist, was the theme of familiar saga of oral legends called The Attack of the Twenty-Two Golems. Tells the saga that in the year 229, by means of a skillfully and unexpected troops withdrawal, the general Barca achieved to surprise Tartessos asleep, as the Argive Perseus with Medusa, and subjects it under blood and fire. However, while the soldiers were realized to the carnage and the looting, other facts are happening. Accompanying the Carthagian army have reached to Tartessos twenty-two golems, that's to say, twenty-two golem priests guided by Bera and Bersha. The myth of the Argivian Perseus have become real. 
The prophecy is being accomplished in that moment, and it is necessary to act with quick precision. While the twenty golems occupy the sacred forest and effectuate the convenient rituals to consecrate items to the god one, the Moloch, and neutralize the magic influence of Pyrene, the immortals Bera and Bersha will go and seek the wise sword. The golems are applied to their work and prompt. They were desecrating the lamp of Pyrene, gathered beside the apple tree of Tarsus in the sculpture of the goddess. What occurs next obeys that each one commits an evaluation error about the capacity and the reaction of the adversary. The golems erred, due to they not considered the mystical and heroic madness that the Tartessian Hierophants disposed for being descendants of the lords of Tarsus, and the Hierophants underestimated the powers and the determination of the golems, perhaps for the unknown of the existence of the immortals as Bera and Bersha. The error of the golems was to suppose that the Hierophants, unaware as the sentinels of Tartessos, would accept with resignation the loss of the sanctuary of the sacred forest, or that, at most, would offer an armed resistance, case in which they would act in their defense a troop that escorted them. The reality, very different, was that the Hierophants had considered many years ago the possibility that the sacred forest could fall in power of the enemy, and they had already taken a decision for it. They would never permit it, the fall of the sacred forest would imply, necessarily, its destruction. For this reason, when the fire, which advanced through the perimeter of the forest, surrounded and embraced the center of the forest, the twenty golems and the guard couldn't do anything to avoid the horrible death. The carbonized skeletons showed later that everybody had taken refuge under the apple tree of Tarsus, and they finally were burnt and consumed, as it and the rest of the trees of the forest. All had been incinerated in such fire that was carefully planned for years and prepared through a studied distribution of firewood in different parts of the area. When entering to the sacred forest on conquest train, the golems would not win an area, but they would fall in a mortal trap. Of course, they would have never supposed that the Tartessian Hierophants would sacrifice their sacred forest before to see it occupied by the enemy, and this reaction would be taken as a lesson for the golems that, hereafter, would continue fighting against the descendants of the Pact of Blood. And the underestimation of the Hierophants committed when evaluating the real power of the golems was near to produce the definitive loss of the Wise Sword. If that not occurred, the merit can only be attributed to the incredible courage of the Vrayas and to a loyalty to the pact of blood which was beyond the death. The case was that some twenty kilometers from Tartessos, over the hillside of the hill Candelaria, was located the secret entrance to a cave that had been conditioned in remote times by the White Atlanteans, was one of the works that had to be conserved, according to the compromise of the pact of blood. Naturally, after the cultural defeat of the Iberians, such compromise was forgotten, and the cave, occult and solitary, remained abandoned for thousands of years. However, the purifiers, effects of the family test that ended with the reform of the cold fire, caused its rediscovery. Even if not all, neither in any moment could enter through it. The motive was that the secret entrance was signalized with the runes of Nabutan and only the pure blood. Those who were capable to hearken the language of the birds achieved to find it. Who not reunited those requirements could not discover it, even being in front of it while that cave had been chosen by the actual Vrayas to guard the wise sword. A corridor of Tartessian warriors formed to allow the departure of the Vrayas from Tartessos, and to save, in the last moment, the valuable heritage of the White Atlanteans. Many died to realize this heroic rescue, many that today are immortalized for their courage, awaiting in Katagar the moment to return to their battle stations when the final battle take place over the earth. Due to their loyal service, the Vrayas, who in such time were the queen of Tartessos and two princesses, could reach to the secret entrance of the cave. In reality, they were followed such closer by Bera and Bersha that only one princess, carrying the wise sword, achieved to cross the threshold, while the other two remained behind to stop them. And was in this moment when the terrible power of the immortal golems was seen because even when the Vrayas fought them with their formidable stone axes, they did not need to employ any arm to dominate them, except for their demonic arts. The power of the illusion in which they were masters was enough to immobilize and take possession of them. However, the wise sword was already safe in the secret cavern due to the golems, who only possessed soul but lacked of spirit, would result impossible to comprehend the runes of Nabutan.
The familiar saga ends in this part of the history narrating the spectacle observed by the Tartessian Hierophants when they went to the secret cave, after the burning of the sacred forest, lying in the floor of the base of the Candelaria Hill, not so far from the secret entrance that they didn't achieve to find, were the corpses of the Queen of Tartessos and the Princess horribly mutilated. From such image resulted evident that they preferred to die with honor rather than betray the familiar mission in the Pact of Blood. They had resisted in such way, first the magical pressure of the enchantment of the golems, with will of steel, and then the physical torture, the test of the pain. Thereby, surely, after realizing the failure of their plans and fearing a struggle with the men of stone, the immortals rushed to kill them and go to the White Island, not without leaving behind them an, a univocal sign of their infernal presence. Before leaving, scalped the totality of the hair, the two dyed braids with grout of burnt lime that the Vrayas, as all the initiates consecrated to Loa, worn down their ankles, and with the blood that dripped from their naked skulls, they wrote in the Phoenician language over a rock something like, The punishment for those who offend Yah will come from the wild boar, undoubtedly one of his damn prophecies. Eleventh Day That's how, estimated Dr. Signagel, the kingdom of Tartessos disappeared forever. The general Barca represented again the myth of the Argive Perseus, cutting the head of Medusa, and also one of the Heracles Mercath, defeating the triple population of the Girons. Nevertheless, even though from Tartessos not remained stone over stone, the sacred forest was reduced to ashes, and the sculpture of Pyrene was demolished by order of Halmakar, Barca. The Golem's prophecy was not fulfilled because the Stone of Venus, the unique Eye of the Vrayas, couldn't be stolen by Bera and Bersha. That demonstrates that even though it is true that the mystical arguments can be developed many times over the earth, their repetition is not always identical, and even they can produce more than one surprise for who has propitiated them. In this opportunity not only failed the prophecy when the wise sword remained saved, but the extermination sentence that was over the house of Tarsus neither could be accomplished. In the Argive myth, when Perseus nailed the sickle on Medusa's neck, from the wound born two extraordinary beings, Chryseor and Pegasus. According to the myth, only Poseidon, the king of the Atlantis and god of the Occidental Sea, dared to love Medusa, with whom beget two sons, Chryseor and Pegasus, who had borne from the wound infringed by Perseus, Chryseor would be a giant destined to marry Caliber, a daughter of Oceanus, from whose union would born the triple giant Giron. I believe, Dr. Signagel, that the last manifestation of the myth, concretized in the tragedy of Tartessos, would determine its repetition until its minor details, although not complying happily with the prophecy of the Golems. I believe, for example, that effectively from the dissected neck of Medusa, from the ruin of Tartessos, born Chryseor, the giant son of Poseidon, he was, undoubtedly, Leto de Tarsus, who, as will be seen later, wedded with a daughter of the sea, a princess of America. The other of the Occidental Sea, Chryseor, would born armed with a golden sword, just as Leto de Tarsus, who would depart to America carrying the wise sword of the Iberian kings. And I also believe that Pegasus is my son, Noyo, who is born with wings to fly up to the abodes of the liberator gods, and he has the power to open the founts with his strikes. Just that in his case, it treats about the founts of the wisdom. The survivors of the House of Tarsus, curiously eighteen, were gathered near to the secret cave, in a narrow terrace, naturally protected with huge rocks, which allowed certain defense and whence could be dominated the hillside of the mountain range. The saga tells me that one moment before, the men of stone, the only ones who knew how to enter, had sustained a council in the secret cave. Before the disaster that was coming against the house of Tarsus, they swore to dedicate all the efforts to give fulfillment to the familiar mission and save the wise sword. It was necessary for the lineage to continue existing at any cost, and concerning to the wise sword, they decided that after the death of the last Rayas would remain perpetually deposited in the secret cave at least until the day when other man of stone offspring of the house of tarsus would be able to see in it the lytic sign of katagar and to know that they should go until the occasion the wise sword would not see the light of day 
When they left, they communicated these determinations to their relatives and required news about the realm. But the news that reached to the improvised refuge was strange and contradictories. It should be discarded a prompt help of the Romans due to the Golems had rebelled against them all, the populations of the Gaul, cutting off the path to Spain. The rescue of Tartessos demanded now a very numerous expedition, which would leave unprotected the own Rome. On the other hand, in Tartessos, the Carthaginian victory had been overwhelming. All Tartessos was in power of the general Barca, what completed the total occupation of the south of Spain. To the lords of Tarsus only remained their lives and a battalion of loyal and brave royal guards. However, something strange and contradictory happened. Hamilcar Barca, it is true, annihilated Tartessos down to convert it in debris. In this action both he and the mercenary army acted moved by a homicidal fury which surpassed every reasoning by an indomitable force that possessed them and did not abandon them until they destroyed completely the already occupied city. It was as if the hate experimented for centuries by the golems against the house of Tarsus would have been accumulated in some obscure recipient, perhaps in the myth of Perseus, to release it altogether in the Carthaginian soul. Nevertheless, after consummated the irrational destruction, the general Barca and the military chiefs who accompanied, he recovered abruptly their lucidity. Not being apart from this phenomenon, the death of the twenty golems and the departure of the Bera and Bersha. Momentarily something was interrupted, something that impulsed General Barca to desire the annihilation of the House of Tarsus, and there were no golems and Tartessos any more to restart it. Thereby, free for the moment of destructive passion of the Argive Perseus, Halmikar Barca worked with the reasonableness of an authentic Carthaginian, i.e., he thought in his personal interests. For Halmikar Barca, the enemy was not only in Rome, there in any case was the enemy of Carthage, but in Carthage were also the enemies of Halmikar Barca, who envied his career of successful general and distrusted of his power. Those who had sent him eight years before to conquer such an hospitable country, and had no intentions to make him return. But Halmakar Barca would pay them with the same coin. He would demonstrate to the government of Carthage the same indifference, and would usufruct in his family and own advantage the immense conquered territory. Spain would be the particular Barca's estate. But for it would be necessary to count with the indispensable collaboration of the native population, who had ruled until that moment the country and knew all the mechanisms of its operation. And such bellicose countries, who were free for centuries, would not easily submit to the slavery. This was clearly adverted by the Barcas, at least that their own kings and lords would convince them that it was better to not resist the occupation. The solution would not be impossible, due to, according to the particular philosophy of the Carthaginians, would only need to be destroyed the one who could not be bought. The strange and contradictory news reached then to the refuge of the lords of Tarsus. Halmikar Barca would offer them to save their lives if they renounced to every right over Tartessos and accepted to enter at his service to govern the country. On the contrary case, would be exterminated, as the Golems claimed. With so much pain, but without possible alternatives, the lords of Tarsus had to accept such dishonorable offer. They made it for a superior interest, for the familiar mission and the wise sword. Once arranged the surrender, Tarsus passed to serve the Barcas, and they were occupied in to pacify Tartessos and reorganize the agricultural and industrial production. Due to the demonstrated good disposition, they were rewarded with a farm located very near from the emplacement of the disappeared Tartessos, where would live since then the Tarsus family, except for the members that performed functions in the cities or accompanied the Barcas in the inspection journeys. While the Carthaginian occupation lasted, nonetheless, the protection, assured by the Barcas, the tranquility was scarce due to the Golems, who were constantly spying, who explored inch by inch seeking for the wise sword, and had added now the death of twenty of them to the list of pending charges to pay off by the House of Tarsus. At the death of Halmakar Barca in 228 BC, he succeeded in his son, Hasdrubal Barca. But after his assassination in 2020 BC, Hannibal Barca assumes the command of the Carthaginian army. The nephew of Halmakar invaded the Greek colony of Sagunt in the year 219 BC, which was under the protection of Rome and started with this action the Second Punic War.
that would end in 201 BC with the unconditional capitulation of Carthage. Thirty years after the destruction of Tartessos, Spain was free forever from the Carthaginian invader. But it was too late for Tartessos. The new Roman occupant would not abandon the peninsula until the dismemberment of his own empire 700 years later. With the Romans, the House of Tarsus had a relatively good time because it was considered an allied nobility and their governed functions of the region were restored. Now a Roman province subjected to the law of the Republic and to the authority of the proconsul or praetor. The region of the ancient Tartessos between the rivers Tinto and Odiel remained included in the province of Batica. Dominated with this name for the river Betis, today Guadalquivir, which was extended up to the river Anas, today Guadiana, frontier of Lusitania. Romans gave to the Tartessians the name Turdetani. In a few decades, the Turdetani was Romanized, the use of Latin was popularized, and great rural states were constructed, properties of the governors of each province, magistrates or army chiefs. In the first century BC, the House of Tarsus had been related with the Roman nobility and was quite powerful in the Batica province, a province that counted with 175 cities, many of them rich and forceful as Cordova, Cadiz, Seville, Malaga, over the base of the estate given by the Carthaginian and the restitutions made by the Romans. The lords of Tarsus developed a rustic Roman village, building a lordly residence and widening it with the acquisition of huge extensions of fields for cultivation, cereals, olive, grapevine, integrated the main production, apart from some minerals that were still exploited in the mountain range of Catochar. It must be clarified that the Roman, Catatra, named it as the village of Turdus, while the Roman Empire governed, although I will continue mentioning Lords of Tarsus to maintain the continuity of the narration. As all the landowners' families, Roman Hispanic, possessed a dwelling in the city, where they remained most part of the year. However, if they could, they always preferred to retire to the campestrial land, because their major interest was to be near to the secret cave. The Golems had no chance to influence over the Roman population, and their power was conserved intact only in Lusitania, in some regions of the Gaul, in Britain and Hibernia. After the campaigns of Julius Caesar, this power seemed to decrease completely, and for some time was believed that the threat was definitely conjured. This, as was seen, was an error of appreciation, a new underestimation with respect to the capacity of the golems to carry out their plans. In regard to the cult of the cold fire, the lords of Tarsus had no problems to reimplant it, because Romans were notably tolerable in religious matters. And also, they also worshipped their fire, since remote ages— in the villages of Tarsus they constructed a lorarium dedicated to Vesta, the Roman goddess of fire and home. There, before the statue of the goddess Vesta Pyrene, burned the perennial lamp of the home, the flamma lar, that should never be off. Even being now a private cult, the house of Tarsus had not lost their mystical and thermaturge fame, and soon their village became another place of pilgrimage for the seekers of the spirit. Without reaching, naturally, the proportions of the age of Tartessos, the family gave to Rome good functionaries and soldiers, apart from the contribution of food and mineral production, but also provided Rome, Haruxpus, augurs, and vestals. Twelfth Day The Emperor Constantine, with the Edict of Milan of 313, legalizes Christianity and grants rights equivalent to the official pagan cults. At the end of the 4th century, in the year 381, and thanks to the emperor, Theodosius I, declares Christianity the official religion of the estate, and pagan cults were forbidden. In 386, it's ordained through an imperial decree, the closure of all pagan temples, and in 392, by imperial law, the pagan cult is considered and punished as crime of less majesty, that's to say, sanctioned with death sentence. These actions not affected to the lords of Tarsus because years before they had already adopted Christianity as familiar religion. The cult of Jesus Christ proceeded from Canaan, the homelands of the Golems, and such origin resulted, as is logic, suspicious since the beginning, but also was the pretended cultural fundament of the tragedy of Jesus. The registered prophecies in the set of the canonical books of the Hebrews, who claimed to be the chosen people of the Creator God, Nothing of this convinced to the lords of Tarsus, and on the contrary, as more they watched the new oriental cult, 
more they persuaded themselves that behind it was hidden a colossal, contrived conspiracy of the white fraternity. How was then that they adopted Christianity as a familiar religion? Because about the provenance of the cult and the filiation of their worshippers, an unquestionable fact existed, that the story narrated by the Gospels was real in part. This could be assured by the Lord of Tarsus without any genre of doubts, because they knew it since thousands of years ago, much before that Jesus came to Palestine, because that was undoubtedly a new version of Nabutan's history. To know history in all its purity would be necessary to go back thousands of years to the past, to the age of the white Atlanteans, father of all the white populations of the Pact of Blood. They assured to be guided by Nabutan, the great white chief who had discovered the secret of the spiritual incarceration, and had revealed them the manner in which the spirit could abandon the matter, and be free of eternal beyond the stars, i.e., beyond the abodes of the gods and the potencies of the matter. According to the narrations of the white Atlanteans, Nabutan was a god who existed, free and eternal as all the Hyperborean spirits, beyond the stars, the unknowable god from whom nothing can be affirmed, from here far from the origin. Nabutan and other gods were angry because a part of the race of the spirit was trapped in the universe of the matter. The anger was not just directed to the potencies of matter who retained the spirits, but also against the weak spirits, against those who lacked gracefulness will to break the illusion of the great deceit and be free by himself. In the earth the spirit had been incarcerated to the animal man, to use its volitional force to accelerate the evolution of his psychic sphere, and such ferris was the incarceration, such submerged was the spirit in the anemic nature of the animal man, that had forgotten the origin and he believed to be a product of the nature and the potencies of the matter, a creation of the gods. In other cases, since the spirit remained in the earth, the liberator gods, their brother spirits, came to their rescue, and many were liberated, and they returned with them. For this cause terrible battles were fought against the potencies of the matter. Finally, for example, had crossed the origin, and had presented before the Atlantean men the great chief of all the prisoner Hyperborean race, the lord of the beauty of the uncreated forms, the lord of absolute courage, the lord of the uncreated light, the envoy of the unknowable god to liberate the spirit, that's to say, the Christos of the uncreated light, Christos light, Lucy Bell, Lucy Fur, or Christos Lucifer. But the manifestation of Christos Lucifer and the Atlantis caused the destruction of the materialist civilization. The battle of the Atlantis ended with the submergence of the continent, much later of his return to the origin. In these circumstances, in front of the imminent catastrophe of the Atlantis was developed the history of Nabutan. The yellow men, the red men, the black men all would perish in a cataclysm worse than which is looming in the Atlantis. The one that worries the liberator gods is the spiritual cataclysm, the abyss in which will be submerged even those who survive to the submergence of the Atlantis, and that result seems to be unavoidable due to the insistence and tenacity tin which the white fraternity maintain the spiritual incarceration but mainly due to the impossibility demonstrated by the spirit to avoid the illusion and to wake up from the great deceit. Such races, strategically confused, will continue following, blindly, the Atlantean priests, who will guide them directly to their spiritual decadence. The white race is the only, in this moment, that disposes of an opportunity of liberation, possibility that the gods will not ignore. But the white men are too asleep, with the spirit highly submerged in the illusion of the matter extremely projected in the exterior world, will not be able to comprehend the interior revelation of the spirit, will not be able to be free by themselves. It is necessary an exterior revelation of the spirit suitable for the white race to show the white man from outside a liberation path capable to guide him to the Hyperborean wisdom. For it, Nabutan descends to hell. Nabutan, God free and eternal, accepts to descend to hell, come to the world of matter, and to born as a white man and as a white man realizes the feat to set free his chained spirit by himself, he will demonstrate in this way to men, with the example of his will, the path to follow, the orientation towards the origin. In sum, the history that the white Atlanteans transmitted in form of myth to the native populations is the next. In the Atlantis lived a very holy white virgin, consecrated to the unknowable God's service and completely committed to the contemplation of the uncreated light.
Afflicted by the terrible famine that her people suffered, such virgin asked for help to the unknowable, and this supreme god, whose will is the grace, teaches her a path towards the planet Venus. Once there, the virgin received from the envoy of the unknowable many exemplar of the plant of the wheat, which she could use to satiate the material hunger of man, a birch rod that would be useful to measure the white treason, and the seed of a child of stone, who would one day be man, he would place at the head of the white race, and would satiate their spiritual hunger. When returning from Venus, the white virgin, who never had a carnal contact with any man, was pregnant, of Navutan. The liberator gods had already announced that she would be mother and would give birth to a child whose spiritual wisdom would liberate the white race from the material slavery. A serpent tried to avoid the virgin, to comply with her commitment, but she kills it, crushing its head with her right foot. Past the pregnancy period, the virgin gives birth to Navutan and educates him as a constructor warrior, counting with the help of the guardians of the lytic wisdom. In the Atlantis existed a footpath that guided to a spellbound garden, which was constructed by the god of the illusion. There, an ancient pomegranate tree grew, new as the tree of life and also as the tree of terror, which roots were extended through all the earth and which branches were elevated up to the celestial abodes of the god of the illusion. Near to that bewitched pomegranate existed an apple tree, as ancient as such, which was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or tree of the death. Was a common belief amongst the Atlanteans that men, in a beginning, were immortal. The cause that men had to die was because of the great ancestors had eaten from the fruit of that tree, and the death was transmitted to their offspring as a disease. In reality, the blood of the tree, its damned salvia, was mixed with the immortal blood of the original man, and it regulated, from the interior of man, the life and death, and no one knew the remedy for that disease. Navutan, who didn't have a human father, was born immortal, as the original man, but his immortality was, for the same reason, essential, own of his special spiritual nature. In consequence, his immortality was incommunicable to the rest of the white men. It was not useful for them to recover their lost immortality. For this reason, Navutan, with the support of his divine mother, the virgin Amma, decided to become mortal and discover the secret of immortality for mankind. Since the great ancestors ate the fruit of the tree of death, no one dared to get closer to him due to the fear of the death. But Navutan was immortal as the great ancestors, and he achieved, as them, to get closer without problems. Once next to the tree, Navutan cut and ate from the forbidden fruit, remaining hereupon bewitched by the illusion of life. Now was only missing from him to discover the secret of the death without dying, because if he died in the attempt, he would never be able to communicate the wisdom to the white men. Thereby Navutan crucified himself in the tree of terror to defeat the death, hanging nine nights from its trunk. Nevertheless, as time passed by, the death was getting closer, and Navutan did not achieve to comprehend its secret. Finally, once agonizing, the great white chief closed his unique eye that he maintained fixed in the illusion of the world, and looked to the depths of himself, in a desperate and last reaction to save the life that was turning off without remedy. And in the summit of himself, in the middle of the infinite blackness of the insinuated death, he saw emerging a resplendent figure, a being that was pure gracefulness, was Freya, the joy of the spirit. His divine wife of the origin came to his rescue. When Navutan opens his eyes again, Freya gets out from it, and internates in the world of the great deceit. She goes in search for the secret of the death to save her agonizing husband. However, she didn't achieve it, and times end relentlessly. Finally, without despair, Freya goes to the Hyperborea to ask the liberator gods. They advise her to seek for a giant, Bicephalus who lives in a world situated under the roots of the Tree of Terror, and who performs the office of Sentinel. To that giant she must steal the Kalachakra key, because on it the traitor gods have engraved the secret of the death. The myth of the White Atlanteans is here very complex, and it is only convenient to mention that Freya, transformed in a raven, descends to the world of the giant Bicephalus and steals him the Kalachakra key. But to get it, she had to become assassin and whore. Freya, in fact, breaks with the strike of her axe the Kalachakra key. But the pin, when it fell, was transformed in seven giants, with seven heads each one, who sleep to let the root races live for them. Thereupon, and without alternatives, because she is urged by time, Freya dresses with the veil of the death that such giants maintain attached with a lasso in each neck. 
then she awakes them successfully and becomes their lovers, but unrelentingly she goes beheading them in the culmination of the orgasm, and the head of the giants, skewered in a rope or a sutratma, forms the necklace of Freya Caliber, in which every skull represents a sign of the sacred alphabet of the white race. Finally the veil of the death remains loose, and Freya, transformed in raven again, returns swiftly to Navutan. But it is too late. In the same moment when she arrived, Navutan exhales his last sigh, and his eye is being closed for ever. Freya understands that it will be impossible to reveal Navutan the secret of the death because he has just died, and he won't be able to read the Kalachakar key. And that's how, without losing an instant, Freya takes the decision that she will save Navutan and the white race. She became a patriarch and enters again in Navutan. The Kalachakar key must remain outside because only she can exist in the depths of himself. Freya must reveal to Navutan the secret of the death, not only to achieve his resurrection, but also to make her husband communicate it to men. In other way, his immolation would be in vain. But how expose to Navutan the secret of the death without the Kalachakar key? Without showing him that instrument of the spiritual incarceration for his comprehension? And Freya decides, in that moment, as a partridge, she will dance the secret of life and death. She will express with the dance the highest wisdom that would be possible to comprehend by the mortal men from outside of themselves. And Freya, dancing in the depths of himself, reveals to Navutan the secret coming from outside himself. And Navutan understands it, and the spell caused by the fruit of the tree of life and death was cut, and he resuscitates again as an immortal. And when he descends from his crucifixion tree, he realizes that his body is transmuted and is of now pure stone, and that he can comprehend and express the language of the birds. So Navutan teaches the white Atlanteans the thirteen plus three vrunes through the language of the birds, and guides them to understand the sign of the origin. With it they will obtain the highest wisdom, they will be immortal while the spirit remains chained to the animal man, and they will conquer eternity when they win the battle against the potencies of matter and be free again in the origin. I've synthesized hitherto, Dr. Signagel, the history of Navutan. According to the mythical narration of the White Atlanteans, it is easy to advert that it had many common points with the Gospel's history of Jesus Christ. Both histories treats about a God-made man. Both gods born from a virgin, both died by voluntary crucifixion, both resuscitate, both leave the testament of their wisdom, both form disciples to whom they reveal the good new that they shall communicate to their similars, both affirm that the kingdom is not from this world, etc. But it is evident that exists also fundamental differences between both doctrines. Perhaps the most noticeable are the following. Navutan comes to liberate the spirit of man of his prison in the world of the Creator God. The spirit is uncreated, that's to say, not created by the Creator God, and hence, nothing that happens here can essentially smirch it, and much less affect it ethically. The spirit is innocent and pure of the eternity of the origin. For this reason, Navutan affirms that the Hyperborean spirit belongs to a warrior race, and can manifest an essential hostility to the world of the Creator God, only can rebel itself from the material order, can only doubt about the reality of the world that constitutes the great deceit can only refuse as false or enemy to all who is not product of himself, that is, the spirit, and can only encourage just one purpose with wisdom, to abandon the world of the Creator God, where is enslaved, and return to the world of the unknowable, where will be God again. Adversely, Jesus Christ comes to save the soul of men from the sin, from the disobedience to the law of the Creator God. The soul is created by the Creator God and has to obey blindly the law of the Father. All what happens here affect ethically to the soul and can increase its sin quota. The soul is not innocent, neither pure, because men are here in this world as a punishment of the original sin, committed by the fathers of the mankind, and inherited, thence, the original sin. For this reason Jesus Christ affirms that soul of man, the most perfect creature of the Creator God, must only manifest an essential love attitude to the world of the Creator God must only accept with resignation his place in the material order, must only believe in the reality of the world, must only accept as real and friendly what proves to come in the name of the Creator God, and must only encourage a unique objective with wisdom. To stay in the world of the Creator God as a lamb and be shepherded by Jesus Christ or the priests who represent him, to be a god or a lamb in that consists, Dr. Signigal.
as I anticipated with the imperial law of the year 392 threatened to consider crime of injured majesty, the practice of the pagan cults. Although the House of Tarsus had accepted Christianity long time ago as their familiar religion, Logically, the lords of Tarsus saw clearly the march of such time, and their unique priority, since the destruction of Tartessos, was to give accomplishment to the familiar mission and preserve the wise sword. This familiar priority determined a strategy for the survival of the lineage, survival that could be strongly threatened by new persecution. The decadence of Rome that Polybius foresaw in the 2nd century BC had become real. The empire, stocked in all its frontiers by the invader populations, had incorporated entire regiments of mercenaries and has given the command to the barbarian armies. The agriculture of the small agriculturalists was ruined centuries ago and disappeared in Italy, absorbed by great landowners, only survived in those days the colonial estates amongst them, the one that the Lord of Tarsus had in Spain, contributing with their low prices to destabilize the economy of the metropolis. In front of this panorama of general insecurity, the lords of Tarsus, who were not kings, but a family of landowners and Hispanic Roman functionaries. They must act with extreme caution. Christianity has been imposed in the summit of the imperial power, now is supported by spears and the legionaries' swords. But this Christianity evidently has not doctrinaire principles to result absolutely unacceptable for the lords of Tarsus. As they learned harshly in their war against the Golems, the myths, the legendary histories, the arguments that are written in heaven, can be repeated again in the earth. And they are disposed to accept the history of Jesus and even the message, the good news as some kind of actualization of the myth of Nabutan. The lords of Tarsus will become Christians because they will see the history of Jesus with the optic of the ancient wisdom, and they will not discuss the differences, although they will have them present and they will never forget them. They will embrace the cross and will celebrate the sacraments of the Roman Church. For all the effects, they will be consecrated Christians. Even they will give from their children to the Church. But amongst them, in the middle of the House of Tarsus, they will only recognize as truth what is coincident with the history of Nabutan, or with other fragments of the Hyperborean wisdom, that the family still retains. As in their moment, the Gnostics and Manichian, and later make the Cathars and Albigenes, they will accept only a part of the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, and will absolutely deny the Old Testament. This is what they alleged, that the God of the Jews was Jehovah Satan, an aspect or countenance of the God One, the creator of the material universe. In the Genesis is narrated the history of the creation of the material universe, where it would be enslaved the eternal and uncreated spirit. The spirit only concedes value to the real world once it comes, and from where also came the creator God due to the material universe has been evidently created as imitation of the real world. And in the Old Testament is narrated also the history of the chosen people by Jehovah Satan, the reign over all the countries of the earth. It was not clear then the promise that the creator had made unto Abraham, lookest around whence you are, to the north and south to the east and west, all the land that thou seest I will give to thee and thine offspring forever. I will make thine offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if any one could reckon the dust, then thine offspring would be counted. Goest, walkest upon the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to thee. Genesis 13.14 Promise, which is reaffirmed later, in taking him out, Jehovah said unto him, Lookest out to the sky and countest, if thou can, the stars. And he added, Thine offspring wilt be as the stars thou seest in the sky. But the Creator was clearer with Moses when he revealed the mission of the chosen people. Therefore, if ye will hear my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be my chief treasure above all people. Though all the earth be mine, ye shall be unto me also a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And he answered, Behold! I will make a covenant before all thy people, and will do marvels, such as have not been done in all the world, neither in all nations, and all the people among whom you are shall seek the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Keep diligently that which I command thee this day, take heed to thyself, that thou make no compact with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest they be the cause of ruin among you. But ye shall overthrow their altars, and break their images in pieces, and cut down their groves, Asherah poles. 
When complying with the covenant, the chosen people will be blessed by the Creator according to what He communicates to Moses. Ye shall make you no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up any pillar, neither shall ye set any image of stone in your land to bow down to it. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If ye walk in my ordinances and keep my commandments and do them, I will then send you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increases, and the trees of the field shall give their fruit, and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto sowing time, and you shall eat your bread in plenteousness, and dwell in your land safely, and I will send peace in the land, and ye shall sleep, and no one shall make you afraid. Also I will rid evil beasts out of the land, and the sword shall not go through your land. Also ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you upon the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you upon the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make you increase, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. Ye shall eat also old store, and carry out old, because of the new. And I will set my tabernacle amongst you, and my soul shall not loathe you. And I will walk amongst you, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt. The chosen people, hence, would be the one that the swarthy Atlanteans announced thousands of years ago, the enemies of the Pact of Blood was at least ironic that now was pretended to derive from such damn people an emulus of Nabutan, the founder of the Pact of Blood. But Jesus was not coming to save the Pact of Blood, but precisely to destroy it forever. What demonstrated that the consequence of his provenance from the chosen people, by Jesus Christ, the pure blood, would be degraded as never before? The entire mankind would become bastard, the courage would gel in the veins, and would be replaced by the fear of the God One. And when men be materialized, and would not answer to the fear of the God one any more, courage would not emerge anyway because men would be immersed in the moral degradation of the cultural decadence. They would become effeminate and softened, they would be confused in a universal scoundrel of the spirit. But this vile scoundrel, naturally, even the church as the other founded sects by the chosen people in the white fraternity, would extract the best of the earth, that's to say, to those who would support and aid them with fever. The priests and the faithfuls, the members of the secret societies that would reign the world, and the scoundrel of the spirit that would approve their government, worms and serpents, lamb and sheep, peace pigeons, no eagle, no condor, Dr. Signigel. Of course, that the expectation to this rule remains save to the ones of the pure blood. To all those that into it, with the crucifixion, the eternal spirit must be liberated, that it never sinned and not saved the sinner's soul. To those who want a warrior Christos and not a shepherd Christ. To those who feel a Christos of uncreated light and not to those who perceive a material Christ. The Christos that the Lord of Tarsus conceived, for example, was a spiritual, pure God of uncreated light, who if would be manifested in the earth would make it wearing a king's crown and wielding the sword. And in this parousia, the mere presence of Christos would be enough to produce a spiritual aristocracy amongst men, that would put end to the confusion of the spiritual scoundrel. Christos would communicate charismatically to men, he would talk to them directly to their pure blood, and he would be able to listen it better, would be really the most virtuous, the most spiritual, the real Christians. Thirteenth Day As we have seen, the lords of Tarsus were Christians, su generis. And if the church had discovered their real beliefs, surely they would have been condemned as heretics. But they had always cared on their public manner, to express their ideas. Far were the times when the house of Tarsus guarded the cults of the cold fire and assumed the obligation of its conservation and diffusion. After the destruction of Tartessos, and the oath made by the last men of stone, the priority that they had imposed to themselves consisted in to comply with the familiar mission, and save the wise sword, and for it would be necessary to move remaining unnoticed, concentrated only in their objectives. They didn't forget that the wise sword was still waiting in the secret cave, neither the sentence of the golems or Gorin, that's to say, the hogs and was contemptuously qualified by the lords of Tarsus, alluding to the sentence written with the blood of the Vrayas. Even though the lords of Tarsus didn't talk about their religious ideas, instead they acted, and they made it ostensibly, 
to attract the attention of their exemplary behavior and to divert it from the controversial thoughts. The great ignorance that characterized the clerics and bishops of that age favored them to a great extent. They were only fixed in the exterior part of the cult and in the obedience and faith demonstrated by the believers. And in that sense, the house of Tarsus constituted a Christian family. They were rich landowners and very humble and virtuous, also working their properties in Huelva past great part of the year in the campaign. They generously helped the church and maintained in the village of Tarsus a balisca consecrated in the Holy Virgin. They even formed with the people of the hamlet of Turtus a minor order audience in charge of the exposition of the gospel to the catechumens who would be baptized. Yes, the church would be proud of the house of Tarsus. Really, the lords of Tarsus didn't lie in this due to they affirmed that the most pure image of the new Christianity was the Virgin Mary. For this reason, in the middle of the third century, they transformed the Roman Belisca, where they officiated the cult of Vesta in a Christian ecclesia. They conserved the edifice intact, but they replaced the statue of Vesta, and they constructed an altar to celebrate the Eucharist, where they deposited also the perennial lamp. When it was possible, the lords of Tarsus tried to make that chapel be attended always by clerics of the family. Although due to its importance, it received periodic visits of the Bishop of Seville and the presbyteries of the surroundings. The chosen worship for the cult of the Virgin had an autochthonous origin due to the own lords of Tarsus. When they had presented before the Christian priests, they made it assuring that they had witnessed a manifestation of the Virgin. According to them, the Virgin had appeared in a shallow grotto situated a few meters from the village of Turtus, case that would be attested by all the members of the family. And some servants, the Virgin had shown herself in the splendor of her majesty and had asked them to worship her divine son and to remember her with a cult. Then the lords of Tarsus, visible prey of excitation, declared that they wanted to abandon the pagan cult and become Christians. The voluntary conversion of such powerful Roman Hispanic family caused great satisfaction to the Catholic priests, due to it would add exemplary prestige to their evangelizing missions in the region. Thence they accepted willingly the initiative of the House of Tarsus occulted behind the sculpture with which they replaced at the Vesta statue. Things had overly changed since the age of the Carthaginians. Now the village counted of an enormous segniorial residence, and the Terra Dominicata and with some fifty hectares of terra in Dominicata given to the cultivation. A peasant drop, also called Village of Turtus, had been erected near the residence of the Lords of Tarsus, and in the limit of the drop, over a hill which smoothly descended to the signorial residence, the Lords of Tarsus had destined for the local church and parish an excellent Roman Belisca. The Catechumens, who were going to hear the Missa Catechumenorium, and the faithfuls, who then would assist to the particular Misa Fidelum, reached to the atrium, a garden surrounded by columns, and they passed beside a fountain called Cantharus. Before entering the central nave, constructed over a rectangular level, the Belisca had three naves, two lateral nerves that formed the cross, and the central nave was divided by two columns of seats, occupied in the right side by men and left by women. The central nave ended in the apse, a vaulted, widening, and elevated where was the sanctuarium. Normally in every church of that time, at the bottom of the apse, was the Episcopal Cathedral, as will be seen immediately, had been assigned to the Holy Virgin. In front of the Episcopal Cathedral, in the core of the sanctuary, was the Sacra Mensa of the altar, and over it the instruments of the cult, the chalice, the paten, and the perennial lamp. The culminating moment of the Mass of the Faithfuls take place immediately after the pronunciation of the Eucharist words of the priest. Then he recites the Ecclesias, an invocation to the Holy Spirit, soliciting its presence to propitiate the miracle of the transmutation of the bread and the wine, and draw a little curtain which leaves exposed to the faithful's sight the divine image of the Virgin. The faithfuls were absorbed in the contemplation. The sculpture of the Virgin is of painted wood, of small dimensions, Seventy centimeters of elevation, thirty of width and thirty of depth, she is seated in a majestic attitude over the cathedra also made of wood. Her countenance is of beautiful occidental factions because she was a reproduction of one of the ladies of Tarsus, and smiles smoothly while her eyes are fixed directly ahead. Her hair falls down in the form of sixteen braids, finely carved, 
which emerge immediately from under the crown because even she, as the child, exhibits the attributes of the royal dignity. Both crowns are triple and octagonal. In regard to the child, he is seated on her lap over the left knee while she lovingly sustains him from his shoulders with the left hand. In difference to the sculpture of the Virgin, which is of painted wood, the child one is of white stone. Virgin of wood, child of stone. The countenance of the Virgin is painted of immaculate white, the hair of gold, the body of red, and the cathedra of black. With the right hand the Virgin wields a bundle of sixteen spikes of wheat and a birch rod. With the left hand she holds the child. Her feet are separated as her knees, and beneath her right foot can be seen crushed the head of a serpent. The child, Christos King, on his part, looks fixed ahead, in the same direction of his divine mother, and has a book in the left hand, while with the right he realizes a gesture that stands out, the straight angle between the fingers, index, and thumb. It is evident why the worship was given the name of the White Virgin of the Child of Stone, or Our Lady of the Grotto. Due to, apart from the mention made by the lords of Tarsus about the place of the apparition of the Virgin, the grotto not intervened at all in the cult. But the case was that the Virgin, whose description I just made, represented clearly to Ama, the mother of Navutan, to whom the white Atlanteans called the Virgin of Katagar, because they pretended that she was still in the city of the liberator gods. But what means Katagar is an agglutination of three ancient words. The first, from which is conserved the final K. That was for the white Atlanteans, a generic name of God. With K, they used to refer to the unknowable, and also to the liberator gods. The second is Ta, or Ta, which means city, but not any city, but Hyperborean city, city of the white Atlanteans. And the third is Gar, which is equivalent to crypt, grotto, or underground closure. So Katagar means approximately the underground city of the liberator gods. With the suppression of the K and the transposition of the rest of the words, other populations have referred to the same city as Agartha, Agartha, or, or Agartha, which means literally underground city. The virgin of Katagar is also the virgin of Agartha, but Agartha can be interpreted as the grotto. In this form appears the real origin of the ingenuous denomination. Our Lady of the Grotto, that the lords of Tarsus adopted to refer openly to the Virgin of Agartha. In sum, when the imperial law of 392 that represented the practice of the pagan cults was dictated, the lords of Tarsus were already Christians, Catholic Romans, and sustained in their ecclesiae propiae the cult to Our Lady of the Grotto, the Virgin of Agartha. It doesn't mean that with this charge they renounced to the cult of the cold fire. In reality, to celebrate such cult was not required any image. Was the figurative necessity of the Lydians, when perfecting the form of the cult, introduced in the past the image of Pyrene. But Pyrene was the cold fire in the heart, and her simpler representation consisted in the perennial lamp. To the goddess chosen ones, to those who still believed in her promise, would be enough with the perennial lamp because the end of the ritual and the test of the cold fire had to be realized internally. Thereby all the ancient mystery of the cold fire was exposed to the sight in such balisca of the village of Turdus. But as before, as always, only the men of stone understood it. Only they knew, when praying in the chapel, that the gaze of Virgin of Gartha and of the child of stone were nailed in the flame of the perennial lamp, and that such dancing flame was Pyrene, was Freya, the wife of Navutan, expressing with her dance the secret of the death. In the beginnings of the fourth century, three barbarous populations assaulted Spain. Two were German, the Suevi and the Vandals, and the other, the Alans, Iranian. In the distribution that they made, the Alans occupied Lusitania and part of Betica, including the region of the village of Turdus reached to be in 409, and in eight years that they attained to stay in the region, their presence is reduced to the usufruct and the own benefit of the taxation correspondent to the Roman functionaries, and the periodic looting of some villages. To face the invasion, the Roman general, Constantius, in the name of the emperor Honorius, contracts the king Walia, of the Visigoths, through the Photius signed in the year 416. By this treaty, the Visigoths agreed to fight, in quality of federated of the empire, against the barbarians that occupy Spain, receiving in turn lands to establish in the south of the Gaul, in the Tarraconesis, and in the Narbonesis. 
the Allens were rapidly annihilated, while the Vandals didn't realize incursions in the Betica yet, until they finally abandoned the peninsula to Africa. When in 476, the Heruli, Odoacer, disposes the Roman Emperor, Augustulus, giving end to the Western Roman Empire. From five years ago, the Visigoths King Uric was occupying Spain. This time the Visigoths entered the Finnish with the Suvis, in fulfillment of the Fotis of the year 418, but they would not leave for the next two hundred years. The permanent presence of the Visigoths in Spain not affected, in a determinate manner, the lives of the Hispanic Romans, except in the case of the owners of great estates, latifudiums that were obeyed by the Photius to distribute their lands with the German guests. Such was the case of the lords of Tarsus, when they had to host a Visigoth family named Walter, and to give them one-third of the Terra Dominica, and two-thirds of the Terra Indominica, but after the expropriation, that constituted a fair payment for the tranquility of the Visigoths' family, assured in front of the recent invasions, all continued as the days of the Roman Empire. Only the destiny of taxes had changed, which was not Roman any more, but much closer to the Toledo. The amount and the periodicity of the exaction, and even the collector functionaries, were the same as when in the Roman Empire. Three fundamental points separated from a beginning the Visigoths and the Hispanic Romans a law that prohibited the marriages between Goths and Hispanic Romans, the religious difference and the numeric proportion between both populations. The first was solved in the year 580 with the annulment of the law, remaining opened the barrier that impeded to mix both populations, since the Valter's family integrates with many marriages to the house of Tarsus, remained restoring the primitive patrimony of the lords of Tarsus. The second point means that, while the totality of the Hispanic Roman dwellers professed the Catholic religion, the Visigoths' guests maintained the Arianism. In fact, both populations were Christians, and ignorant of the theological quibblings that the priests established dogmatically. And in this case, the difference that Arius had signalized was of extreme subtlety. The Visigoths were evangelized. When they still inhabited in the shores of the Black Sea, the Goth bishop, Ulfilas, devotee of Arius, then, when advancing through Occident, pushed by the Huns, would discover with satisfaction that their Christianity was different from the Roman, and they would hang on tenaciously to the difference, often incomprehensible. They would work in this form because the Goths had developed the great grade, the national pride, and they needed to dispose of some tangible difference, an own unifying principle which would avoid them to be culturally phagocytized by the Roman Empire. The meaning of the difference itself has no major importance. The concrete would be that Arianism would maintain them religiously separated from the Roman population in such way that when joining each other would allow them to conserve the Gothic culture. In what consisted such difference with the Catholic dogma that only a few understood, but the nationalist Goths would defend it to the end? Specifically, it referred to a definition concerning to a problem of the divinity of Jesus Christ. The posture of Arius, natal of Libya, but enrolled in the diocese of Antioquia, appeared as a reaction against the doctrine of Sibelius. He affirmed that not existed an essential distinction amongst the three persons of the Christian trinity. The Son and the Holy Spirit were really manifestations of the Father under other aspect of prosopon. The essence of the God One, one was presented with one aspect of the Father, with the other was the Child, and with the other the Holy Spirit. Against this, Arius started to teach since 318 that only God one is eternal and incommunicable. Jesus Christ was created from the knot. Therefore, he is not eternal. He is a creature of the God one, hence something different from him, something not consubstantial with him. Sibelius didn't establish any distinction within the three persons of this trinity, whereas Arius differentiated in such way the Father and the Son that he was not God any more, nor consubstantial with the Father. Both would be condemned as heretics for the Catholic doctrine. And what was the truth? According to what was decided in Nicaea in 325, a council of 300 bishops, Jesus Christ answered to the formula consubstantialis patri, i.e., he was consubstantial with the Father, of his same substance, God as him. Thence the religious difference that separated Goths and Romans treated about the complex concept of the consubstantiality between God and the verb of God, difference that would not reach to explain the Goths' obstinacy, at least, that could be considered that with this was preserving a culture, a tradition, and a lifestyle.
Perhaps it would not be evidenced on its real dimension of the danger of the immersion of the Roman culture, and that was denounced by the nationalist Goths. If it is not repaired in the third point, about the numeric disproportion between both populations, because the Visigoths only counted 200,000, it means that a community of 200,000 members just arrived had to dominate a native population of 9 million Hispanic Romans, exponents of a high grade of civilization. At the light of such quantities, it is better understood the reticence of the Goths to suppress the religious and juristic differences that isolated them from the Hispanic Romans. The reality of their scarce number obeyed the Visigoths to tolerate the religion of the Hispanic Romans, although without ceding an apex in their Aryan convictions. However, even by the desperation of the nationalists, the universality in that time of a world, which was Roman and Catholic, was penetrating them from everywhere, and finally they had to accept a cultural integration that, indeed, was already consummated. In the year 589, the King Ricard became Catholic during the Third Council of Toledo, fulfilling the religious unification of the populations of Spain. Being the Goths and Indo-Germanic race that was counted amongst the last one who abandoned the Pact of Blood, i.e., who were amongst the ones of pure blood of the earth, it is easy to conclude that their presence in the peninsula could only benefit to the House of Tarsus. But such step taken by Ricard would elevate, now without obstacles, the lords of Tarsus to the most noble dignities of the court of Toledo. Since the seventh century, the ones from Tertus Valter would be the Visigoths' counts. The political unification of Spain completed by his father, the King Louis Vigild, and the religious unification carried out by Ricard, would leave unveiled the eternal enemy that until then had thrived with the differences that separated both populations. It was about the members of the chosen people, by Jehovah Satan, who professed to the Gentiles, that's to say, to those who not belong to the chosen people, an inextinguishable hate analogous to the one that Golems feel against the House of Tarsus. Even though the last Christianity, the one of Jesus Christ, registered the clear origin of their sacred books, their traditions, their synagogues, and rabbis, they depreciated it and explained its existence as a necessary evil, as the fable that would put in evidence the moral Jew truth. The false Catholic Christianity would last until the advent of the Jewish Messiah, the real Christ, who would sit in the throne of the world and would submit all the populaces of the earth to the slavery of the Jews. This was a prophecy that would be relentlessly accomplished, just as countless rabbis and doctors of the law assured in the Talmud. They blindly believed that the dysphoria had a finality to infiltrate them amongst the Gentile populations as some kind of mystical preparation for the future that would come, for the universal restoration of the Temple of Jehovah Satan and the resurrection of the House of Israel, the real Jewish Messiah. During the dispersion, the Gentiles would learn who are the Jews, the expression of the God One on the earth. And the Jews would demonstrate to the Gentiles what is the power of the God One, and all diaspora, and in such Sephard of Spain, the Jews, persuaded by their messianic leadership, were determined to undermine by any means the social fundaments of the Gentile populations. The religion, the moral, the royal and nobility institutions, the economy, and every legal base suffered systemic attacks by the members of the chosen people. Ricard had to act against them due to the evidence of their indefatigable corrupting task. But the successors of such king didn't work with the necessary energy and allowed that the Jews to proceed with their plans. The king says but, extraordinary warrior and jealous Christian, who defeated successively the Basques, Cantabri, Suconis, Asturianos, and Byzantine, Greeks, had to correct that situation. In April of 612, he dictates a law that prohibits to the Jews the possession of Christian slaves. You must not forget, Dr. Signigel, the profound irony that implicated such prohibition from the theological perspective, considering that the Talmudic prophecies announced the prompt enslavement of Christians in Goyim. Of course, to the juridical effects, the law was regulated, aiming to particular slaves, and in this manner was ordained that, to every Jew surprised in possession of a Christian slave, after July the 1st of 612, all his goods would be confiscated, and to the slave would be conceded the freedom as a Roman citizen. Also became effective by the same law, a disposition from the times of the Alaric II who executed the Jews who had converted a Christian to their religion, even in sons of intermarriage. When Sesbet died in 633, gathered the Fourth Council of Toledo, where assisted the Count of Tarsus in quality of local bishop. 
There, many themes were treated as the royal succession, the cases of sedition, the rules of the ecclesiastic discipline, etc., and on it was debated mainly of what concerned the Jewish problem. The King Sisen, and who chaired the council, with the complete lack of strategic skills and the Hyperborean vision of Sesbut, allow the pro-Jew faction to take the main voice and to question the measures recently decreed against the chosen people. Is there when the Count of Turdus Volter faces violently against the Bishop Isidore of Seville, who not possess neither remotely the pure blood of Ricard or Sesbut, nevertheless he was one of the best instructed and most intelligent men of Spain. His encyclopedia of twenty tomes is a masterwork for the age. Apart from many books dedicated to the most varied themes, he even wrote a treaty of apologetics with a suggestive title, De Fide Catholica against Ludeos. However, Isidore professed admiration with no limits for the history of the chosen people, and considered the Old Testament as the theological base of Christianity. Just as is demonstrated in his treaty of exegetics, where he comments the Hebrew books, the posture guided him to the contradiction of sustaining in one hand the necessity to fight against Judaism, and in the other to procure the defense of the Jews. To avoid that any type of violence would be put over them, in the course of the council moved by the false Christian mercy, he tried to retrace the laws of the Visigoth kings. Thanks to the intervention of the counts of Turdus Volter, are approved ten canons about the Jews. But without the rigor of Sesbut's law, was prohibited to the Jews, among other things, the practice of the usury, the performance of public offices, the mixed marriages, was ordered the dissolution of the existence mixed marriages, and was reaffirmed the prohibition to maintain Christian slaves. To evaluate the importance of the adopted resolutions, it just has to be noticed that the councils of Toledo were national synods of the Catholic Church, just as to the nobles who were responsible of the general of the laws, in case that they didn't accomplish with exactitude a dedication to the dispositions about the Jews. In that council of Toledo, the Count of Turdus Volter defended with ardor the cause that he denominated Goth-Hispanic culture. In a moment in which pro-Jew faction headed by the bishop Isidore seemed to have controlled the dispute, his eruption was decisive. He spoke with such eloquence that achieved to define the majority of the bishops in favor to take urgent measures to counteract the Jewish problem. All were fascinated, especially the noble Visigoths, when they heard to assure that the Goth-Hispanic culture was oldest of the earth, and that now the invaluable heritage was threatened by a population enemy of the spirit a population who worshipped Satan in secrecy and counted with their infernal power to enslave or destroy mankind. Satan had conferred power over the gold, that they always used to carry out their uncontestable plans, and which they surely used to bring the vote of the bishops that defended them. This possibility, to be at the service of the Jewish gold, took to more than one pro-Jew bishop to shut his mouth and allow that, finally, the expected measures, be the count of Turdus Volter, were approved. However, such victory was not positive for the House of Tarsus, due to it revealed something that was unnoted by all the world up to that moment. The attitude that the Count of Turdus Volter was exuded, something more than the Catholic zeal, something alive, something that could only proceed from a secret knowledge, from an occult source. The Earl was extremely sure of what he was affirming, was rather categorical in his conviction to be a fanatic, to be someone blinded by the faith. It was evident that the Earl knew what he had said, but how much, and what did he know? Whether did his wisdom come? Thence the house of Tarsus would be observed again by the enemy, and to the hate of the Golems would be added now one of the chosen people of some part of the Catholic Church, who would not stop to pursue the Lord of Tarsus and procure their destruction, since that moment, even if they would contribute to their riches and members to the strengthening of the Church, the house of Tarsus would always be suspicious of heresy. Fourteenth Day About Muhammad, I will only point out here that if it was imposed to the faithfuls of the Islam, the obligation to orient themselves daily towards a stone, the black stone of Kaaba, and the holy war as a form to comply with God, was due to, he knew the principles, of the Hyperborean wisdom. Because an oriented warrior is an adequate definition for the Hyperborean initiate, surely the esoteric wisdom of Muhammad was diverted or not understood by their followers. Anyway, even though they were not totally understood, the simple action of the principles of the Hyperborean wisdom is enough to transmute men and populations.
to neutralize the degrading pacifism of the cultural pact. In this way, when Muhammad died in 632, almost all Arabia was in power of the Khalifas. In 638 fell Syria and Palestine, in 642 Egypt, in 643 Tripoli, and in 650 all of Persia. At last, the Roman civilization lost Africa. In 698, Carthage was destroyed. In Spain, the King Egeca had to convoke the 18th Council of Toledo urgently, which was gathered in the Church Santa Leocadia in November 9th of 694. The motive was the next. The African city of Quetta, in front of Gibraltar, was the unique Christian era that still resisted the Arab advance. At the head of the same was Earl Julian Vassal of the King of Spain. The resistance of Quetta depended exclusively on provisions that the Hispanic Goths sent to them. While the Quetis had discovered something terrible, the Hebrews of Africa were negotiating the Arab invasion of Spain, with the support of their pensular brothers, once arranged the price for the betrayal. The Jews of Spain would provide to the Saracens all the necessary information, and of their personal collaboration, to assure the success of the invasion. Naturally, the chosen people hate either Mahadmians or Christians, but their prophetic strategy prescribes that must be confronted each other until they finally be dominated by them. Thence, it was the turn to destroy the Christian kings of Europe. When these news arrived to the King Egeca, who belonged to the enemy clan of the high nobility and the clergy, that's to say, pro-Jew, he had no other choice than to gather the council and to expose the case of high treason. This time were four bishops of the House of Tarsus to defend the cause of the spiritual Christianity and of the Hispanic Goth culture. As ardently debated and finally is opted to act with major rigor, all the Jews of Spain will be submitted to the enslavement and their good confiscated in favor of the Visigoth state. It is clear that these measures were not harsh but flexible due to not applying the death sentence against the traitors was only achieved to give them time while they would continue conspiring. Fifteen years later, the Arabs would return them all their old possessions and would concede them a prominent place in the society, in, re in retribution for their services. The party of the high nobility and the high clergy, supported by the lords of Turdus Volter, was reunited around the family of the defunct king, Chindasimvinto. The party of the progressive monarchy, was gathered around the family of the King Wamba, who died in 680. Egeka, who was member of Wamba's family, arranged the succession to the throne of his son, Witisa, who started to reign in the year 702. Meanwhile, the Betica governs the Duke Roderick, from Chindasvinto's clan. When Witisa died in 710, the Aula Regia of Toledo, where those from the party from Chindasvinto, one majority, proclaims the new king to Roderick despised the sons of Widiza, at the same time governs of provinces and functionaries for what they consider a dispossession, ask to the Jews for an interview with the general Musa bin Nusayr. In the meantime, they revolt the Tara Sonisis and Narbonesis and the Navar, obeying Roderick to concentrate all his forces to the north to suffocate the uprising. These campaigns caused the interruption of supplies to Quetta, that result rapidly crushed by the Arabs. Finally, he goes to Africa, the embassy of traitors. It was integrated by the sons of Witiza, Olmund, Artabast, and Aquila, and the brothers of the deceased king, Sesbert, and the bishop of Seville, Opas, who was accompanied by the great rabbi of Seville, Isaac. Incredibly, Earl Julian, who entered to the service of Musa after his session of the area, and influenced by a personal enmity with Roderick, advises the Arab general to intervene in Spain. Musa promised them sending help to overthrow Roderick. The traitors return and simulate to pact the peace with the king, who not distrusted. In 711, the Berber general Tariq transport and four ships an army composed by Arabs and Berbers, and disembarked in Gibraltar. Roderick, who was still fighting against the Basques in the north, had to cross the country to cut the pass of Tariq, who was on the way to Seville. The battle took place on the shores of the Guadalete River. The rows of Roderick are in command of two columns and the brothers of Witiza. When the encounter took place, the traitors Sesbert and the bishop Opas passed to the side of Tariq 
leaving King Roderick in a compromising position. And after many days of combats, the Visigoth army resulted completely annihilated by Tariq, remaining unknown the fate of the last Visigoth king. The help given by the Arabs and Jews to the followers of Witiza would not redound in benefit of these because the next year, in General Musa, at the head of a more powerful army, would initiate the conquest of Spain. In a few years the whole peninsula, except for a small region in Asturias, would fall in his power. Spain was coveted, in such way, in an emirate dependent on the Caliph of Damascus. Although as a Christian reconquest advanced, the Arab dominion decreased. The Bedeca remained occupied for more than five hundred years. For the House of Tarsus, the Visigothic catastrophe didn't accuse other effect than the immediate loss of the political power. The Counts of Turdus Volter returned to be Lords of Tarsus, who had already ample experience surviving in similar situations. They were completely conscious that for the moment not existed in Europe a military force capable to expel the Arabs from Spain. The Emir al-Muhar, who governed between the years 718 and 720, achieved to cross the Pyrenees and to take the city of Narbonne, attacking from there the Frank territories. Only the noble Pelagius resist them and achieve to maintain a region under the Christian dominion in the mountains of Cantabaria and the Pyrenees. From this nucleus would appear in the kingdom of Asturias, to which later, in the tenth century, would be added Leon and Castile, and would be formed in the ninth Catalonia and Navarre, and in the eleventh century Aragon, by successive reconquest of territories to the Arabs. But in year 732, the emir of Cordova, the Abd al-Rahman, was moving loosely through the Gaul and was conquering Bordeaux. Only the decision of Charles Martel would avoid the conquest and destruction of the Frank kingdom, but was also clear since the year 737 that to the Christian states resulted impossible to go across the Pyrenees to Spain. Thence the supposition of the lords of Tarsus was very realistic, and also was their strategy to face the circumstance. Immediately they understood that the Arabs only respected two things, the force and the wisdom, who resisted them with enough courage as to wake up their respect, could obtain concessions from them, and only the admiration that they experimented for the wisdom and for those who had it allowed them to tolerate the religious differences. One thing was a Christian, and the other a wise Christian. To the first was necessary to force to embrace the Islam, was what the Prophet ordered and second, to convince him of the Islamic truth, luring him without prejudice to the Arab culture. Since then that the lords of Tarsus decided to show friendly with them and to demonstrate conclusively that they formed part of a wise family. This attitude not constituted a betrayal to the Catholic religion because the lords of Tarsus continued being pagans, i.e. they continued sustaining the cult of the cold fire, and due to the majority of the goth Hispanic population now called Mozarabs, was integrating little by little to the Arab culture, adopting its language and religion. The lords of Tarsus would become an exponent of the knowledge on its highest level, and would be for centuries teachers of the Arab learning centers of Seville and Cordova, obtaining for this collaboration and for the economic contributions of the village of Turdus, the right to profess the Christian religion and to maintain as private temple the basilisk of Our Lady of the Grotto. The members of the chosen people, as it is logic, took advantage of their influence to encourage persecutions against Christians, and especially against the House of Tarsus, during all the time that the Arab occupation lasted. However, loyal to their Talmudic principles, they tried to continue with their corrupting task, in detriment now of the Arab society. What meant that the Saracens achieved the objective of conquering Spain, would forget soon their favors and would submit them to periodic persecutions. Fifteenth Day It is convenient to inform you at this point of the history, Doctor, about the reappearance of the Golems. As I said, the sixth day, apart from their presence, always scarce among the Phoenicians and Carthaginians, had arrived massively to Europe since the fifth century BC. Accompanying the Scythian population from Asia Minor, such population received many names, according to the country where it transited, or established. Fundamentally, there were Celts, but they were also known as Gauls, Irish, Scots, Bretons, Welsh, Cornwalls, Galantians, Galatian, Lusitanians, etc. Now let's see with more detail how was that the Golems united with the Celts, 
and what is their real origin. I will explain later the meaning of the tablets of the law that Moses received from Jehovah when he sealed his covenant with the chosen people. Now it is appropriate to resume that the tablets of the law contain the secret of the serpent, that's to say, the description of the twenty-two voices that the Creator God employed to realize his work, and the ten aspects of Sephiroth, with which he manifested in the world when he executed the creation, are the thirty-two mysterious paths of the One. This knowledge gives place to a high science denominated acoustic and numeral Kabbalah, which is expressed only in the first tablets of the law. In the seconds, which were always exoteric, there is nothing else than a moral decalogue. Pallid reflect of the ten supreme archetypes in Sephiroth. The first tablets possess, then, the secret of the serpent and the secret of the construction of the universe. To preserve this secret from the profane glances, the tablets were kept in the Ark of the Covenant. While an interpretation of the Kabbalah was encrypted by Moses, Joshua, the elders, etc., in the written Pentateuch, or Torah, the twenty-two Hebrew letters, with which were written the encrypted words, kept direct relation with the twenty-two archetypical sounds that the Creator One pronounced. What gives them the inestimable value as magic instruments? But such letter also possesses an archetypical numeric meaning, in such a way that every word is susceptible to be analyzed and interpreted. This is the origin of the Jewish numeric Kabbalah, exclusively dedicated to comprehend the writing of the Torah, which must not be confused with the White Atlantean acoustic Kabbalah that is referred to the runes of Nebutan. But the acoustic Kabbalah was revealed in the tablets of the law, and these were locked in the ark, where only could be extracted once in a year for privileges of the priests. Finally, the King Solomon buried the ark in a deep crypt under the temple some thousands years B.C., and remained in the same place until the Middle Ages, i.e., for twenty-one centuries. I could add that there was the magical manner in which it was buried, what avoided the ark to be discovered before. When Solomon died, the kingdom of Israel was divided in two parts the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, who occupied the south of Palestine, remains under the command of Rehoboam, son of Solomon, and the rest of the country, formed by the other ten tribes, was aligned behind the authority of Jeroboam. In the year 719 BC, the great king Sargon destroyed the kingdom of Israel, and the ten tribes of Jeroboam were transported to the interior of Assyria to serve in the slavery. The two remaining tribes formed the kingdom of Judah, from which descends, in greater or fewer extent, the actual Jews. The ten lost tribes of Israel didn't disappear from history just as the interested Jewish propaganda pretends to make believe, due to its known about the manner much more than it is said. For example, it is true that existed Hebrew in America before Columbus and also that great part of the actual population of Afghanistan descend from the primitive members of the chosen people. But what interest now is to say that existed migrations of the Hebrews to the north, who were guided by a powerful caste of levities. After that they traversed the Caucasus, where they were decimated by Germanic tribes. They reached the steppes of Russia and clashed there with the Scythian population. The mass of the Hebrew people mixed with the Scythians, but as they were much inferior in number, they not affected the ethnic identity of them. On the contrary, the levity caste didn't accept to lose their condition of members of the chosen people, degrading their blood with the Gentiles. Thereby, the levities remained, dedicated to the cult in study of the numeric Kabbalah, for many years, reaching notable progress in the field of the natural sorcery and magic. When centuries later the Scythians moved to the west, one part of them established, and the Carpathians in the shores of the Black Sea, while the other part continued their advance to Central Europe, where they were known as Celts. Accompanying the Celts were the descendants of those levity priests, called now Golems, for being believed that their province was the Phoenician city of Sidon, where they were called Gauls or Gaulins. But from Sidon the Golems expanded to Tyre, from where they sailed with the Phoenicians to Tarsus and made the first incursions that the lords of Tarsus remember after the fall of Tyre in the 4th century BC. They would establish, as was seen, in Carthage, performing the priesthood of Baal Moloch. Some golems established also in Phygera, as officiates of the cults of Sabel, of Adonis, of Atis, 
is due to in that time the golems had a terrible power. Fruits of centuries consecrated to the study of the Satanism and the practice of the black magic. In some, the Celts advanced through Europe, guided by the golems. In the time, I'd say that such alliance would never end, being extended to our days. But how reached the levities from the lost tribes to become in golems? In other words, how they obtained the sinister knowledge— the explanation must be searched in the fact that these levities, something that didn't happen with other Jewish priests, neither then nor later, they were not pleased with the knowledge that could only be extracted from the written Torah. They wanted to enter the Chokmah, or divine wisdom, by a direct contact with the source of the acoustic Kabbalah, which is the science of the swarthy Atlanteans. Their insistence and perseverance to obtain such purpose, and their character of members of the chosen people convinced to the demons of the white fraternity that they were before of invaluable collaborators of the cultural pact. And this conviction made them decide to entrust them a very important mission, an enterprise that required their dynamic intervention in history. The fulfillment of the proposed objectives by the demons would rebound in benefit of the levities, Due to it would allow them to advance more and more in the knowledge of the acoustic Kabbalah. What type of mission was entrusted to them by the demons? A work that had direct relation with their desires. Would be the executors of the cultural pact. They would work to neutralize the megalithic constructions of the white Atlanteans. They would try to recover the Stone of Venus. They would fight unto death against the members of the Pact of Blood, and would collaborate to make the plan of the White Fraternity consistent in the establishment of the synarchy of the chosen people in Europe. Could be carried out well, but the Golems privately continued being levity priests, sons of the chosen people, and now keepers of the divine wisdom of Jehovah. For this reason their fundamental occupation, the main objective of their concerns, would be theological. They would try to unify the cults, demonstrating that, behind the plurality of the cults, existed the singularity of God, that thenceforth they shall comply rigorously with the sacrifice of the cult, because no matter what form of the cult could be, the sacrifice is one, i.e., the sacrifice participates from the one. Since the fifth century, the Celts and Golems are already traveling through Europe to the west, the Gauls were the ones who joined the Hamilcar Barca and avoided Rome to help Tartessos. Then they would join the Hamilcar Barca in the invasion of Italy. But much before in the 4th century, they had humiliated Rome and destroyed the Temple of Apollo in Delphi. Julius Caesar, in his famous campaign of Gauls, achieved to submit them definitely to the control of Rome in 59 BC. August divided the Transalpine Gaul in four provinces, the Narbonessus, the Aquitaine, the Celtic, or Lyonese, and Belgium. The Golems, who had great power over all those populations, started to withdraw step by step from the Roman provinces that were even followed by some Celtic contingents. They passed first to Great Britain, or Britain, but the final objective is Ireland, that is Hibernia. In the first centuries of the Christian age were not many of the Golems who moved loosely for Europe, in the fourth century, when the practice of the pagan cults was punished with the death sentence, didn't seem to be golems in the Roman Christians' regions any more. In fact, in that time the Gauls of Hibernia were totally Romanized, and in the regions where paganism was still practiced, the Catholic missionaries overthrown the pagan temples, sometimes centennial trees, and put the golems to flight. Invariably they depart to Great Britain or Ireland. The arrival of the barbarians in the 5th century not gives them a chance to re-establish their power, because these populations are Aryan Christians of the Germanic race, traditionally enemy of the Celts, who were also considered barbari. Thus the Visigoth kingdom of Spain, the lords of Tarsus, will receive the impression that finally they had disappeared from the earth. However, the contrary was about to occur. Due to in a very little time, the golems would be protagonist of the most spectacular return. Yes, because the Golems didn't return to Europe to comply their old role of pagan priests of the God One, to comply with the mission of gathering the cults and the ritual sacrifice. Now were other times, such mission would be in the direct hand of the chosen people, who would offer to the One the sacrifice of all the Gentile, or Goyim, mankind. The White Fraternity had entrusted to the Golems in turn the performance of a superior function, an occupation that would benefit, as never before, the unification of mankind. For that reason they not returned this time as pagan priests, but as Christians, 
and not only as Christians, but as Catholic Romans, and not only as Catholics, but as missionary monks of the Catholic Church. And they would be considered wise constructors of the Church, absurd title, which mention would bring ironic laughs to the men of stone. This is a long history that here I am only able to resume, and has its principle in the plans of the white fraternity the traitor gods to comply their pacts with the creator god and the potencies of the matter they had to make easier control of the world for the chosen people for it would be necessary to fasten definitively the materialistic way of life founded in the cultural pact that's to say it would be necessary to fasten the cult in the roman germanic societies formed recently in europe and the best form to fasten the cult just as is deducted of what i exposed the third day is to formalize it and to impress that form in the masses, to centralize the society around the form of the cult. Where the form of the cult begins, what is the most visible extreme for the masses? Evidently, the cult begins with the temple, the first that appear to the believer. In reality, the most important of the cult is the ritual. But every place where the ritual is practiced is a temple because the temple is the sacred space where the ritual can be realized. The apparent priority of the temple originates in that, effectively, a temple can exist. In other words, a sacred space or core of metaphysical manifestation without a ritual. But it is impossible to conceive that a ritual can be executed out of a sacred space or temple. The plan of the white fraternity to fasten the cult started then, by the massive implantation of temples and by the evolution in the form of the temples in concordance with the objectives of the ritual. But such plans aimed to a final objective much more complex. The installation of a world government in the hands of the chosen people. The white fraternity would create the adequate cultural conditions to make that a future society could accept the form of the government. And that enterprise would occupy the effort of all the priestly caste of Occident, standing out in first term the mission entrusted to the golems. When the society would be ready for the world government, then would realize, through a Messiah, the reunification of Christianity with the house of Israel, and would be elevated the chosen people to the throne of the world. Such were the plans of the white fraternity and the priests of the cultural pact. The transformation of the society that such plans demanded would be fulfilled principally by the religious unification and the fixative of the cult that exerts every temple over the masses. But would be more was also required the formation of a financial and military power to give support, on its opportunity, to the constitution of the world government. The official cult of the European societies was Christianity. Thus the temples would respond to the rites of the church. Clearly it is adverted that the plan of the traitor gods requires the effectuation of two conditions. The first is that the masses take consciousness about the necessity of the temple for the efficacy of the ritual and the second is to dispose, in the moment in which this necessity reaches its major expression, a man capable to satisfy it by the constructions of temples in great quantities and volumes. The first condition would be accomplished by the constant and permanent missionary preach, the second with the foundation in Occident of a secret college of the temple constructors. This college, Dr. Signagel, was entrusted to the golems. But this not occurred immediately because the plan of the white fraternity had to be fulfilled, starting with the first condition. When in the church was to be prepared the place that the golems would occupy to develop their constructor's college in the sixth century, only then they were convened in Ireland to realize their amazing continental reappearance. From that opportunity the golems took advantage to return to Europe, and as the product of the birth, in the sixth century, of the Occidental monasticism, traditionally attributed to Benedict of Nursia. Really, only the ignorance of the Europeans could sustain such attribution for 1,200 years. However, although since the 17th century it is known in Occident the histories of the religions of Asia with quite precision, even today exists those who stubbornly sustain that humbug, amongst them the official dogma of the Catholic Church. But to prove the deceit, it is just necessary to take a flight, travel to the Tibet, and observe there the Buddhist monasteries of the 3rd and 2nd centuries B.C., i.e. 800 years before St. Benedict, whose inner laws and constructions are analogous to the Benedictians. The prayer and the work were a rule there, just as in the formula of St. Benedict. But the most important, the most clarifier of the comparison, 
will result undoubtedly to discover that the Tibetan monks were dedicated to the office as copyist, that is, to reproduce and perpetuate ancient documents and books, and to preserve and develop the art of the constructions of temples, just as the Benedictines, and must not be insisted due to it is well known that such monasteries constituted centers of religious diffusion by the action of the missionary and mendicant monks that there were prepared and sent through all Asia. At the light of the actual knowledge, however, anyone with good faith must admit that the institution of the Oriental monasticism date from the 10th century BC, i.e., is at least 1400 years older than the apparition of the Occidental monasticism, to refresh the memory in regard to this, it is convenient to remember the next. In first place, that the oldest hymns of the Rig Veda of the Upanishads mention the Brahmanical communities Munis and Vrayatas. In second place, that in the age of Buddha, historic personage of the 7th century BC already existed the groups that would be formed in Sanghas. But this is not about if the Benedictians were Buddhist or if they had something in common with the Buddhism priests, as the Benedictian priests, obeyed to the white fraternity and secrecy, the real occult force of the monasticism, Oriental and Occidental. The white fraternity, in fact, were the authors of a work entitled Rules of the Masters of Wisdom, of universal diffusion, and that in Occident was known since the second century as Rugla Magistri Sapentia by many Christian sects also known for Gnostic Jews. Thus, nothing original would be the Occidental monasticism, which would answer, on the contrary, to the most orthodox dispositions that the white fraternity rules on the matter. In the first centuries of the Christian age, when the Roman Empire admitted paganism and maintained contact with the populations of Asia, was perfectly known the existence of the monkish oriental life. Even some illustrious men, as Apollonius of Tiana, contemporary of Jesus, had traveled to the Tibet and received instruction in their monasteries. Some Gnostic sects that reached to comprehend and oppose the plans of the White Fraternity have left testimony that is known in the main cities of Middle East, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antiquia, Capricie, Ephesus, etc. But the institution of the monasteries is not established from one day to another. It is necessary to follow a strict formation process, a method which is known since the age of the Atlantis, and the priests of the cultural have used universally. The Buddhist priests, previously deformation of the Kasteria Siddhartha, created the monosticism Buddhist, Tibetan, Chinese, Indian, and Japanese. This method determines what must start from a phrase of social anarchic mysticism, characterized by the proliferation of illuminated hermits and saints. This stage has an objective to promote the belief that the future monkish institution is spontaneous product of the people. In this form, the populations would accept naturally the existence and the work of the monasteries, and the most important will be also accepted by the kings and governors. And this infallible method is applicable in any population and with the assistance of any religion. In the mark of Judeo-Christianity in the first century has already started the application of the method and emerges in the Middle East multitude of ascetics and saints who retire to the deserts and mountains to live in solitude. During the second and third centuries grows much more the population of Anchorites that many decided to join under the command of a superior saint, and the order of some rule are constituted then the communities of Kenobites. Nevertheless, the community of the Kenobites didn't reach yet the union grade required for the monastic way of life, due to every member continued with the Aramite life, and are only gathered to pray and feed. And with the Anchorites and Cenobites roam everywhere the wandering friars, Occidental version of the Oriental mendicant monks. In the 5th century, the colonies of Anchorites and Cenobites counted thousands and thousands of members in Egypt, Palestine, and the Middle East. In just one diocese of Egypt, Oxyrhynchus, lived 20,000 of female Aramites and 100 Anchorite hermits, while in life of St. Patrimus existed 7,000 Cenobite monks in their monasteries. That reaches to 50,000 in the 5th century. With this, I want to exemplify, Dr. Signigel, the magnitude of this pre-monastic. An already known movement was the one of Far East inspiration. 
in the propitious moment to institute the Occidental monastasism and to diffuse the deceit that has consisted in the original Judeo-Christian creation would be presented after the death of the Emperor Theodosius in 395, when the Roman Empire is distributed among his two sons, Arcadius and Honorius. Arcadio establishes in Constantinople, given birth to the Byzantine Empire, which would last until the year 476. The Empire of Occident is divided in multiple Roman Germanic kingdoms and begins a collective process of isolation and cultural decadence. Not only with Asia were broken the cultural connections, but with the same Greece. The European society was already prepared for the monastic institution, for centuries had seen passing the wandering friars coming from the Holy Land, and listening the histories of the Oriental Anchorites and Cenobites. Even many pilgrims traveled to the Holy Land, and there adopted the ascetic life, preserving at their return the acquired habits. In that moment, 6th century, not exist Europe mountainous zone, not inhabited by Christian Eremites, but once established the order of the monasteries, all would forget the oriental origin of the monastic institution. Precisely from the Benedict monasteries will emerge the copies and translations of the most fecund books of the Greek culture, which didn't have a monastic institution, and will be lost every vestige of the cultures of Far East vestiges that had existed in the Roman Empire and that mysteriously disappeared from Europe at the same time that appeared the most adequate books to push Occident to the spiritual disaster of the Renaissance and the modern age. That's to say, the books where are exposed the rationalism and the Greek speculation, root of the philosophy and the modern science. Nothing will be told, since the Benedictian culture, about the Atlantean origin of the European civilizations neither about the religions of the populations of Asia, nor about the recent Germans who will be obeyed to forget their gods and beliefs, and their runic alphabets. And nothing will be told, of course, that can relate to the Occidental monastic institution where other cultures that can awake the suspicion that what occurred in Europe is a history repeated in other parts, the conclusion of a method of psychosocial strategy to exert the control of the human societies. Recently, after the ninth century, by the presence of the Arabs in Spain, and in the twelfth century, by the transculturation produced by the Crusades, some alert spirits warn the deceit, but there are few and will be too late to stop the golems. Saint Benedict, who was born in the year 480, found in 530 the model of Monte Cassino, and redacted in 534 his famous law that he received the instruction of the angels of the white fraternity. There are no doubts because his regula manicorum is a faithful reproduction of the regula magistri serpentiae. When he died in 574 and ascended to heaven through a path guarded by the angels, according to what witnessed many monks, the bases of the occidental monastasism were settled down. That was the moment largely awaited by the golems to bounce into the continental countries of Europe. In the 5th century, the Golems were predominantly concentrated in Ireland, and they started to infiltrate in the Catholic Church. One of them was St. Patrick, who was sent to the continent to study the Christian doctrine, and to make contact with members of the White Fraternity. He returns in 432, coming from Rome, invested of bishop, and with the papal authorization to evangelize Ireland. Immediately founded many monasteries, some of them really important as the ones of Armagh and Bangor, where would be celebrated the synods, and would exist religious schools, where the golems of Ireland and Great Britain would hurry to enter. The next 130 years since the death of St. Patrick in 462 until the departure of St. Columbanus in year 590 are employed by the golems to give form to the Church of Ireland, i.e. to organize its future continental settlement. The year 590 signalizes the historic moment in which the plans of the White Fraternity for the participation of the Golems begins to be rigorously executed. The place where the Golems will develop the College of Temples, Constructors is ready, are the monasteries of the Order of St. Benedict, and the Benedictine monk Gregory has been chosen Pope, who years before in Constantinople received the Order of the White Fraternity to convoke the Irish monks i.e., the Golems, to integrate them in the Order of St. Benedict. It must be remembered that in the year 589 was developed the Third Council of Toledo, where the King Ricard, by the influence of the Bishop of Seville, St. Leander, declares himself Catholic Roman, 
with the queen and all the court of the Visigoth kingdom. Therefore it must not surprise that the Golems were precipitated to Spain since that disastrous year 590. However, such reparation caused great shock to the Counts of Turdes Volter, who didn't expect to see the Golems again in the peninsula, at least while the Goth occupation took place. But such improvidence had its cause in the supposition that the Golems would remain pagan and would not submit to the Catholic Church. Such supposition was ingenuous, as the reality was in charge to demonstrate it prompt, because the Golems aspired to control the Catholic Church after their submission to it. The Counts of Turdes Volter, who also belonged to the Church, were Hispano-Gothic nobles, employed then all their influence to present the Benedictine expansion in the south of Spain. Objective that they totally achieved, the Golems, as is logic, would be established in the north of Spain, in the Celtic regions, from the Damian Monastery, neighbor of Braga in Lusitania, and others in Bezero, and in the end of Cantabria Asturian mountain range, denominated peaks of Europe. The Golems would undertake countless incursions in the Bedica, with a finality to destroy the House of Tarsus and steal the wise sword. A total secret war was fought since the 8th century, where the Golems, missionary monks, tried to approach the village of Turdus and the lords of Tarsus, executed them without mercy. But for each Benedictine Golem that disappeared, leaving no trail, or appeared murdered in the road by unknown hands, concurred two to replace him, obeying the House of Tarsus to maintain, as before, a permanent alert state. Experts in black magic and masters in every type of science would employ all they knew to localize the secret cave, and would always fail. At the end, they would ask for help to Bera and Bersha, as will be seen later. It is evident that the insertion of the golems in the Catholic Church not constitutes a motive enough to disqualify it completely. The reason is that the golems were introduced as a secret society inside of the church, and even if their intrigues comprised in more than one occasion the whole church, their plans were never declared openly nor officially assumed by them. On the contrary, in many other opportunities, really spiritual personalities, authentic Christians, had shown inside it. It is convenient to consider then, even though such distinction would not be always easy to determine, as though two churches existed superimposed. One, against which the lords of Tarsus fought, is the Gullum Church. I will denominate, as this in other parts, and its definition will be emerging from the history. The other is the Church of Christos, or just Church, where the lords of Tarsus belonged, and the Circulus Domine Canis, and where many of those who are for the spirit and against the potencies of the matter belong, for Christos Light, and against Jehovah Satan. One is the Church of the Betrayal to the Spirit of Men, and the other is the church of the liberation of the spirit of men. One is the church of the demon of the immortal animal soul, and the other is the church of the God of the eternal spirit. Sixteenth Day About the Benedictian of Pope Gregory I, the creator of the Gregorian chant, must be added two things. One is to stand out that the pressure exerted over St. Leander to influence and Ricard and achieve the massive entry of the Golems in Spain, only brought as a result that in the already existent monasteries was adopted the Regula Monacorum. And the other is to notice that his decision, taken in combination with St. Columbanus, Golem, to send in the year 596 the monk St. Augustine and the thirty-nine Benedictians to Great Britain, obeyed to the necessity to replace provisionally the Irish in the evangelizing task. Such departure carried the commitment to evangelize Anglos and Saxons that not long ago had conquered the island. According to St. Columbanus and the other Golems, those countries of very pure blood manifested natural predisposition against the Celts, and especially against the Irish, would respect only other Germans or the Romans. They would have to realize the task, because once evangelized, it would be time for the Golems to infiltrate and take control of the British Church. In the year 600, the Britwalda of Great Britain was the King Athelbert of Kent, whose wife, Princess of the Franks and Feverant Catholic, favors the conversion by the Romans of St. Gregory. Even though she had beside her a Frank bishop and some priests of her people, the success is great. The king and the population are baptized in Canterbury, was founded a Benedictine monastery with hierarchy of bishopric, then is followed by Essex, 
London, Rochester, York, etc. Forty years later, the Golems would be penetrating the Anglo-Saxon monasteries from the Celtic Scotland, supported by the King Oswald of Northumbria. Incorporated as masters in the Benedictine monasteries to the Golems would result easier to convince the Anglo-Saxons, already Christians, about the benignity of their intentions. However, for many years, the main voice will be occupied by non-Irish monks, just as the Greek Theodore of Tarsus and the Italian Hadrian. St. Betty the Venerable, dead in the year 735, takes the Benedictine monastery of Jaro to its highest grade of splendor. In workshops were taught the most different occupations, religious schools, monastic farms, copy and translation of documents, musical instruction, etc., from the Anglo-Saxon Benedictian monasteries would emerge an invaluable help for the plans of the Golems, in the person of the British missionary monks, who would be far better received than the Irish in the Germanic kingdoms, Bavaria, Thurginia, Hesse, Franconia, Friesland, Saxony, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, etc., would see passing through their lands the Anglo-Saxon monks. The majority exponent of this English Benedictian current was undoubtedly St. Boniface. He came from the Benedict Covenant of Nursling, and his real name was Winfrith. The Benedictian Pope Gregory II gave him the new name of Boniface in the year 718, with a mission to evangelize the Germans. The truth behind all this movement was that the Golems suspected that the Germans still conserved the Stone of Venus and other legacies of the White Atlanteans, and tried to find them at any cost. For this reason, St. Boniface, for example, is determined to knock down the ancient holm oak of the god Donar in Gismar in the year 722, trying to find the stone that the Germanic tradition situated in the roots of the trees. But this was not a work that the own St. Boniface would take personally in his hands, for it counted with thousands of Benedictian golems under his command. The famous Stone of Venus of the Saxons, which they finally lost, thousands of victims, attributed, then cynically, to the efforts of the Christianization. St. Boniface was not then a mere preacher, but a great executor of the plans of the White Fraternity. The Arc Gollum, hidden in the monasteries and the Benedictian popes, will reveal him these plans in form of directives that he will faithfully fulfill. One of the most fecund acts of these plans, for example, was the universal diffusion that impressed the idea of the superiority of the Bishop of Rome, the representative of St. Peter in the earth, over any ecclesiastical hierarchy or regal. Based on this idea will be settled down the power of the Pope's dominion in the early Middle Ages, and the papacy, the Benedictine papacy and Golems, it is understood, will respond, giving him the archiepiscopal pallium that will allow him to nominate his own bishops and complete the hierarchy of their priests. In the year 737 in Rome, he received from the hands of Gregory III the highest dignity, will be the papal legate in Germany, and will dispose of great powers to act. In such time Germany included the Frank kingdom, the most powerful of the European Christianity, while the nomination of St. Boniface had as objective to liberate his hands to carry out a plan so audacious as sinister, and the Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzantine Empire, the Patriarch of the Church, was normally submitted to the will of the Emperor. An Occident would be necessary to re-establish the imperial power, but founded in a relation of forces completely inverse. Here the Pope would dominate to the kings and emperors, the priest to the king, the knowledge of the cult to the wisdom of the pure blood, and the instrument for that plan, which allowed at the same time to accomplish the plans of the white fraternity and the Gullums, would be the next Frank family of the Pippinids. The Merovingian kings called themselves divine because they affirmed to descend from the liberator gods. For the Judeo-Christianity, which sustained with the Bible identical offspring of all the mortals from Adam and Eve, such origin didn't mean nothing. The only God was the Creator God, Jehovah Satan. And no one could arrogate his lineage. And out of the Judeo-Christian Creator, God only existed the superstition or the demons. Was then the issue of principles to eliminate some kings who not only declared to have divine lineage, but also affirmed to remember it with the blood. That entailment between the divinity and royalty, very popular among the Franks, was a troublesome obstacle for some priests who pretended to present themselves as the unique representatives of God in the earth. When Charles Martel died in the year 741, 
is succeeded by his sons, Carloman as mayor of Austrasia and Pippin as mayor of Neustrasia. Carloman, who later would retire to the monastery of Monte Cassino, gives to St. Boniface total liberty to reform the Frank Church according to the Benedictian rule. The rest would be made by Pippin. In few years, through a series of synods starting from 742 to 747, the whole Frank Church is brought under the control of the Benedictian order. Carloman and Pippin are also dominated by the order. St. Boniface communicates to Pippin the plan of the Golems, with the approval of the new Pope Zachary, King Childricry III, will be dethroned, the last of the divine Merovingian. In his place would be elected Pippin by the greats of the empire, and his nomination would be legitimized, analogously to the Old Testament, by the consent of the Pope and the anoint of St. Boniface. The payment of the new king for legitimize his encroachment would consist in a considerable booty, the creation of the papal states. But this reward would not curtail in nothing the power of the Frank kingdom due to it. Due to it would not be constituted at their expenses but to Lombard and Byzantines. Indeed, the Pope demanded as payment for his alliance with the Frank king some territories that had to be previously conquered. Concerted the arrangement, in November of the year 751, the King Childric III was confirmed in a Benedictine monastery, and Pippin the Short proclaimed king and was anointed by St. Boniface. In 754, the King Pippin and the Pope Stephen II met in the Pantheon, where they signed a treaty whereby the Franks were committed since then to protect the Catholic Church and to serve the throne of St. Peter. Thereby, in 756, the Franks donated to St. Peter the exarchate Venice, Istria, the half of the Lombard king, and the counties of Spleto and Benvento. With Pippin the Short is inaugurated the Carolingian dynasty, fundamental stone in the work of the white fraternity. In regard to what has been exposed, it is clearly perceived that the court and all the springs of the Frank state were occupied by the Benedictian order. Would not be difficult to imagine, then, in what type of ambiance would be educated their grandsons and family and what beliefs would be inculcated concerning to the old pagan religion of the Germans and their ancient gods. In consideration of all this, will have to be recognized the Charlemagne to have made all possible to become Judeo-Christian and to comply with the plan of the Golems. The fruit of the centuries of patient and reserved work obtained in the Benedictian monasteries could be observed in the Carolingian court, especially in the denominated Palatin schools. To this school concurred the emperor personally with his sons and daughters, his personal guard, and other members of the court. When listening, the lessons that were imparted by the wise Benedictians who arrived, in many cases, far from monasteries, from Italy came to Achaean Paul of Pisa, Paulinus of Aquila, Paul of Decon, etc. From Spain came one of the lords of Tarsus with the mission to spy the March the Golem's conspiracy bringing at their return discouraging news about the magnitude and depth of the enemy movement, was called Tewulfo of Tarsus, and was famous by his rites in the Palatine school, entitled De Spiritus Sancto Bellipotens. However, even by these provinces, the majority of the masters were Irish and Anglo-Saxon, that is, Golems and their henchmen. Among the last ones in covenant to mention the head of the Palatine school, and of the general diffusion that is from its part would be given to the Benedictine culture. I'm referring to Alcuin of York, disciple of the St. Buddy's School, the Venerable, who entered in the Palatine School in 781, and heads between 796 and 804, date of his death, the school of the monastery of St. Martin of Tours. His Scola Palantina is the focus called Carolingian Recognition, to which contributes effectively his works, of classic inspiration, Neoplatonic, and based in concepts of Prisian, Donato, Isidore, Bede, Bothius, just as Del Ration Anime, or their famous manuals that reigned for centuries the European education, grammar, de orthographia, de rhetorica, dialects, etc. From the Palatine school the ideas go forth for the Epistola de Literis Condelis, which resolutions approved by Charlemagne had the force of the law and ordained the creation in every monastery and cathedral of schools for priests and laymen. And these should be taught the trivium, the quadrivium, the philosophy and theology. The trivium and the quadrivium formed the called seven liberal arts, 
The trivium contained the grammar or philology, the rhetoric and dialect, the quadrivium, the astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, and music. Of course, the teaching of matters was in charge on the Benedictian monks, who had prepared to it for two hundred years and were the only ones disposed of enough masters in classic material to comply with the real order that they had inspired. And the Benedictians, Gollums, had very clear how should be educated the European minds to make possible the collective experimentation of the imperious necessity of the local temple in the coming times. So the College of Gollum Constructors, that soon would be in March, would erect temples of stone never before seen, magnificent cathedrals, constructions that would be really stone machines of swarthy Atlantean technology, and whose function would aim to transmute the mind of the believer and to adjust it to the collective archetype of the Hebrew race, which is the same of the Jesus Christ archetype. Alquin, who called himself Flaccus in honor of the Latin poet Horace, directed the Gollum cultural Benedictian circles that surrounded the emperor, and those cenacles was breathed a biblical and Judaic air very intense. The own Charlemagne demanded to be called David, and his loyal counselor Einhard, for example, asked to be named Bezaleel, by the constructor of the tabernacle of the Temple of Jerusalem, and the special microclimate, ambiented by the Benedictian Gollums. The emperor and his main collaborators of the Frank nobility were gradually brainwashed and conditioned to adopt the Gollum perspective about the order of the world. To preserve this order, for example, had to be eradicated paganism and imposed Judeo-Christianity on the whole world. That was the good, what demanded the law of God and what subscribed the representative of St. Peter. It didn't matter if to achieve that good had to be destroyed brother populations. God would forgive his followers all what was made in his name. The Gollums conditioned in this way the mind of the emperor, because they needed a new Perseus, a hero to execute the extermination sentence that was over the population of pure blood, of the Saxons, and would allow them to steal the stone of Venus. At least the Perseus populations of the Carthaginians that destroyed Tartessos a thousand years before belonged to the other race. The crime of Charlemagne and his Franks is inestimably greater because not conformed with the military support and the offensive ordained by St. Boniface against the Hyperborean wisdom of the Saxons, he undertook the work to exterminate the Saxon nobility in person, close brother of the Frank blood. The Saxon population was one of the last in the Occident who maintained uninterruptedly loyal to the Pact of Blood in the Liberator Gods. According to what they believed, the White Atlanteans had entrusted them the mission to protect the great secret of the White Race that from the sky fell over Germany thousands of years ago, during the Battle of the Atlantis, such secret was specifically mentioned in the myth of Navutan, to whom the Saxons called Wothan, as the Ring of the Kalachakra Key, where the traitor gods had engraved the sign of the origin, Freya Patridge had to release it before entering in the Moorbund, Navutan and his fall according to the wisdom of the Saxons. It occurred in Germany, specifically had fell over the rocks of the Exertine, a mountain located in the middle of the forest, Tetoberg Wald. The Saxons' beliefs sustained that the ring touched the rock at the same time in which Navutan resuscitated and acquired the wisdom of the language of the birds. This produced that the sign of the origin be decomposed in the thirteen plus three runes or runes, and these were impressed in the rocks of the Exertine forever. Over one of them, the most prominent, anyone with spiritual lineage will be able to see, for example, the most sacred rune of the White Atlanteans. The one that represents the great chief Navutan, that is, the Odal rune. But the Saxons not only knew, in that late date of the 8th century BC, the runes of Navutan, but they had achieved to preserve, just as the lords of Tarsus, their stone of Venus and the peak of the Exertine was erected since immemorial times, the Universalis Columna, Ermensul, a wood pillar that represented the tree of terror where Navutan had crucified himself to know the secret of the death. This sanctuary was venerated by the Germans since ancient times, and to avoid its profanation by the Romans in the year 9 AC, the Cherskusi, Chiftian Arminius, or Hermann annihilated the army of the general Publius Quintilius Verus, composed by 20,000 legionaries, and the proximities of Tuedelberg, Verus, and the main officials committed suicide after the disaster. 
The heroic Saxons would not have the same luck 700 years after, in front of an enemy overwhelmingly superior, and who manifested them an irrational intolerance similar to the one that Hamilcar Barca experimented against the Tartessians. Of course that, behind the intolerance of Charlemagne, must be seen, as in the case of Halmacar, the hand of the golems. The necessity, artificially implanted in the minds of those generals to comply with the extermination sentence. The sin of the Saxons was this. They occupied the forest and were committed to realize their mission with such effort that impeded for centuries the golems to get closer to the exorcine. But the worst was that they engraved thirteen plus three runic signs of the sacred alphabet in the Ehrman Souls column, and they embedded on its center the stone of Venus. In remembrance of the unique eye of Wothan, that looked to the world of the deceit from the tree of terror, the repulsion that the Saxons experienced for the Gullum priests, their irreversible rejection to Judeo-Christianity, their loyalty to the Pact of Blood and the Hyperborean Wisdom, their furious defense of the area of Tudorburg Wald, and their denial to give the Stone of Venus were enough motives to ordain the extermination of the Saxons' royal house, especially in that moment when the power of the Gullums was in its epigee. Only this explains the bloodthirsty persistence of Charlemagne, who for thirty years fought without truce against the Saxons, cultural population and military inferior to the Franks, and if it resisted was due to the indomitable courage that the spirit made sprout of their pure blood. In the year 772 the troops of the new Perseus fell on the Tudorburg Wald, and after a fierce struggle achieved to take the Exorcine and to give it to the Benedictine Gollum priests for its purification. They didn't delay to destroy the Immersa Column, and to steal the Stone of Venus, condemning since the Saxons from the darkness of the strategic confusion, the disorientation about the origin. However, even if they conquered the booty, was missing to comply with the sentence of the Gullums. In 783, in Verdun, Charlemagne, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, would make decapitate five thousand noble Saxons, whose pure blood would consume in the ritual sacrifice the unity of the Creator God Jehovah Satan, after a posterior resistance without hopes, by the only surviving rebel chief, Wittekind. The Saxons finished accepting the Judeo-Christianity as many other populations in similar circumstances, and integrated in the Frank kingdom. Charlemagne died in Aachen in the year 814, but in 800 he had already received from the Pope Leo III the consecration as Roman Emperor, fair payment for whom has served so much for the Church and for the cause of the Benedictine Order. He was succeeded as Emperor by his son, Louis the Pious, to whom his contemporaries nicknamed the Pious and the Monk, for his dedication to the Church and his preoccupation to put the Frank monks definitively under the power of the Benedictine Order. Just three years after his imperial coronation, he fulfilled that yen of the Golems in the Synod of Aachen of 817, where is agreed to impose the Benedictine rule in all the monasteries of the Frank dominions. That is, to what prompt would be the Roman Empire of the German nation, part of Spain, France, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Frisland, Italy, etc.? With the sanction of such imperial law, the power of the order was consolidated enough as to make that the golems could not think another thing, for the next two hundred seventy years, than to take the perfection of the College of Constructors of Temples. In the precedent, two hundred years they accumulated the knowledge of the science. Now they would pass to the practice. They would form guilds of constructors, composed by the learner lodges, mason fellow schools and masters, and such lodges would be alike integrated by common people, but directed in secrecy by the order, that will be the keepers of the plan and the codes of the temple, and would miss to dispose of a final key, a secret that would allow the golems to take their work to its major perfection. But the golems, and through them the Benedictine order, counted with the word of the white fraternity that such secret would be entrusted to them when their European mission would be almost accomplished. Such secret, such key of the keys consisted in the tablet of the law of Jehovah Satan, the ones that the Creator God gave to Moses in the Mount Sinai, and that made possible for Hiram, king of Tyre, the construction of the Temple of Solomon, the Temple of the Temples. There were engraved, through a sacred alphabet of twenty-two signs, the secret of the serpent, i.e., the highest knowledge that is permitted to be reached by the animal man the words that the God one employed to name all the things of the creation. With those tablets in his power, 
the Golems would be in conditions to erect the Temple of Solomon in Europe, complying in this way with the plans of the White Fraternity and elevating the Chosen People to the throne of the world. Naturally, before reaching to such wonderful realizations, the Benedictine Order would have to resolve many problems. In addition to start-up of the College of the Temple Constructors, would be necessary to create the conditions to make that the populations of the Roman Empire support the existence of a military order. Within the pale of Catholic Church, such order would have a double function. In one hand, to guard from the moment in which the White Fraternity would decide to give it to the Gullums, the tablets of the law from their actual location in Jerusalem to Europe and on the other hand, to serve as a support in the military force in the constitution of the financial synarchy, or concentration of the economic power, that would be necessary to establish in Europe as a previous step to the world government of the chosen people. Seventeenth Day To carry out the last part of the White Fraternity plans, it required a reform in the Benedictine monastic system. It was necessary above all, to concentrate the knowledge of the order and control from that center, the main cultural functions of Occident. And such reform would not delay, due to it was predicted beforehand, that's to say, it was a strategic alternative of the Golems. In the same ninth century when Charlemagne died and his dynasty was preparing to begin a struggle between factions for the pieces of the empire that would endure one hundred years, the change was already starting. In the year 814, Louis the Pious, the monk, gives all his support to St. Benedict of Anian for the foundation of a monastery in Aachen, where the Benedictian rule would be applied with the maximum rigor. Three years after such monk, who had been sent to Carolignian court by the Benedictian Pope Leo III, redacts and introduces the Capitular Monochorum and the Codex Regularum that would give initial foundation to the reform of the Benedictian order but will be in the tenth century when the objective of concentrating the knowledge of the order to end definitively with the occupation of the monastery of Cluny. The delay must be adjusted to the compatibility that such objective had to keep with the security of the secret of the order. The golems could not run the risk, in that point of the facts, of a failure for improvidence, because this Cluny's reform is only undertaken when is disposed of the security that it won't be interrupted. With the election of the Saxon Henry I, the Fowler, as Frank King and Emperor, in the year 919, entered in history the extraordinary lineage of the Ottomans and Salians, a pure blood that would reach to produce a Frederick II Hohenstaufen in the 13th century. The Hyperborean Emperor, who opposed with the power of the spirit to the most satanic representatives of the cultural pact. In the 10th century, that powerful lineage was dedicated with vigor to reorganize the realm, while the papacy falls in the major discredit due to the management effectuated by the families of the Roman nobility, especially the Theodore, Christesius, Tusculums, etc., the Benedictian order that had decided to take advantage of the moment to work secretly in the formation of the College of Constructors of Temples, is assured that no one would interfere in the operation of Cluny, is that precisely the chosen place to obtain knowledge fell over a French monastery by exclusive security reasons. A succession of papal bulls emitted during the 10th and 11th century, obeyed to the letter, by the dukes of Aquitaine and the kings of Burgundy, established the total independence of Cluny from any other authority except for the pope and his abbots. Neither the kings, nor the dukes or counts, nor the regional bishops could intervene in the issue of the monastery. Have you actually heard, Dr. Signigel, of certain secret bases that the great powers would have, for example, the Soviets or the North Americans? where they have gathered a great number of scientists of all specialties, provided with the most advanced instrumental means to plan in an integral form objectives of high reach, and that would depend directly of the president of some supreme council and act independently of any kind of national authority, apart from their own bosses or commanders? Well, Cluny was exactly the same in the 10th century. There is planned for a future Europe, Judeo-Christian, unified under the cathedrals and the Temple of Solomon, controlled by military order of the Church, administered by financial synarchy, and governed, finally, by the chosen people. Is Formasus, the same Benedictian Pope, whose unburied corpse was hurled in the Tiber by the Pope Stephen VI, follower of the Lambert of Spoleto, in vengeance because he crowned Emperor to Arnulfo, who had nominated Berno to carry out the great mission? Berno was a Benedictian monk of Burundian noble lineage, whose influence over Duke William I of Aquitaine was utilized to convince him about the convenience of founding the monastery of Cluny, 
In the year 910, the own Brno took the guidance of the monastery and gives birth to the concentration of the knowledge. There it collected the main books and manuscripts that the order had in different monasteries, and is constituted a Gollum elite dedicated to the copy of documents and the study of the sacred architecture. Of course, the Gollum elite, internally denominated cleric monks, would have to be occupied with exclusiveness of their works and to abandon the traditional Benedictian norm of sharing the works of maintenance of the monastery and the production of food. In this sense was reformed the Benedictian rule, and was created the institution of the laic monks to perform the honorable function to maintain the Gollums. During the command of the second abbot, St. Odo, the first fruits of the reform were at sight. First was diffused the fame about the asceticism, and the perfection reached by the Cluniac reform, what attracted the curiosity of other monasteries and caused the admiration of the people. Then groups of monks are sent specially trained to the monasteries that demand it, to initiate them in the reform. The members of the population were carefully selected to include them in the elite of cleric monks, or to put them in charge of the own works of the laic monks. They were inaugurated monasteries, submitted to the jurisdiction of Cluny, to those who were extended the rights of autonomy and independence. At that point, Cluny was a congregation by own right, and who more enthusiastically supported St. Odo with a papal bull in the year 932, and the Benedictian was Pope John the Eleventh, bastard son of the Pope Sergius the Third, and of Mariosa of Theodore, famous assassin of that age. After 150 years of activity, the Congregation of Cluny counted with 2,000 monasteries distributed mainly in France, Germany, and Italy, but also in Spain, England, Poland, etc. Without including the other thousands of Benedictine monasteries that have adopted the Cluniac reform, but that not depended on the abbot of Cluny, in the middle of the 11th century the order had achieved to transform effectively the European culture. Under the intellectual mantle of the Benedictians of Cluny have been formed the operative mason guilds that demonstrated their proficiency in the Romantic art of construction, and that they are ready to begin the Gaelic Revolution, misnamed Gothic. Behind that movement, naturally, is the secret college of temple constructors, but also has been achieved to plant in the heart of the feudal lords the seed of the sentimentalism, the repentance, and the Christian pietism. The sins increase more and more in the soul of the night and he requires of the alleviation of the sacerdotal confession, is accepted to disturb the warrior behavior by means of the peace of God and the truce of God. Determined by the priests, the German warriors were moralized with the Jewish principles of the law of God, the fear of the justice of God, etc. As a result of this emerges a special class of nobles and knights that, without losing their courage and audacity, but respectful of God and his representatives, are conditioned to outbreak blindly to any adventure that the church demanded. The plans of the white fraternity are being accomplished in all their parts, and the year 1000. After they had awestruck Europe with the proximity of the final judgment, the Gollums advanced a huge step when exposing to the German emperor their project of reconstruction of the Western Roman Empire with capital in Rome, and achieving that his acceptance to displace the capital of the empire from its German base. Although that project would not be accomplished, the idea was already proposed and would influence for 250 years in the imperial objectives of the German kingdom. The details of that plan were agreed between the King Otto the Great and the Gollum Pope Sylvester II, whose name was Gerbert of Aurillac. In that plan of the year 1000, and the compromise that assumed the emperor to fight against the unfaithfuls, especially against the Saracens of Spain, by a god's militia were clearly charted the concepts of the Crusades and the military orders 100 years before their realization. But the success of the plan responded, in any case, to the subjection of the emperor before the authority of the pope, the dominion that the church could impose over the naturally indomitable temperament of the German sovereign would be there where would be measured again the forces of the cultural pact against the unconscious remembrance of the pact of blood. For it, the Gollums would seat in the thrones of St. Peter, a Cluniac reformer of extreme fanaticism, the monk Hildeprand, who will pass to history as Pope Gregory the Seventh, the Pope who would humiliate the Emperor Henry the Sixth and Canossa before lifting him the excommunication, demonstrating with it the superiority of the spiritual power above the temporal power that's to say, sustaining the ancient falsification of the swarthy Atlanteans and the priests of the cultural pact. For the Hyperborean wisdom of the pact of blood, contrarily, the spirit is essentially warrior. Hence, the noble and warrior castes are spiritually superior to the priestly. 
but with the weakness of Henry the Sixth, the damage was already caused, and would be the turn of his descendants to fight against a Gollum papacy erected in director of the destiny of Occident. The Gollums never trusted, and would never trust in the Germans, apart from the establishment of the College of Constructors of Cluny, as indicated by their favorable behavior to the Lombard as the favorite executors of their plans, followed by the French. They, who not belonged, as was supposed, to the family of German populations, but to the Celtic tribes of Scandinavia. Ethnically different to the Norwegian Vikings, Swedish and Danish, had conquered a duchy in the north of France, Normandy, that was officially recognized by Charles the Simple in 911. By the Treaty of Peace pacted in the saint Claire de Soupt, the Duke Rollo was baptized and he accepted Christianity with his people, whose definitive evangelization was in hands of the Benedictine order. They didn't delay then to erect the monasteries in the Normandy and to remain, finally, all the Norman nobility under the influences of Cluny. One hundred and fifty years later, in 1066, the Duke of Normandy, William the Conqueror, seizes of England with the collaboration, unmasked betrayal, of the Benedictine Order of the Island. Thanks to him entered again in England the members of the Chosen People, who had been expelled in the year 920 by King Canut the Great, under the accusation of enemies of the state. The Pope was then the Benedictine Alexander II, but the minds that directed the maneuver are the Cluniac Gollum Hildeprind and Pedro de Manio. When he was succeeded in the papacy by his own Hildeprind or Gregory the Seventh in 1073, an impressive strip that descends from Ireland covers England, Normandy, Flanders, France, Burgundy, Italy, and ends in Sicily, is submitted to the direct influence of the Gollums from Cluny. In regard to Hildebrand, it is convenient to add a fact that must not be forgotten. His Jewish origin, Hildebrand indeed was great-grandson of Baruch, the Jewish banker who became Christian and who was the head of Paraloni's family, a lineage that influenced for centuries in the papal elections. Thanks to the money of the Paralonis, for example, Hildebrand had achieved the election of Alexander II, and his support for his own plans and the bank of Paralonis, of course, was very charitable, and its charity definitely had a direct beneficiary. The congregation of Cluny, where his brothers of race and the Gollums were preparing the world government of the chosen people. To put in action the plan of the Gollums will demand a preliminary attempt. That general proof of potentiality's verification will be the first crusade. In 1078, Gregory the Seventh and the major Gollum headquarter received two simultaneous news. The most important is the one that comes from the white fraternity where the immortals approve the end, the transfer to Europe of the tablets of the law, occulted for twenty-five centuries in Jerusalem, and the proximities of the Temple of Solomon. The other news comes from the Empire of the East, that is surrounded by a powerful military deployment of the Turks, who have already occupied Iran, Baghdad, Syria, Palestine, a great part of Asia Minor, and they have just appropriated from Jerusalem. These news make the Gollums decide about the form in which they will test their forces. They will preach the crusade, but, in principle, this won't aim to the main objective, but to a secondary. It will be divulged, the nightly Christian necessity to give support to the Byzantine church against the Turks. If such call gives the expected results, only then will be announced the duty to liberate a holy land. And only if this last claim is obeyed, only in this form, will be undertaken the mission of Jerusalem to seek for the key of the Solomon's temple, because it occurs that the recovery of the chosen people secret is not easy. If it was occulted for twenty-one centuries, it was not because no one would have searched and found it before, but due to its concealment was deliberate and careful, and it employed esoteric techniques. Its actual localization would demand the sending of a team of initiated priests and the acoustic and numeral Kabbalah to read and pronounce correctly the words that would open the secret lock and that team should go in the appropriate moment counting with the maximum security because from that operation would depend the success or failure of a systematically planned strategy for seven hundred years the synod of clermont of ten ninety five is employed by the gollum pope urban the second recent superior of cluny to call for a war against the unfaithfuls and to free the eastern church this war is, explained Urban II, a pilgrimage of armed knights. There would be special indulgences for those who take the cross, and so compliant would be the heavens with the crusade, that then will supervene an extraordinary period of peace of God. Peter the Hermit, popular preacher, gathers a multitude of a hundred thousand people lacking of military preparation and means, that will be exterminated soon. 
Otherwise, the army of Frank Knights, Flemish, and Normans caused the admiration of the Gullums, are enlisted on it. Godfrey of Bouillon, Lord of the Lorraine, with his two brothers Baldwin and Eustace, Robert of Flanders, Robert of Normandy, Raymond of Toulouse, and Norm Lord of Italy, Bohemond of Toronto, and Tancred. To this army could be requested, in first instance, the conquest of Jerusalem. After multiple difficulties own of the war, against a gallant enemy and religiously fanaticized, aggravated by the betrayals of the Byzantines, the Crusaders achieved the conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, three years after their departure from Europe, as founded there a Christian kingdom from which Godfrey of Bouillon was the first king. After that victory, the Golems would only employ thirty years to find the tablets of the law and transport them to Europe. Since then would begin the revolution of the Gaelic or Gothic revolution. Such step of the plan was developed with many parallel movements. In one side was needed to prepare an appropriated place to receive the tablets of the law, to cipher its message and find the manner to apply the knowledge of the serpent to the construction of the temples. In the other side was needed to send as soon as possible to Jerusalem the team of initiated golems that would be in charge to localize the secret, and also would be necessary to put immediately in march the formation of the military order that would sustain the financial synarchy that will have to be promptly created. If such movements ended in the proposed objectives by the white fraternity, then the world government of the chosen people would not delay, and the will of the Creator God one will be accomplished. The Benedictine monk Robert received in 1098 the order of retiring from the vicinities of Chateau. In the year 1100, once known the new of the capture of Jerusalem, the Pope Paschal II puts him in front of the Chateau Abbey and entrusted him the reform of the Cluniac rule. Over the base of the Regula Monacorum of St. Benedict, he and his successor Alberic introduced substantial changes in regard to Cluny. The monks returned to the manual work as insisted with more rigor the asceticism and loneliness, that is, in the secret, and the attire was changed. Thence, the Cistercians will not use the classic black clothing of the Cluniac and Benedictians, but a white one, similar to the ancient tunic of the Gollums from the Roman Gaul, and to the one of the Levite priests who guarded in Israel the Ark with the tablets of the law. In 1112 the community is ready to receive the group of initiates that will give them their definitive confirmation. There are thirty-one, Amongst them, St. Bernard, who was focused to found in Clairvaux, region of the Champagne feud of Earl Hughes, also from Gollum family, an adequate monastery to preserve the secret that would come from the East. Once finished with a pretext to effectuate translations of Hebrew texts, were convoked the main Kabbalistic rabbis from Europe to collaborate in the task of deciphering the tablets of the law. What a strange community of Chateau and Clairvaux! integrated by Gollums and Jews, while the whole of Europe was proclaimed Christian, before the populations of unfaithful from the East? At the death of St. Bernard existed 350 Cistercian monasteries, and at the end of the 13th century reached to be 700 in Europe. In this way was carried out the first movement. In regard to Cluny, in regard to Cluny, mustn't have to be believed that the foundation of the chateau and the expression of the order of the temple would rest him some power. Proof of it is the huge volume that the installations reached in the 13th century. For example, in 1245, with motive of the General Council Lion, gathered by the Gollums to excommunicate the Hyperborean Emperor Frederick II, a numerous retinue accompanied the Pope in his visit to Cluny, where they were accommodated easily without needing that the monks would have to abandon their cells. That's to say, that it possessed an infrastructure to accommodate a Pope an emperor, and a king of France, with all the prelates and lords of their courtages. Don't think that I'm exaggerating, Dr. Signigel. Apart from the Pope Innocent VI, were the two patriarchs of the Antiochia and Constantinople. Twelve cardinals, three archbishops, fifteen bishops, the king of France, St. Louis, his mother, Blanche of Castile, his brother, the Duke of Artois, and his sister, the emperor of Constantinople, Baldwin II the sons of the kings of Aragon and Castile, the Duke of Burgundy, six counts and a high number of lords and knights, its library counted with five thousand volumes copied by the friars, apart from the hundreds of manuscripts, scrolls, and books of antiquity that were unique pieces in Europe. Eighteenth Day In the year 1118, Finally, the nine golems found the key of Solomon's temple with the acceptance 
of the white fraternity. There are three initiated priests in charge of the localization of the tablets of the law, and six knights for custody. One of the initiates is the Earl Hugos of Champagne, in whose lands have been installed the Cistercian Order, who is relative of the King Baldwin of Jerusalem and flattened without difficulties the occupation of the demanded site. It is the traditional emplacement of the Temple of Solomon. Its residence for many years in that place would mean to them the name of Knights of the Temple that they adopted later. Although they preferred to call themselves the only guardians of the Temple of Solomon, finally, after searching a long time, meditate, reflect, and comprehend the nature of the secret, and count it also with the help of the angels of the White Fraternity, the Templars were in condition to find the Ark and when the secret reached to their hands, and they were preparing to escort it to Europe, Bera and Bersha joined them. The same immortals that murdered the Vrayas of the House of Tarsus. From Chang Shambhala, the White Fraternity sent Bera and Bersha to accompany the transport of the Ark of Clairvaux, and ensure this to reach without problems. Once there, they would try to seize the wise sword, and to resolve the pending accounts with the House of Tarsus. I will suspend for a moment the relation of the consequences that this new apparition of the immortals would produce for the lords of Tarsus. The most important now is to stand out that in the year 1128 the Ark is installed in Clairvaux, in power of the highest dignitaries of the synagogue and the Gollum Church, and the heart of the College of the Constructors of Temples. In this way was developed the second movement. The triumphal result of both movements motivated the Golems to act immediately with the third. The six knights that have transported the Ark are in the Champagne, with Bera and Bersha who are still in Clairvaux instructing the College of Constructors, and was agreed to constitute them in the Cavalry Order. With that secret purpose, St. Bernard convoked in 1128 a Council of Troyes, and the region of Champagne where the Benedictian and Cistercian clerics assisted in their totality bishops, abbot priors, all of the monasteries of the order, who come conscious of the importance of the event and want to watch closer the terrible immortals, Bera and Bersha, who are also present. And the Council of Troyes is approved the formation of the Order of the Temple, and was entrusted to St. Bernard the redaction of its rule. This will be a monastic rule, basically Cistercian, but completed with norms and dispositions that regulate the military life. In front of the order will be a great master, he will only depend from the Pope. The mission of the order will consist in two form, an army of knights to fight in the East and Spain against the Saracens. In Occident, the order will possess properties suitable to practice the monastic life and offer military instruction. The order of the temple will be authorized to receive every type of donation, but the knights will have to practice the vow of poverty, etc. During the rest of the twelfth century, the order grows in every aspect, and in the 13th, a real economic and military power subjected, and until certain point, to the authority of the Church. Due to the occult objective of the Crusades was to obtain the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah Satan with the chosen people, and such objective was already achieved. It is evident that the maintenance of the Holy War had no other purpose than to strengthen the order of the Temple and the Church. The next Crusades indeed allowed the popes to demonstrate their power above the kings and nobles, and to the order of the temple to increase their riches. In this way, the papacy reached its highest grade of prestige, and could summon the kings of France, England, or Germany to cross with Christ, our Lord, and with luck even achieve to eliminate some potential enemy of their plans for the European hegemony. As the Emperor, Frederick Barbarossa, for example, who never returned from the Third Crusade, and while the war continued and the Army of the East was professionally improving and turned indispensable in all its operations, the Order was constructing a formidable economic and financial infrastructure. It was said that such power served to sustain the Crusade of the Templar Knights, but in reality, it was assisting to the foundation of the financial synarchy. The order soon developed over the base of their countless properties in France, Spain, Italy, Flanders, etc., a banking network which operated with the newest system of the promissory note, invented by the Jewish bankers of Venice, and their central seat was in the house of the Temple of Paris, real bank, provided of treasure and strong chamber. Naturally, they practiced the loan with interests to nobles and kings, which owed amount. 
and other very advanced documents for the period were kept in coffers of the order. Among other responsibilities, they had entrusted the administration of the funds of the church and the tax collection for the crown of France. The Templars occupied in Spain many sites. Within them was Monzon Castle, which after the death of Alfonso I, the battler, was given to them in property. From there, they fought against the unfaithful, according to the rule of the order. Such fortress was located in Huesca, on the shores of the river Cinca, in that time kingdom of Aragon, and Bera and Bersha went thither. After the Council of Troyes, accompanied by an important entourage of Cistercian monks, the immortals were going to realize a secret Gollum council, and which would remain established the directives for the next hundred years, date in which they would ask for accounts again about the fact. In that council, apart from the details of the Gollum plan that I have described, the immortals proposed, in the name of the White Fraternity, two issues that had to be resolved as soon as possible. It was about two extermination sentences. One, against the House of Tarsus, was still pending since long time ago. The other, against the Cathars, and Albigenesis, of the Languedoc, was recently and had to be executed immediately. About the House of Tarsus, the immortals admitted that it was a difficult case, because it was not possible to fulfill the extermination without finding before the Stone of Venus that they had occulted in a secret cave. With the purpose to achieve the confession of the key to find the secret entrance, Bera and Bersha decided to attack this time to the members of the family that were inhabiting the neighboring city Zaragoza. There were three persons, the Bishop of Zaragoza, Lupo of Tarsus, his widow's sister, Old Now, who lived with him in the bishopric and was in charge of the home issues, Lamia of Tarsus and her son, a young novice of fifteen years called Rabaz. The three of them were kidnapped and taken to Monzon, where they were locked in a dungeon while the torture instruments were prepared. They started with the old man Lupo, to whom they wildly tormented without obtaining a single word about the secret cave. Finally, and even if he had the majority of his bones broken, Lupo of Tarsus died, as the lord he was, smiling with irony in front of the impotence of his assassins. With the woman and his son, the golems employed another tactic. Considering that they would be quite frightened by the screams of the bishop, they prepared a convenient scene to extort the young rabbis, with the threat of subjugating his mother to the same degrading torment that had finished with the life of Lupo of Tarsus. Hence they extended Lamia over the torture table and started to stretch her limbs, producing frightening screams of pain. In that moment they made enter rabbis, who came with tied hands on his back and escorted by two Cistercian golems, who remained frozen of terror at the listening the laments of Lamia, and discovering her tied to the mortal table, and when seeing him paralyzed of horror, a triumphal smile was drawn on the countenance of the golem, who counted by in advance with the confession. But what they didn't count with, nor then, was the mystical madness of the lords of Tarsus. Oh, the madness of the lords of Tarsus! that had turned unpredictable for hundreds of years of persecutions, and that was manifested as the absolute courage of the pure blood, a courage so high that resulted inconceivable any weaknesses before the enemy. Without being able to avoid it, the young Rabas, impulsed by a mystical madness, made two leaps, and he situated beside his mother, who was looking him with a shiny gaze. And then, with just one slash, he smashed her left jugular vein, causing her a fast death by bleeding. Now the golems were not laughing when they were dragging Lamia, nevertheless someone laughed. Before she died, Lamia reached to Emmet, an ironically belly laugh, whose echoes remained many seconds reverberating in the meanders of that gloomy prison. And Rabaz, who had just killed her and had his face covered with blood, was smiling, relieved, when proving that Lamia not existed any more. No, the golems were not laughing. They were really pallid of hate. Was evident that the will of Rabaz could not be bowed down by any mean. But not for it. They would not stop to torture him into death. They would make it even if it would only be to relieve the rancor that they experimented against the lords of Tarsus. Bera and Bersha didn't achieve anything with such bloodshed, and due to this they left to the Cistercian and specific mission to be fulfilled in the next years by the Order of the Temple. No matter the cost, even if that implicated to get engaged in a permanent struggle against the Tafia of Seville, but had to be constructed a castle of Aracena, a few kilometers from the village of Turdus. The exact place would be the one known since antiquity as the Cave of Odiel, today called Cave of the Miracles, whose name meant evidently Cave of Odin or Wothan. 
but that was also denominated Cave of Dedalus, due to the deformation of the Cave Dodal. Naturally, Dedalus, the constructor of labyrinths, was other of the names of Nabutan. The entrance of the Cave of Odiel was located at the ground level, and the peak of a hill of Erecina. The plain consisted in to edify a Templar castle to occult the Cave of Odiel. The entrance, since then, would only be accessible from inside of the castle. Why they would need that? To reach to the secret cave of the lords of Tarsus, because according to what Bera and Bersha believed, from the cave of Odiel would be possible to approximate the secret cavern employing certain techniques that they would put in practice at their return from Changshambala. Nineteenth Day in sum, Dr. Signagel, it can be considered that when the 13th century came, the Golems had realized the plans of the White Fraternity in a 90%. The Benedictian Golem Order and its derivations, Cluny and Cistercian and the Temple, were firmly established in Europe. The College of Constructors of Temples had acquired, with the possession of the Tablets of the Law, the highest knowledge. The Guilds and Brotherhoods of Masons, instructed by the Golem, were elevating hundreds of temples, churches, and Gothic cathedrals in all the important cities of Europe and in certain places that some Telluric values were considered, and the populations from the servants and villainous and even the lords, nobles, and kings lived in an age of religious mores, sustained a culture where God and the priests of God intervened active and daily. It means the populations that now experimented the religious unity were prepared to receive the economic and political unity of a world government. The synarchy of the chosen people, the economic power of the order of the temple was already consolidated, and the army of the church that would assure the political unity as well. As you see, Dr. Signagel, the plans of the white fraternity were just to be accomplished, and notwithstanding that they failed. What happened? The plans of the white fraternity failed fundamentally thanks to two kings, Frederick II Hohenstaufen, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and Philip IV, the Fair, King of France. Both reigned in different countries and in different historic periods, and they didn't meet each other. Frederick II in Sicily, since 1212 until 1250, and Philip IV in France, since 1285 until 1314. However, an occult nexus explains and justifies the highly strategic acts deployed by those extraordinary monarchs, is the opposition of the Hyperborean wisdom. So we have two exoteric causes of the failure of the enemy plans, the mentioned kings and an esoteric cause, the opposition of the Hyperborean wisdom, from which they are just effects. I will examine then superficially the first, and I will focus in detail the second. It is convenient to do it within this form to expose the prominent role that the House of Tarsus had in those facts. It will be necessary to start, of course, to discover the circumstances that gave place to coronation of Frederick II and the acts that he utilized to destabilize the power of the papacy. Then I will stop to show the real causes of these facts. This is the opposition of the Hyperborean wisdom. It will be seen, thus, how the lords of Tarsus developed their strategy and how they were almost exterminated by the golems in the middle of the 13th century. Finally, I will reach to the management of Philip IV, the king who applied the mortal strike to the financial synarchy of the Templars. Thence, Dr. Signagel, all will be given to produce that the history of the House of Tarsus that I am narrating for you enters in its final phase. With the election of the Pope Innocent III in 1198, the Golems played one of their last and most important cards. Such pontiff, in fact, enjoys a peerless prestige amongst the indocile German nobility. The kings were submitted to his free will, and his will was imposed without resistance in every ambit. Otherwise, he doesn't worry too much and dissimulate his plans due to he proclaimed openly the validity of the theory of Gregory the Seventh concerning to the two swords, from which one the temporal of the emperor must be submitted to the spiritual of the church. Well, this pope, who has in his hands all the triumph of the Golems, is also the tutor and regent of the young Prince Frederick of Sicily, principal inheritor of the Austrian and German Hohenstaufen, is in that prince where the Golems and the white fraternity have supported all the weight of their strategy. Frederick, educated as a Cistercian monk, and Templar knight by the Golems of the Norman court, of his mother Constance of Sicily, 
would have to wield with a vigor never seen since the times of Charlemagne, the temporal sword of the kings, and to submit it to the spiritual sword of the church. Then the spiritual sword, which is the cross of Jesus Christ and the plan of the temple, would be the settlement of the world's throne, a seat for the Messiah of the Creator God or His representatives. But is in this moment when Frederick rebelled early against such plan. Frederick II is crowned German king in 1212, with the auspice of Innocent III, and the manifested approval of Philip II, Augustus, King of France. In principle, he made what was expected from him, and in 1213, with only 18 years, he promulgated the Golden Bull in favor of the Church, and which was confirmed the totality of his territorial possessions, inclusive those improperly appropriated, after the death of Henry VI. He accepted also to renounce as another future German king to the election of bishops and abbots. It is evident, then, the initial predisposition of the young king to comply with the plans of the Gollum Church. However, promptly such attitude began to change, until it became totally hostile to his old protectors. The reasons were two. The positive reaction of his pure-blood heritage, thanks to the historical proximity of the Grail, concept that I will explain later, and the influence of certain Hyperborean initiates that the own Frederick II made come to his court of Palermo from further countries of Asia, and whose history I won't be able to stop and relate in this letter. The important was that the emperor started to refuse from the Gollum's idea, which was being amply published by the Benedictine order, that the world had to be reigned by a theocratic messiah, a priest placed by the creator God above the kings of the earth. Contrarily, affirmed Frederick II, the world was awaiting an imperial messiah, a king of the pure blood, who would impose his power by the unanimous recognizance of the lord of the earth, a king that would be the first of the spirit, and who would found an aristocracy of the pure blood, in which would only have places the brave ones, the noblest, the hardest, those who didn't bow down before the cult of the potencies of the matter. Frederick the Second naturally felt called to occupy that place. The doctrine that Frederick the Second expressed with great clarity was the synthesis of an idea which has been developing among the members of his lineage since the Emperor Henry the First, the Fowler. In principle, such idea constituted the intuition that the real power was legitimized only by an aristocracy of the spirit, which was connected to the blood. Then it was evident, and due to this was becoming firmer, that if the king was legitimate, his power could not be affected by the forces of another order, if there were not spirituals. Sovereignty was spiritual, and therefore divine. Only to God corresponded to intervene with justice above the will of the king, this concept was essentially opposed to that sustained by the Golems, and the sense that the Pope represented God above the earth. Hence, corresponded to him the subjugation of the will of the kings. The Pope Galasius I, already in 492 to 496, had declared that existed two independent powers, the spiritual church and the temporal state, against the dangerous idea that had been developing in the lineage of the Ottomans and Salians, St. Bernard formalized the Galassian thesis and the theory of the two swords. According to St. Bernard, the spiritual and temporal power are analogous to two swords. But as the spiritual power comes from God, the temporal must be submitted to the spiritual sword. Ergo, the representative of God in the earth, the Pope, wielding the spiritual sword, must impose his will above the kings, mere representatives of the temporal state and just keepers of the temporal sword. Even by the endeavor committed by church to impose the threat, the idea was maturing and starts to produce collisions between the king's more spirituals and the representatives of the potencies of matter. The investiture controversy, starred by the Emperor Henry IV, ancestor of Frederick II, and Gollum Pope Gregory VII, signalizes the culminating phase of the satanic reaction. In the year 1077, the emperor, Henry IV, is obeyed to be humiliated before the pope in Canossa, to obtain the lifting of his previous excommunication. If he would have not accepted to that supplication, Henry IV would have been despoiled of his imperial investiture, and also of the sovereignty of his hereditary signiories, by the simple spiritual will of the pope. Naturally, an idea that emerges from the blood and becomes clearer and stronger after every generation can't be repressed with penances and humiliations. Will be Frederick I Barbasoa, the grandfather of Frederick II, who will be opposed with more vigorously to the papal tyranny 
and will demonstrate that the existence of the aristocracy of the spirit was more than an idea. For then, the idea had taken force and had many devotees disposed to defend it with their lives. They were called Gibellines, name derived from the castle of Wainbligen, where was born Frederick I. The reaction of the church against Frederick I polarized the family of his mother Judith, descendants of Welfs, Duke of Bavaria, staunch follower of the Pope, from where comes the name of Welfs, given to his believers. Thereby, even the brainwash and clerical indoctrination that was submitted to Frederick II in the years when he remained under the tutelage of the fierce Innocent III, nothing could avoid that the voice of his pure blood revealed him the truth of the uncreated spirit, that his divine heritage would transform him in the alive expression of the aristocracy of the spirit, and the universal emperor. Before his departure to Palestine in 1227, Frederick II had become into man of stone, and Hyperborean pontiff, and he had remembered the pact of blood of the white Atlanteans, and he decided to fight with all his forces to revert the order of the European society that was based in the unity of the cult, that is, in the cultural pact, in favor of the pact of blood. The solution chosen by Frederick II consisted in to undermine the imperial unity of that time, which monarchies were totally conditioned by the church, conceding the major possible power to the territorial lords. They would be, of course, the ones who would recognize with their pure blood the real spiritual leader of Occident, who would come to establish the universal empire of the spirit. Otherwise, the Gollum Church, in front of the growing power of the princes, would only see the disintegration of the political unity that was so necessary for their world domination plans, a political unity that had been edified over the base of countless crimes perpetrated through centuries of intrigues and shenanigans that had been projected in the secret of the Benedictian and Cistercian monasteries, that had been imposed in the credulous and fearful minds of the nobles by means of the threats of the loss of heaven, the excommunication, the terror, and every kind of unworthy sources. The political unity controlled discreetly by the church, that now disposed of a powerful bank and a military order, would result fatally destabilized by Frederick II. In 1220, when he was still obeying the plans of the Golems, Frederick II conceded to the ecclesiastical princes the rights to regulate the commercial traffic in their territories and to decide about it fortification. However, in 1232, he bestowed the same rights to the territorial lords, apart from authorizing them to complete jurisdiction of their counties. In the practice, this meant that issues as the currency, market, justice, the police, and the fortifications remained forever subjected to the power of territorial lords, not having the king, neither the pope, any executive power in their respective countries. After the death of Frederick II in 1250, the Gollum Church would never get another similar chance to comply with the plans of the White Fraternity. In Germany will supervene the Intergenum, during which the territorial lords will become more and more powerful and independent, and in France will govern Philip IV, the Fair, who will conclude with the work of Frederick II, proceeding to annihilate the order of the temple and to dismantle the infrastructure of the financial synarchy. As second cause of the failure of the Gollum plan, the main cause, the esoteric cause, I have mentioned the opposition of the Hyperborean wisdom. With such denomination I am referring, logically, to the conscious opposition that certain sectors carried out against the secret intrigues of the Gollums and their Cistercian and Templar organizations. These sectors that comprehended the Hyperborean wisdom contributed in a significant manner to determine the Gollum failures were many groups, but amongst the main ones I will cite the Bogomils in Italy, the Cathars in France, and the Lords of Tarsus in Spain. The Lords of Tarsus had become strong in Spain, in the Muslim region as in the Christian. In Tertus they conserved their bishopric and the property of the village, where a part of the family remained all the year. In Cordova and Toledo always lived the clerics that were dedicated to the teaching, and in Catalonia and Aragon, and inclusive in many European countries, dwelled those who were theologians and doctors and received the invitation of some lords to officiate as counselors or to instruct the royal families. But wherever they were, the lords of Tarsus never forgot their destiny, and all their efforts were dedicated to obey those two principles sworn by the men of stone, to preserve the wise sword and to comply with the familiar mission. Their priority was then to survive, but to survive as a lineage, 
would obey to maintain themselves permanently informed about the enemy strategy due to one of the strategic objectives declared by the enemy demanded, precisely, the extermination of the House of Tarsus. In the 13th century, the Lords of Tarsus had perfectly clear the plans of the White Fraternity, and they knew how closer were the Golems to fulfill them. To oppose to those plans without risking the security of the lineage, the Lords of Tarsus comprehended that they needed to work protected by an order of the Church, an order that, naturally, would not be controlled by the Golems, neither reigned by the Benedictian rule. Of course, such order not existed. The honor to found it and save by its mediate the healthier part of Christianity, would correspond to St. Dominic. Twentieth Day Since this day I will examine Dr. Signagel, the Cathar issue. The most significant of the productions of the Hyperborean wisdom that opposed to the plans of the White Fraternity in the 13th century was in the context of Catharism, when St. Dominic founded the order of preachers that would allow to the lords of Tarsus to act covert. It is necessary, then, to describe such context to make that the searched objective by St. Dominic and the lords of Tarsus results clear. After all, it should be noted that to qualify the Catharism of heresy, it is as absurd as to do with the Buddhism or the Islam. As these, Catharism was another religion, different to the Catholic. Heresy is, by definition, dogmatic error about the official doctrine of the Church. It is not heretic who profess another religion, but who distort or awry interpret the Catholic dogma, just as Arius, or the own Templar Golems, who were the most satanic of their age. Of course, that even though then would have been accepted that the Cathars practiced their religion as the Saxons, they would have not meant any difference in the result. Nothing could save them from the extermination sentence of the Golems. Heretics were undoubtedly the Arians, but would not be the Cathars. They were effectively enemies of the Church, which they called the Synagogue of Satan. To comprehend the problem, it must be considered that what the Cathars really knew was the Hyperborean wisdom, which they taught using symbols taken from Mazdaism, Zervanism, and Gnosticism, the Judeo-Christianity, etc. Hence, they preached that the good was of absolute spiritual nature— and that it was totally out from this world. The spirit was uncreated and eternal, and it came from the origin of good. The evil, on the contrary, had as nature all the material and created. The world of the matter, where the animal man live, was intrinsically malignant. The world had been created by Jehovah Satan, a demonic demiurge. They rejected, therefore, the Bible that was the word of Satan. And they specially denied the Genesis where was narrated the act to create the world by the demon. The Roman church that accepted the Bible was then the synagogue of Satan. The abode of the demon, the animal man created by Satan, had two natures, the material body and the soul. To them had been attached the uncreated spirit, which remained, thenceforth, prisoner of the matter. The spirit, unable to free itself, resided in the soul, and the soul animated the material body, which was immersed in the evil of the material world. The spirit was then sunk in hell, condemned to the pain and suffering that Jehovah Satan imposed to the animal man. The Cathars, that's to say, the pure men, had to pretend the good. That meant that the spirit had to return to its origin, abhorring previously the evil of the material world. They assured that the Holy Spirit was always disposed to help the prisoner spirit in the matter, and that responded to the request of the pure men. Thereby, the Cathars had the power to transmit the Holy Spirit to the necessitous of help by means of the laying on of hands, act which they denominated consolamentium. They affirmed also the existence of an eternal and uncreated Christos, who they called Lucibel, who used to descend voluntarily to the hell of the created world to liberate the spirit of men. They denied the cross for constituting a symbol of the spiritual incarceration and human suffering. They were staunch iconoclastic, and they not admitted any form for the representation of the spiritual truths. They practiced the poverty and ascetism, and distressed it of the riches and material goods, especially if they proceeded from people who call themselves religious. They sustained that the highest virtue was the comprehension and expression of the truth, and that the major error was the acceptance and propagation of the lie. They reduced the elementation to the minimum and recommended not to abuse from sex. They prohibited the procreation of sons due to it contributed to perpetuate the incarceration of the spirit and matter. 
It is evident, Dr. Signigel, that the concepts as the Cathar religion not came from a Catholic heresy, but from the Hyperborean wisdom. However, who didn't know such filiation or were fanaticized and controlled by the Gullums, were not difficult to convince them that it was treating about a diabolical heresy, especially if the gaze was directed on the exterior form of the Catharism, because the Cathars with a declared finality to compete against the Catholics for the favor of the people, they had also organized as a church. The reason of this decision that will face them in a disadvantageous manner was with a Catholic Europe already conditioned by the idea that it was legitimate to mount military crusades against populations that professed another religion, has to be searched in the ancestral beliefs of the Aquitanian population. Undoubtedly existed connections between the Cathars and the Bogomil Manichians of Bulgaria, Bosnia, Dalmatia, Serbia, and Lombardy. But those contacts were natural between populations or communities that shared the heredity that shared the heredity of the Hyperborean wisdom and not involved any dependence. The Catharism was rather a local product of the country of OC, a medieval fruit of the Iberian racial trunk, the ancient Iberian population of Ak, as the one from Tarsus, not suffered much Celt influence. The contradistinction to the Iberians from the regions of the Hispania and from the Gauls that were racially confused with them and fell promptly under the power of the Gullums. In Ak, the Gauls didn't achieve to ally with the Iberians, even if they dominated the region for centuries with great displeasure of the Gollums who would appeal to all their resources to broke their racial purity. However, the Akatans would mingle then with more related populations in similar manner to the Tartessians, especially with the Greeks, the Romans, and the Goths. In a remote past, the White Atlanteans had communicated them the same wisdom of their brothers in the Iberian Peninsula, to include them in the Pact of Blood. So they possessed their own Stone of Venus, and they lost it in the hands of the Gollum when the priests of the Cultural Pact favored the invasions of the Volcae, Tectosages, and Erosomiasis, and Barbasis, Velavi, Gabali, Helvi, apart to install themselves on the Mediterranean coast with the Phoenicians and their colonies in Agd which was later called Port of Astarte. Well, apart from what I have already remembered about the Iberian wisdom of the Pact of Blood, it must be added here a particular legend which was quite diffused among the Pyrenees. According to it, the White Atlanteans had deposited in a cavern of the region another stone of Venus that they called the Grail of Christos Lucifer, such stone that the envoy of the unknowable god brought not now to reflect the sign of the origin to a few initiates, but to connect charismatically and to liberate spiritually a whole racial community, would be only found in determinate historical moments. They believed that the motive was the next, the grail constituted a tabula regia imperialis, that's to say, the grail informed with exactitude who was the king of the pure blood to whom corresponded to govern the people by the virtue of his spirituality and racial purity. But the Grail had the power to reveal the leadership, communicating it charismatically in the pure blood of the race. It was not necessary, the physical presence of the Stone of Venus, to hearken the message. However, if the racial community forgot the Pact of Blood, if they fell under the soporific influence of the cultural pact, or they degraded their pure blood, then they would lose the charismatic connection would disconcert and would fail to choose their racial leaders, would come bad kings, weak or tyrants, perchance priests of the cultural pact, who in any case would lead the people to their racial destruction. Nevertheless, even when the people could be dominated by the cultural pact, the Hyperborean heritage of the pure blood could not be easily eclipsed, and in certain moments of history would occur a non-causal culturally coincidence that would put to all the members of the race in a charismatic contact with the grail. Then all would know, without doubt, who would be the leader of the race. It was about a double action of the grail. In one hand, revealed to the people who was the real leader of the pure blood, without being necessary to affect the social situation. That's to say, if he was noble or commoner, rich or poor, if the leader existed, all would know who he was. All would recognize him simultaneously. And on the other hand, underpinned the leader in his guiding mission, connecting him with charismatically the members of the race in virtue of the common origin. In the origin, all the race of Hyperborean spirits would be united, due to the grail, precisely would be a reflection of the origin. By the grace of the grail, the racial leader would appear before the people, provided with an evident charisma, undeniable and irresistible. He would exhibit clearly the power of the uncreated spirit, and would give proofs of his racial authority 
and that could not be another way due to, by the origin, they would return to be at the command of the great chief of the spiritual race, the lord of the absolute honor and of the uncreated beauty, Christos Lucifer or Lucibel. The becoming of history, the inexorable advance of the populations culturally dominated by the strategy of the white fraternity, in direction to the darkness of the Kali Yuga, would produce that the manifestation of the potencies of the matter would become stronger in every moment. Hence, the racial leaders would emerge eventually from the people, should demonstrate a stronger spiritual power to face those demonic forces. The consequence of this would be that the confrontation between the emergent spirituality of the racial purity and the degradation of the materialistic culture would be turning more and more intense until to reach, naturally, to a final battle, where the conflict would be resolved definitely. That would coincide with the end of the Kali Yuga. Meanwhile, would come those moments in history in which the grail could be found again and would reveal the leader of the race. Of course, that in the last millenniums, for being the race more and more sunken in the strategy of the cultural pact, the success of racial leaders would have to be consequentially more powerful. In other words, they would have to be imperial leaders, wise warriors that would try to found the universal empire of the spirit. Who could achieve it would liberate the population from the strategy of the cultural pact, of the priests of the cult, and from every cult would build a society based on the aristocracy of the pure blood and the lords of blood and the earth, as the one which wisely would have tried to impulse Frederick II Hohenstaufen. And here we reach the occult cause of the Cathar expansion in the 12th century. In that time existed the widespread conviction amongst the Octanians, incomprehensible for whom lacked of racial purity and did not know the Hyperborean wisdom that was just to come, or had already come, one of those moments of history in which would emerge the racial leader, the universal emperor of the spirit in the pure blood, was a common presentiment that sprouted from an inner fiber and united everyone in the security of the regal advent. And that spontaneous unity was the cause of deep social transformations. It seemed as if all the efforts of the people would have suddenly coordinated in a combined spiritual enterprise, and a project which permanent realization was the generation of the brilliant civilization of Ock. The poetry, the music, the dance, the choral singing, the literature reached their great splendor, while was developing a romance language of exquisite semantic precision, very different from the more Iberian idiom of the Eastern Franks, was the language of Oc, or Langua de Oc, which gave name to the country of Languedoc. And the structure of the rising civilization, as one of their fundamental elements, would appear the Catharism, that would not be a Catholic heresy any more, as the Gollum Church pretended, nor a religion transplanted from Asia Minor, as others pretended. On the contrary, the Catharism was the formal expression of the relegation that existed a priori to the Octanian society, was the grail that everyone believed who regulated the Octanian society and constituted the fundament of the Cathar religion. But the grail, when communicating the next advent of the universal empire, announced also the war, the inevitable struggle that its presence would declare to the potencies of matter, perhaps the final battle if the times were ready for it. The historical moment of the apparition of the grail demanded a special predisposition of the people to face the crisis that would fatally occur was the time of the spiritual awakening and the material renouncement, to discern clearly between the whole of the spirit and the knot of the matter. Now you will understand, Dr. Signigel, why the Cathars were organized as a church, and they dedicated to preach openly the Hyperborean wisdom. They were preparing the people for the historical moment. They were strengthening their will to acquire the state of grace that the times required. If the universal emperor came— was necessary to count with profoundly spiritual men, keepers of the Hyperborean wisdom, and transmuted by the remembrance of the origin, by the revelation of naked truth of himself, i.e., would be needed men of stone. For this reason the Cathars formed and distributed thousands of charbodors, initiated in the cult of the cold fire of the house of Tarsus. They had the mission to go around the country and turn on in the noble of blood, noble or commoner, rich or poor, the flame of the cold fire, the love of the goddess Pyrene, who they called just as the lady or the wisdom, and the nobles of the blood, if they understood the trobol clause. They became in wedded knights with their sword, a rune of Navutan, that in some opportunities they consecrated to a lady of flesh and bones, 
a caliber woman who is able to immortalize them beyond the infinite blackness of his signal of death. 21st Day The urgency of the times had obeyed the Cathars to expose themselves openly, act that would cause, earlier or later, the inevitable attack of the Catholic Church. The Benedictians, Cluniac and Cistercians, started very soon to elevate their protests. Already in 1119, that year when the Golems were installed in the Temple of Solomon, the Pope Calixtus II fulminates the excommunication against the heretics of Tolosa. But such measures didn't take any effect. In 1147, the abbot of Clairvaux, St. Bernard, Golem chief of the Templar conspiracy, traveled around the Languedoc, receiving in every part signs of hostility by the people and the lordly nobility. Thence will be the Citeaux, that will be in charge to enliven the hates and form the new Perseus to destroy the Octian dragon. But the Cathars, far of being daunted by those threats, convoked in 1167 the General Council of St. Felix de Caraman. They were resolved to apportion the country in the same manner to the Catholic Church, the bishoprics and parishes. The Cathar Church was organized in base of bishoprics, presbyters, deacons, major brothers, minor brothers, etc., and gave superficial arguments to those that sustained the accusation of heresy. However, from the inner perspective existed only two groups, the believers and the chosen ones. The believers constituted the mass of those who sympathized with Catharism or professed its faith, but without reaching the initiation of the Holy Spirit that characterized the chosen ones. These last ones, instead, had been purified by the Holy Spirit, and due to this the believers called them pure, that's to say, Cathars. It will be necessary to clarify that the initiation in the Cathar mystery, being still a social act as every initiation, was differentiated from the initiations to the ancient mysteries that in the ritual form was reduced to the minimum. In fact, the Cathars, the pure men or initiates, had the power to communicate to the Holy Spirit to the believers through the laying on of hands, with which he could become a Cathar as well. To make possible that such miracle occurs was necessary to dispose of a Hyperborean chamber, in which the believer was situated and received the consolamentum of hands by the pure men. But the Hyperborean chamber was not a material construction, as the temples of the Gullums, but a concept of the Hyperborean wisdom of the White Atlanteans, which realization constituted a jealousy-guarded secret by the Cathars. For clarification, Dr. Signigel, I will tell that it consisted in the same principles that I already explain on the third day as fundamentals of the strategic mode of life that is, the principle of the occupation of the enclosure and the principle of the strategic wall. And the concept of the Hyperborean chamber intervenes the three mentioned principles, and its realization could be effectuated in any place, although, I repeat, the lytic technique that just required of the spatial distribution of some few not carved stones was secret. Thereby, with just a few stones and their hands, the Cathars initiated the believers in the mystery of the uncreated spirit. And as real representatives of the Pact of Blood, they opposed in this way the wisdom to the cult of the strategic wall to the temple. But the ritual form was minimum. The consequent spiritual process reached its highest intensity during the Cathar initiation. The believer was consoled internally, i.e., he was sustained by the Spirit and converted in Chosen One. But chosen by who? By himself. Because the Cathar initiates are convoked by themselves to liberate their spirits, those who have chosen themselves to reach the origin and exist. The believers would not be chosen by the Cathars. The believers would not be chosen by the Cathars. Neither their transmutation would depend from just the consolamentium. But their own spirit was chosen by itself and invested of purity when situating strategically under the charismatic influence of the pure men. The Cathar Church lacked of rituals, temples, and sacraments. The Cathars only allowed themselves the preaching, the exposition of the gospel of Christus Lucibel to every believer, and resulted that the indefatigable preaching extended the Catharism every day as an epidemic through the country of Languedoc, causing the consequent alarm of the Catholic Church whose temples were empty and their priests despised and aggrieved.
The pure men attributed the success to the proximity of the historical moment, in which would appear the Grail. But what in a beginning was just conviction, one day, when the Catharism was in the zenith of the popular adhesion, it turned effective reality. In the late twelfth century, many pure men assured to have seen physically the Grail and received its transmutative power. In the county of Foix, in Middle Pyrene region, was located the Signory of Raymond de Periel, which included, apart from castles, villages, and cultivation fields, a mountain peak, very abrupt, in which summit existed an ancient fortress in ruins. The name of such place was Montsegur in the Lord, as well as all his family and subordinates were counted amongst the believers of the Cathar Church. In the year 1202, the pure men solicited to Raymond de Periel the construction to Montsegur of a strange stone building of pentagonal asymmetric form, improper for the defense, inadequate to dwell, aesthetically shocking, the work was conceived. However, according to the highest Hyperborean strategy, its function had nothing to do with the defense, the dwelling, or the beauty, but with the grail, with the physical manifestation of the grail. Montsegur would be a reference area from where the initiates could localize the grail, or inclusive to approach physically to it. Its function not consisted then in to serve as a deposit to guard the grail due to the grail can't be inside or outside of anything, as the spirit, eternal and infinite, the reality of the grail is beyond the origin. But to localize the origin meant the liberation of the incarcerated spirit to the matter, and to facilitate such localization, the grail approaches to the asleep men, and Montsegur would be then, the strategic wall from where the grail would be seen, would be found the orientation towards the origin, the spirit would be rediscovered to itself, and the voice of the pure blood would be listened again, and the grail would speak and reveal to the white race the identity of the king of the pure blood, the universal emperor. In sum, doctor, for Montsegur the grail, as stone, can be found and taken by the pure men, but while remaining in the strategic wall, the grail would not be inside, but out of Montsegur, because the technique of the referential fenced area demands it. Instead, once taken outside, could be transported, if it is desired, to any other site, because the reference would be conserved, while the fenced referential area and the initiates who operate it exist. Naturally, the grail can be localized always, from any place that constitutes a liberated area in the space of the demiurge. An occupied area to the potencies of matter, according to the techniques of the Hyperborean wisdom of the White Atlanteans. A site where the illusion of the great deceit would not be acting. Yes, doctor, from such strategic area in every place, the Hyperborean initiates, being wise warriors, men of stone, of pure men, could find the grail of Christos Lucifer whenever they wish. But will not be necessary to insist on it, the constructed strategic walls, would not be neither similar to the ones of Montsegur, due to the inconsistent distribution of the matter, or the universal space obeys, to change dully the form of the employed strategy. As I wrote two days ago, when Innocent III takes control of the Vatican, in the year 1198, the plans of the White Fraternity were almost accomplished, and those plans figured as a pending issue to which should be given a prompt solution, the fulfillment of the extermination sentence that existed over the Cathars. In principle, Innocent III sent special legacies to travel around the country of Ock, while they initiated a maneuver destined to submit the King of Aragon, Peter II, to the vassalage of St. Peter, what he achieved in 1204. In that year, Peter II was crowned in Rome by the Pope who gave him the regalia, pallium, tunic, scepter, orb, crown, and mitre. Thereupon he demanded him an oath of loyalty and obedience to the pontiff, a defense of the Catholic faith, of the ecclesiastical Catholic rites, in all his lands and signiories, and to combat unto death the heresy. Peter the Second accepted all, who not suspected his sad end in hands of the Cistercians, and after receiving the knight sword in the hands of Innocent the Third, gives his kingdom to St. Peter, the Pope, and his successors. To all this the legacies had already alerted the loyal bishops to the Golems and effectuated a prolix census of the Autoclathonus prelates, that they would never approve the destruction of the civilization of Ock, and that they would have to be expurgated from the church. 
In 1202, the Gollums considered that the conditions were given to execute their plans and decided to tend a mortal trap to the Earl of Tolosa, Raymond VI. The mechanism of this trap aims to give a justification to the imminent destruction of the civilization of Ak and the Cathar extermination. And the artifice, idea did, to deceive the prey, was a propitiatory victim, a Cistercian monk of the French Forehead Abbey called Peter of Pierre de Constellonneau. Such sinister personage was well prepared to the function that would have to perform, unknowing, of course, because he stood out in matters such as the cruelty, the fanaticism, the hate against the heresy, etc. And to maximize his reckless and intolerant action, he was gifted a special powers that placed him above any ecclesiastical authority, except for the Pope, and was ordained to inquire about the faith of the Octian. In only six years, Pierre of Constantinople was murdered by two own golems, and the responsibility of the crime fell upon the Earl of Tolosa. The trap was closed. The response of Innocent III to the murder of his legacy would be the proclamation of a saint crusade against the Octian heretics. Logically, the appeal of such crusade was entrusted to the Cistercian order. Inheritor of the region that the Romans denominated Gallia Narbonensis, and Charlemagne Gothic Gallia, the Languedoc constituted a huge country of 40,000 square kilometers that confined with the Kingdom of France, in the east with the shore of the Rhone, and in the north with Forez, Avergin, Rosian, and Corsi. In the 13th century, such country was made according to the law of sovereignty of the King Aragon. Amongst the most important signiories was the Duch of Narbonne, the counties of Tolosa, Foix, and Bern, the viscounties of Carcassonne, Beziers, Rhodes, Lusac, Albi, Nimes, etc. Apart from these vassals, Peter II had inherited the states of Catalonia and the counties of Rousselion and Pillars, and had rights over the county of Provence. But not all ended there. Peter II, whose sister was the wife of the Emperor Frederick II, Hohenstaufen, had married his two daughters with the Counts of Tolosa, Raymond VI and Raymond VII, father and son, and corresponds him for his own marriage with Maria of Montpellier, writes over such county of Languedoc, hence the compromise of King Aragon with the counties of Ac could not be major. The Cistercians called to the crusade in all Europe after the death of Pierre de Constantinople, that was, since 1208. In July of 1209, the largest army ever seen in those lands crossed the Rhone and marched toward the country of Ac. As chief of the same, Innocent III named a Gollum, who seemed to have emerged from the own entrails of hell. Arnaud Amalric, abbot of Chateau, mother monastery of the Cistercian order, the army of Satan, composed by 350,000 crusaders, promptly found themselves sieging the little fortified city of Beziers. The extermination sentence would be finally accomplished. Hours later, the defenders yielded a gate, and the infernal troops are disposed to conquer the area. The military chiefs interrogate Arnaud Amalric about the mode to distinguish the heretics from the Catholics. To what the abbot of Setau responded, Kill them. Kill them all, for the Lord knows who are his own. Noble and commoners, women and children, men and old men, Catholics and heretics, the totality of 30,000 inhabitants of Beziers was decapitated or burnt in the next moments. The corpse of Beziers is the Eucharistic lamb of the communion of the Crusaders, the sacrament of blood and fire that constitutes the sacrifice to Creator God, one Jehovah Satan. Punishment of the Creator God, Sentence of the White Fraternity, Sanction of the Swarthy Atlanteans, Expiation of the Priests, Gollum Vengeance, Hebrew Lesson, Catholic Penance, The Slaughter of Beziers is Archetypical, have been and will be always when the populations of pure blood try to recover the Hyperborean heritage until the final battle. After Beziers fell, Carcassonne, where five hundred heretics were burnt, disposed the Adokthanus prelates, and when the Viscount Raymond Roger was captured and humiliated, Peter II reached to Carcassonne to intercede for his vassal and friend without obtaining anything of the papal legacy. This impotent gives an idea of the power acquired by the Church in those centuries about the temporal kings, 
The King Aragon withdrew then, and he concentrates in the other crusade, which is being carried out simultaneously, the struggle against the Muslims of Spain. He believes that participating from his prowess his honor would not involve, as would be the case if he intervenes in the repression of his subjects. Nevertheless, the lack of honor was already huge because he abandoned them in hands of his worst foes. While the Gollum Crusades goes exterminating the Cathars castle by castle and seeks to destroy the county of Tolosa, Peter II face with success to the Muslims in the reconquest of Valencia. He returns finally to Narbonne, where he gathered with the Cathars counts of Tolosa and Foix, and with the military chief of the crusade, Simon of Montfort, and the papal legacies. Once again, he didn't obtain anything, but this time his Catholic condition is questioned, and he was threatened with excommunication. He ended to accept the indiscriminate repression and confirming the rapine effectuated by Simon, agrees that if the counts of Tolosa and Foix not apostatized from the Catharism, those titles would be transferred. Therefore, Peter II believed that the crusade only achieved the end of the heresy, and that his sovereignty over the Languedoc would not be questioned. It is in this way that, as proof of good faith, is arranged the marriage of his son James with the daughter of Simon de Montfort. But James, the future king of Aragon, James I, the conqueror, has only two years. Peter II gives him to Simon for his education, i.e. as a hostage, and he rushes to situate him behind the walls of Carcosona. Then Peter II joined in the fight against the Almohads with the king of Castile Alfonso VIII and remained two years dedicated to the reconquest of Spain. After complying a prominent role in the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa, he returned to Aragon, where the joyless surprise that the Crusaders of Christ have distributed his lands and threatened to request the protection of the King of France. Arnold Almelric, the abbot of Citeaux, is now Duke of Narbonne, and Simon de Montfort, Count of Tolosa, Ends 1212 when Peter II claims to Innocent III by the action of the open conquest that the Crusaders are carrying out in his country. The Pope tries to entertain him, to give time for the Golems to complete the annihilation of the Catharism and the destruction of the civilization of Ak. But before the insistence of monarch of Aragon, he ends to show his real game and excommunicates him. So Innocent III, who in 1204 crowned him and named Gonfalonier, i.e. Major Alferez, of the Church, now considered that he was also a heretic, but would be a naivety that the Golems, only interested to accomplish the satanic plans of the White Fraternity, would have acted in a different mode. Suddenly, Peter II understands, all and marches with an improvised army to succor the Earl Raymond VI in the sight of Tolosa. But it is too late to fight against the infernal powers, who have lived closing the eyes of the truth, have become weak to sustain the gaze of the great deceiver. Peter II has reacted, but his forces are just enough to die, as what he did in the Battle of Muret against Simon de Montfort in September of 1213, died incomprehensibly in the middle of a huge strategic disaster, in which results destroyed of Army of Aragon and definitively buried the last hope of the Octian Cathar.
twenty-second day. As Tartessos, as Saxony, as the country of Ock, the populations of pure blood would have to pay a hard tribute for opposing the Hyperborean wisdom to the cult of God the One. The crusade against the Cathars and other heretics of the Languedoc would go on with some interruptions for thirty more years. Thousands of Ockitan would end their lives at the stake. But at the end of the country of Ock would go returning slowly to the Mother Church. In 1218, Simon Montfort died during a siege in Tolosa that had been reconquered by Raymond VII. His son, Amory, lacking of the vocation of Gollum executioner, which Simon possessed in great level, ends to sell the rights of the county of Tolosa to the king of France, Louis VIII, with which the Capetians legalized the intervention and would conclude to conserve all the country. But this was not casual. The frank occupation of the Languedoc would constitute an imperative objective of the Gollum strategy, mainly because it would allow to prohibit the wonderful language of Ock, the language of heresy, in favor of the medieval French, the language of the Benedictians, Cluniacs, Cistercians, and Templars. Such linguistic substitution would be the coup of grace for the culture of the troubadours, as the stakes had been for the Catharism. Added to the destruction of the civilization of Ock, the rest great works realized by Innocent III during his ecclesiastical reign, it is understood that when he died in 1216, he had supposed that the plans of the White Fraternity were just to be fulfilled. The guarantee of it, the instrument of the universal domination, would be the younger Emperor Frederick II, who in those days was totally agree with the Gollum's strategy. However, Frederick II would surprisingly change his attitude and would give a mortal strike to the plans of the White Fraternity, and the main cause of that change, of that spiritual manifestation that emerged from his pure blood and transformed him into the Lord of Lords, was the effective presence of the Grail of Christos Lucifer. The Cathars indeed, paying the cruel price of the extermination to the Benedictine Gollum, had condemned them achieved in a hundred years to face an entire population of pure blood against the potencies of the matter. The pact of blood in this way was restored, but would not be possible to win in the confrontation, because it was not yet the time to outbreak the final battle over the earth. The moment was propitious, instead to die with honor and to await in Valhalla and Agartha, the sign of the liberator gods to intervene in the battle, which would come. But, even if the actual battle could not be won, the laws of the war demanded to inflict the highest possible damage to the enemy, and in that case, the major disgrace in the plans of the enemy would be produced by the manifestation of the Grail. For this reason, the Cathars, even by the fierce persecutions of the Crusaders and Golems that were decimating them, and the frightful mass killings of believers— they were working without intermission from Montsegur to stabilize especially the grail and approach to it in physical body. It can be considered that the concrete results of such Hyperborean strategy took place in the year 1217. Then the physical presence of the grail performed the tabula regia and confirmed that Frederick II Hohenstaufen was the real king of the white race, the only with the spiritual conditions to establish the universal empire of the pure blood and in coincidence with the apparition of the grail of Montsegur. Simultaneously, Frederick II reached in Sicily the comprehension of the Hyperborean wisdom and became a man of stone. Since that moment would begin his war against the popes of Satan, the Antichrist, as he denominated them in his libels. He also prohibited the transit of every economic or military operation of the Templars in his kingdom, processing them for heresy, is then when Frederick II affirmed openly that the three great impostors of history were Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, actually represented by the Antichrist who occupies the throne of St. Peter. With the decisive and unforeseen action of Frederick II, the delicate architecture of intrigues edified by the Golems started to crumble. But the white fraternity and the Golems know very well from where came the real attack and further to clash in a direct struggle, and worthless against the emperor. They concentrated all their power in the Languedoc, which, thence, would become an authentic hell, was urgent to find the magical construction that the grail sustained and destroy it, was necessary then to obtain the information as fast as possible. The heretics would not be sent to the stake immediately anymore. Now it was necessary to obtain their confession, 
to discover their secret places, the site of their ceremonies. For that mission was perfected the manner to inquire about the faith instituting the use of the torture, the extortion, the bribery, the accusation, and the threat. And as such work of interrogation of prisoners who preferred to die before talking could not be realized any more just by the papal legacies, they decided to entrust it to a special order. The beneficiary of the enterprise would be the Order of Preachers, i.e., the founded order, and we'll see by St. Dominic de Guzman, well, even by the effective task developed by the Inquisition, with the capture and execution of hundreds of Occitan heretics, the Golems belated twenty-seven years to reach Montsegur. Meanwhile, by false information, for the existence of a reasonable doubt or mere suspicion, they demolished, one by one, thousands of stone constructions in the Occitania, contributing to dilapidate even more beautiful country. Nevertheless, the grail was not found, and Frederick II carried out almost all his projects to debilitate the Gollum papacy. Only in 1244 the crusaders in the command of Peter of Amel, the Gollum archbishop of Narbonne, deployed before Montsegur in the presence of the Occitan grail, came to an end. After that, troops of Satan occupied the area of Montsegur. The grail would disappear and would never be seen again in Occident. Montsegur was conquered and destroyed in part. The family of the Lord of Parella was exterminated, with 250 Cathars that operated there. But the grail could never be found. What happened with the Stone of Venus of Christos Lucifer? It was transported far away by some Cathars who were in charge of its custody. It is convenient to repeat, however, that the grail, for being a reflect of the origin, is present in all the time and place from where is proposed in strategic disposition, based in the Hyperborean wisdom. And that could be found again if the necessary conditions are given. If exists the pure men in the strategic wall, the Cathars who achieved to sustain it as a stone, that is, a lapsit exilis, for twenty-seven years decided to transport it before the fall of Montsegur. Five of those pure men embarked in Marcella, toward the destiny that the liberator gods of Katagar signalized. The unknown lands that existed further than the Occidental Sea, that is, America. The ship belonged to the order of Teutonic Knights, and they were awaiting them since time ago, by express order of the great master Hermann von Salza. Such evacuation was the only succor that Frederick II could give them even though for a long time had been waited in Montsegur the arrival of an imperial garrison. The vessel Constance, after crossing the columns of Heracles, penetrated in the ocean and took the route that centuries later would follow Diaz del Solis. Four months later, before returning to the river de la Plata and the river Parana, they arrived to a near region to the actual city of Asuncion, of Paraguay. The map that the Teutonic Knights employed came from the far Pomerania, one of the countries of the north of Europe, which they were conquering by command of the Emperor Frederick II, existed there a population of Danish origin which traveled to America and possessed a colony in the place where the Constance had reached. Those Vikings traded with certain relatives who, according to them, had become kings of a great nation that was located behind the high snowy peaks of the west a country separated from the colony by huge and impenetrable jungles that would not be other than the Inca Empire, and the Constance came some Danish who knew the dialect spoken by the settlers. They found the colony in the signalized site, and there landed the pure men to comply with their objective and give the adequate physical guard to the grail through the construction of the strategic wall. The ship of Teotonic order departed, but the pure men would never return to Europe. Instead, they worked for years, helped by the settlers and Guayaki Indians, until to complete an amazing underground construction in one of the slopes of the Cerro Cora. The physical presence of the grail was now assured because it had been referred in such way the construction that the spatial stability resulted enough to remain there for many centuries, until other pure men seek for it and find it. Naturally, the Templars, warned in Europe, by the white fraternity, didn't delay to start the persecution of the Cathars. They usually sailed to America from the ports of Normandy, where they disposed of a powerful fleet because they needed to accumulate precious metals, especially silver, to bank the future financial synarchy, metals that in America were obtained easily. Some years after the narrated events, the Templars fell in the Viking colony, and all the dwellers, 
were passed by knife, but the grail once again not disappeared. The golems would not forget the episode, and then, in full conquest of America by Spain, a legion of Jesuits, natural heirs of the Benedictines and Templars, would settle down in the region to localize and try to steal the Stone of Venus. But all the quests would be fruitless, and on the contrary, the presence of the grail would be making feel in an irresistible manner over the Spaniards' dwellers, purifying the pure blood, and predisposing the population to recognize the universal emperor. In the 19th century, Dr. Signigal, an analogous miracle to the one that occurred with the civilization of Ock, was just to be repeated. The Republic of Paraguay was rising with their own light over the nations of America. In fact, such country had a powerful and well-equipped army, own fleet, railroad, heavy industry, flourishing agriculture, and an enviable social organization. With a very advanced legislation for the age, in which stood out the obligatory and free education in 1850, the population was extremely proud of their lineage, and knew to admire the spirituality and courage of their chiefs. Of course, to the white fraternity not resulted pleasurable the course that such society was taking, that would not agree to integrate the scheme of the international division of work, proposed then as the model of the economic world order. Such ordination was the previous step for the accomplishment in the twentieth century of the financial synarchy, of the world government of the chosen people. Some ancient plans, which, as I have clarified, were frustrated in the Middle Ages. For the white fraternity, the Paraguayan people were going sick, and the virus that affected them was the nationalism, the worst modern enemy of the synarchic plans. The height of the situation occurred in 1863, when the grail appeared again and confirmed to all that the Marshal Francisco Salano Lopez is a king of the pure blood, a lord of war, a universal emperor. Then was decreed the extermination sentence against the Paraguayan people and the dynasty of Solano Lopez. Thereupon a new crusade was announced in all ambits. Argentina, Brazil and Uruguay will contribute the means and troops, but behind them semi-colonial countries in England, i.e. the English masonry, Gollum and Hebrew organization at the head of the Crusader army that was now called Allied is placed the Argentinian general Bartolomé Mitra, a mason entirely subordinated to the British interests. But the capacity to officiate as Gollum hangman demonstrates that the general mitre exceeds widely the diabolic cruelty of Arnold Almerick and Simon de Montfort, and his logic due to the patience of the enemy ended centuries ago and now pretends to give an exemplary punishment, a lesson that demonstrates clearly that the path of the spiritual and racial nationalism won't be tolerated any more. The War of the Triple Alliance started in 1865. In 1870, when the armies of Satan occupied Asuncion, and the Marshal Solano Lopez died fighting in Cerro Cora, the war ends and leaves the consequences. The population of Paraguay before the war, 1,300,000 inhabitants. Population after the war, 300,000 inhabitants. Bezier, Carcassonne, are children's games before one million of dead, Dr. Signagel. And it is not necessary to add that the 300,000 survivors, many of them women, old men, and Indians, to the population of Hispanic origin, which was hardened and proud, was exterminated without mercy, house by house, in dreadful massacres that caused the delight of the potencies of the matter. Once again, Perseus had beheaded Medusa. One million heroic Paraguayans with their pure blood chief was the sacrifice that the satanic forces offered to the God One in the 19th century in such remote country of South America, where nevertheless was manifested the transmuting presence of the grail of Christos Lucifer. 23rd Day It is time now to talk about St. Dominic and the Order of Preachers. Dominic de Guzman was born in 1170 in the village of Caluroga, Old Castile, which was under the jurisdiction of the Bishop Osma, before his birth, his mother had a dream in which she saw her future son as a dog carrying in its jaw an ardent labrys, i.e., a burning axe of double blade. Such symbol interested vividly to the lords of Tarsus, because they considered it a sign that St. Dominic was predestined for the cult of the cold fire. Thence the lords of Tarsus watched attentively during his childhood, 
and once concluded the primary instruction, they arranged an area for him in the University of Palencia, in which that moment was located in the zenith of the academic prestige. The motive was clear. In Palencia, the famous Bishop Peter of Tarsus taught theology, better known by the Sabricit Petreño, who enjoyed of unlimited confidence by part of the King Alfonso VIII, of whom he was one of his main counselors. What occurred fifty years before to his cousin, the Bishop Lupo, was an admonition that could not be overpassed and due to its potreño, lived behind the walls of the university, in a very modest house, but which had the advantage of being provided of a small private chapel. There he had for his contemplation a reproduction of Our Lady of the Grotto. In that chapel, Petreño initiated Dominic de Guzman in the mystery of the cold fire, and was so great the transmutation produced in him that soon he became man of stone. In a Hyperborean initiate, provided with great thaumaturgical powers and not minor wisdom, such deep was the devotion of Saint Dominic de Guzman that, it was said, the own Holy Virgin responded to the monk in his prayers. He was who communicated to Petreño that he had seen Our Lady of the Grotto with a rose necklace, and Petreño indicated that such ornament was equivalent to Skull's necklace of Fraya Caliber. Fraya Caliber, seen from out of himself, appeared dressed of death and wearing the necklace with the skulls of her assassinated husbands. The skulls were the accounts with words of the deceit. Instead, Fraya, seen from the depths of himself, behind her veil of death that represents her terrible for the soul, was the naked truth of the Eternal Spirit. The Virgin of Agartha, of absolute beauty and immaculate, would be natural that she would wear a necklace of roses in which each sprout represents the hearts of those who were loved by her with the cold fire. Dominic remained vividly captivated with that vision, and not stopped until he invented the rosary, which consisted in a cord with three sets of sixteen fixed small balls with rose petals. The sixteen, thirteen plus three, corresponded to the mysteries of the Virgin. The rosary of St. Dominic is used to pronounce orderly prayers, or mantrams, that goes producing a mystical state in the devotee of the Virgin and finally turning on the cold fire in the heart. Must not surprise that I mentioned sixteen mysteries of the Virgin, and that today left only fifteen, neither the variation in the number of accounts of the rosary, nor that today the rosary is associated to the mysteries of Jesus Christ, and that the mysteries of Our Lady of the Child of Stone have been occulted, because all the work of St. Dominic has been systematically deformed and distorted, as by the enemies of his order, as by the traitors that existed in greater and greater amount inside of it. Dominic reached to dictate the Cathedral of the Sacred Writing in the University of Palencia, but his natural vocation for the preaching and his desire to divulge the usage of the rosary in the most remote regions of Castile and Aragon. In this action stood out enough as to convince the lords of Tarsus that they were before the right man to found the first anti gollum order in the history of the church. Dominic was capable to live in extreme poverty. He knew to preach and to wake up the faith in Christ and the Virgin. He gave proofs of real sanctity, and he surprised with his inspired wisdom. To him would be difficult to deny the right to gather those who believed in his work. But to make that such right could not be denied by the Gollums was necessary for Dominic to become known out of Spain, to give the example of humility and sanctity. The bishop of Osma, Diego de Acevedo, who shared in secrecy the ideas of the lords of Tarsus, decided that the best place to send Dominic was the south of France. Region in that period was frenzied by a struggle with the church. The majority of the Octanian people had converted to the Cathar religion, that according to the church constituted an abominable heresy, and without that the Benedictians of the Cistercian and Cluniac order, so powerful in the rest of France, would have achieved to avoid it. With that purpose, the Bishop Diego obtained the representation of the infant Don Fernando to arrange the marriage with the daughter of Earl de la Marca. What gave him the opportunity of traveling to France, carrying Dominic de Guzman with him, to whom he had named Presbyter. That journey allowed him to get internalized in the Cathar heresy and to project a plan. And the second journey to France once dead the daughter of the Count and decided the mission of Dominic. Both clerics traveled to Rome. There the Bishop Diego prepared for the terrible Gollum Pope Innocent III, 
the authorization to go around the Languedoc preaching the gospel and teaching the use of the rosary. Once obtained the authorization, both travel from Montpellier. To preach in the cities of La Midi, they made it barefoot and begging sustenation, not differing too much from the pure men that transited profusely the same paths. The humility and austerity is notably contrasted to the luxury and pomp of the papal legacies, which in those days also traveled the country trying to put end to the Catharism, and with the ostensible richness of the archbishops and bishops. However, they pick up proofs of hostility in many villages and cities, neither for their acts, that the pure men respected, nor even for the preaching, but for what they represented, the Church of Jehovah Satan. But such results were already disposed by the Petreño and Diego de Osma, who had imparted precise instructions to Dominic about the strategy to follow. The perspective of the lords of Tarsus was the next. Observing from Spain the open combative attitude assumed by the people of Ock to priests of Jehovah Satan, and considering the experience that the house of Tarsus had in similar situations— the evidence conclusion indicated that the consequence would be the destruction, the ruin, and the extermination. In the opinion of the lords of Tarsus, the collective suicide was not necessary, and on the contrary, that only benefited the enemy. But was also clear that the Cathars were not warned completely about the situation, perhaps for unknowing the diabolical evil of the Gollum that constituted the secret government of the Roman Church and for perceiving just the superficial aspect, and more shocking, of the Catholic organization. But even if the Cathars, not supposed that the Gollum, from the College of Temple Constructors of the Cistercian Order, they had decreed the extermination of the pure men and the destruction of the civilization of Ock, and that they would comply that sentence up to its last details, was not less true that such possibility would not concern them at all. As touched by a mystical madness, the pure men had their eyes nailed to the origin in the grail, and they were indifferent to the future of the world. And was already seen how effective was such tenacity that allowed the manifestation of the grail in the universal emperor, and caused the failure of the white fraternity plans. In front of the intransigence of the Cathars, Dominic and Diego appealed to an external procedure, which could not be discouraged by the church. They warn, to whom wanted to hear, about the secure destruction that will guide them, the declared sustenance of the heresy. But they not listened, to the believers that constitute the majority of the Octian population, and that, as all religious mass, didn't comprehend the philosophical subtleties. It is impossible for them to believe that the evil could triumph over the good, that's to say, that the Roman Church could effectively destroy the Cathar Church. And to the Cathars, who know that the evil can triumph over the good in the earth, they don't care about it, because in every case are just variations of the illusion. For the pure man, the unique reality is the spirit, and that truth means the definitive and absolute triumph of the good over the evil, i.e., the eternal performance of the reality of the spirit, and the final dissolution of the material world. In the year 1208, and while the population is affirmed in these positions, the Pope Innocent III announced the crusade in reprisal for the death of his legacy, Peter of Castelnau. It is too late to make effective the preaching of St. Dominic. However, the main objective of the mission, that was to impose the saint image of Dominic and to make known his aptitudes as organizer and founder of religious communities, was having success. In such year, while the slaughter of Bezier and other Gollum atrocities, St. Dominic realized his first foundation in Fanjo, near Carsecone. He had comprehended immediately that the Octanian ladies manifested a special predisposition for the spiritual love, and due to this he established there the monastery of Proye, which nuns would be dedicated to the children care, and to the cult of the Virgin of the Rosary. The first abbess was Maia de Tarsus, great initiated in the cult of the cold fire. She was sent from Spain to that function, and she applied then one of the strategic principles signalized by Petreño. To escape from the Gallian control, in some measure, was indispensable to dismiss the Regula Monacorum of St. Benedict. Henceforth, St. Dominic gives to the nuns of Proye the rule of St. Augustine. Of course, St. Dominic and Diego de Osma not acted alone. They were aided by some nobles and clerics that professed in secrecy the cult of the cold fire, and received spiritual assistance of the lords of Tarsus. Amongst them were the Archbishop of Narbonne, 
and the Bishop of Tolosa, who contributed to that work with the important sums of money. This last one, Genose, initiate, called Fulco, infiltrated by the lords of Tarsus and the Cistercian order, and would not be discovered until the end, in such days the Bishop Fulco passed as sworn enemies of the Cathars, defensor of the Catholic orthodoxy, and he took advantage of that prestige to promote, before the papal legacies and his superiors about the Cistercian order, the monastic work of Dominic and his personal sanctity. In the next years, St. Dominic tried to carry out the plan of Petreño and found a semi-secular brotherhood, to the type of chivalric orders, dominated, Militia Christi, from which would emerge the Tartuis, Ordo, de Penitentia, Sancti Dominici, whose members were known as tertiary friars. But soon this organization resulted ineffective for the searched objectives, and had to be thought in something more perfect and of greater amplitude. For many years was planned the new order, taking in consideration the collected experience and the formidable task that was proposed to carry out. This is to fight against the Gollum strategy, collaborated with St. Dominic in such projects a group of sixteen initiates, coming from different places of Languedoc, who gathered periodically in Tolosa. Amongst them was the Bishop Fulco. As a consequence of those speculations was decided that the most convenient was to create a Hyperborean circle, hidden behind a Catholic order. The circle would be a super-secret society directed by the Lords of Tarsus, which would operate inside of the new monastic order. Only in this way, they concluded, would be obtained the searched objective with the principle of security. Such secret group, integrated in a beginning just by sixteen initiates that I've already mentioned, was called Circulus Dominicanis, i.e. Circle of the Lords of the Dog. That name is explained remembering the promontory dream of the mother of Dominic de Guzman, in which his future son appeared as a dog who carried a burning axe, and considering that for the initiates in the cold fire the dog was a representation of the soul, and the Lord, par excellence, was the spirit. In every Hyperborean initiate, the spirit must dominate the soul and assume the function of Lord of the Dog. Thence, they adopted domination for the circle of the initiates, which also had the advantage of being confused with the name Dominicani, that is, Dominicans, that the people gave to the monks of Dominic de Guzman. It must be added that to be a Lord of the Dog in the mystical of the cold fire is analogous to be a Lord of the Horse, which means a knight in the mysticism of the night age where the soul is symbolized by the horse. One of the initiates, Pedro Celari, had donated many houses in Tolosa. Some of them were destined to secret places for meetings of the circle, and others were adopted for their use of the future order. When all was ready, was arranged to obtain the authorization of Innocent III for the foundation of Preacher Mendicant's order, similar to the founded by St. Francis of Assis in 1210, to this order, Innocent III had approved immediately, but the new solicitude came now from Tolosa, a country in holy war in which everybody was suspect of heresy, and was necessary to act with caution. The plan was ambitious, but just the unquestionable personality of St. Dominic would smooth away all difficulties, just as the own St. Francis did. It must not be forgotten that the Gollum controlled all the Occidental monasticism from the Benedictian order and that they were hostile to the creation of new independent orders. The opportunity was presented only in 1215 when the Bishop Fulco was convoked to the Fourth General Council of Lateran and took with him St. Dominic. There they stumbled with the closed negative of the Innocent III, who, as it is known, only ceded after dreaming with the Belisca of Lateran, threatening to collapse, was sustained in the shoulders of Dominic de Guzman. However, the authorization was merely oral, although perfectly legal and was limited to accept the rule of St. Augustine, re reforms proposed by Dominic, and to recommend the mission to fight against the heresy. After the death of Innocent III in 1216, Honorus III gives the definite approval of the Order of Preachers, or Ordo Prediacatorum, and allowed its expansion. Due to it in that moment, it only had the monasteries of Proye and Tolosa, in first instance entered to the order all the clerics of the House of Tarsus, that, as I said, were in majority, university professors carrying with them many other wise and erudits of the age. In a short time, because the order became an organization suitable for the high-level teaching, nonetheless, that the first general chapter gathered in Bologna in 1220, 
declared that it was treating about a mendicant order, with minor rigor in the poverty, that the one of St. Francis. St. Dominic died in 1221, leaving the control of the order in the hands of an initiate of pure blood, the general master blessed Jordan of Saxony. However, in that moment, the Gollums were struggling to achieve the institutionalization of a systematic inquisition of the heresy that allowed them to interrogate any suspect and to obtain the information conducive to the sight of the grail, if such institution was entrusted to the Benedictines. As was pretended, the end of the Cathar strategy would be faster than the predicted. Not giving time to Frederick II to realize his plans to dilapidate the Gollum papacy, Thence the insistence and the eloquence deployed by the Dominicans to present themselves as the best-prepared order to perform such sinister function. But the Dominicans had some real advantages over the Benedictines. They not only constituted a local order, Adachthanus of the Languedoc, where the Benedictines had lost influence long time ago, but they also disposed of monks with great theological instruction, appropriated to analyze the declarations that the Inquisition of the Faith demanded. The Dominicans disposed of indubitable capacity of mobilization in the Languedoc, and when the Gollums were convinced that the new order would be under their control and would allow entry of their own inquisitors, they also approved the concession. In 1224, the Emperor Frederick II, who even being already confronted with the papacy, he had cleared the situation of the Languedoc and the necessity to support the order of preachers renovates through a new imperial law the old Roman legislation that considered the non-official cults as less majesty, i.e., liable of death sentence. In this case, the law would be applied to the repression of the heresy. In 1231, notwithstanding that they were already working, the Pope Gregory XI institutes the special tribunals of the Inquisition and entrusted its office to the orders of St. Dominic and St. Francis. In the last instance, the friar Elias, a secret agent of Frederick II, in the Franciscan order, who would be general minister from 1232 to 1239, and that at the end, discovered by the Gollum, would pass openly to the Ghibli side. However, prompt would only remain the Dominicans in charge of the Inquisition. Two facts must remain clear when evaluating the step taken by the order of St. Dominic when accepting the responsibility of the Inquisition. One is that represented the minor evil for the Cathars, due to the repression executed directly by the Golem, would have been terribly more effective, as was demonstrated in Bazir, and in that way would be achieved, at least sabotage the quest of the Grail, and to retard the fall of Montsegur, objective that was reached in great measure. And the other fact was that the lords of Tarsus were perfectly conscious that the order would be infiltrated by the Golem and that they would open the doors to the most cruel and fanatic personages of, of the Catholic Orthodoxy, who would destroy without mercy neither remorse the Cathars and their work. The balance indicated that it would be preferable to run that risk and allow the Golems to be managed by their own account. To the most fanatic inquisitors that soon would act in the order, should not be hampered openly because that would alert the Golem. The tactic consisted then to subtly deviate the false clues or other forms of heresy. In the first case, in fact, the lords of the dog achieved to, under the charge of heresy, to liquidate in the stake the totality of the criminals, thieves, prostitutes of the Languedoc. They naturally never contributed with any information that could be useful to the Gollum, even if they were obeyed to confess the heresies by means of the torture. In the second case, the Dominican Inquisition produced an effect, not desired by the Benedictine Gollum, the one that they were capable to counteract justly by the same reasons that the lords of the dog could not avoid the golems to exterminate the Cathars, that is, to not remain in the contradiction with the act of laws. The golem could not avoid that the members of the chosen people be repressed, easily accused under the charge of heresy, and the lords of Tarsus, who had not forgotten the accounts that they had pending since the age of the Visigoth kingdom of Spain, and the participation that they had in the Arab invasion as for the subsequent intrigues to destroy the house of Tarsus. They now had their hands with the Inquisition, a formidable arm to return every hit. Was in this way how the Gollum verified with the unpleasant surprise that the repression of the heresy ended in many opportunities in the systematic persecution of the Jews, who were sent to the stake with the same or major cruelty of the Cathars. That was, naturally, the effect of the occult task of the Lords of the Dog, which unfortunately was not as effective as they wanted, due to, as the Cathars, 
The Jewish heretics had to be offered the possibility of the Catholic conversion, what saved their lives, thing that they used to accept without problems to converting themselves, in Marano or Anusims. In other words, conserving their religion in secret and simulating to be Christians, aversely to the pure men who preferred to die before the fall of the honor and lie about their religious beliefs. In some time passed by, the Cathar heresy was giving way to the most reassuring Catholic religion. The initial furor of the Inquisition was appeasing, and the order of preachers was contemplating unjustified fame of repressor organization with other fame more appropriated to the spirit of its founders. The one of order dedicated to the study, the teaching, and the preaching of the Catholic faith. The great theological system of the scholastic is consequence in high grade to the work of notable Dominican writers and thinkers, who in almost every case were not initiates, but they were guided secretly by them. To develop that activity to the order was concentrated in two prestigious universities. The one of Oxford and Paris will be enough to remember the professors as the German saint Albertus. Magnus, or St. Thomas Aquinas were Dominicans, to comprehend that the acquired by the order was completely justified, but were also the Dominicans Roland of Sermona, who taught in Paris between 1229 and 1231, Peter de Tarantasia, who did it from 1258 to 1265, and reached to be Pope with the name of Innocent V in 1276, Roger Bacon, Richard of Fischera, and Vincent de Belvas in Oxford, etc., we must have present Dr. Signagel that the lords of Tarsus possessed the Hyperborean wisdom, and, in consequence, they worked according to the ancient historic perspective. They considered, for example, that in those decades of Gollum influence were inevitable, but that finally would pass, so would reach the moment to expurgate the order, because that was strategically important, to preserve the control of the order and the institution of the Inquisition for a future opportunity, when this occasion would be presented— all the force of the horror and the repression unleashed by the Cistercian golems, as a hit of jujitsu, could be returned against their own creators, and no one would feel offended for that, especially in Languedoc. The weight of the strategy, as is adverted, rested in the capacity of the lords of the dog circle to maintain in secret their existence and conserve the control of the order. That would not be because the golem ended to suspect that a strange will inside the order was frustrating all the plans of the order, but every time that someone was near to the truth, the Domini Canis executed him secretly, and they attributed the death to predictable vengeances of the Octian heretics. To these motivations purely strategic that animated the lords of Tarsus to work occulted and the circulus Domini Canis, would be added soon the pure necessity to survive, as a consequence of the events occurred in Spain, and that I will begin to expose tomorrow, as will be seen the destruction of the Templar order, and with it the failure of the synarchic plans of the white fraternity, would become a matter of life and death for the house of Tarsus. The last strategy of the circulus will take us to the exoteric cause of the enemy plan's failure. That was Philip the Sixth, and of whom I referred four days ago. 24th Day While the order of preachers was evolving according to the plans of the lords of Tarsus, something terrible would happen in Spain. The return of Bera and Bersha, and that event almost meant Dr. Signagel the end of the house of Tarsus. I will show you now how occurred the facts. Remember, doctor, that the ancient Anuba, the major city of the Turdotani, was since the 8th century under Arab dominance— who dominated it, Yulva, in the year 1011, was the head of the Tifa's kingdom, being its first sovereign, Abu Zayd Mohammed ibn Ayyub, followed by Abdul Mozad Abeldaziz, but in 1051 was promptly annexed to the kingdom of Seville until the year 1241. As I already explained, during those centuries of Arab occupation, the House of Tarsus survived without problems and reached an enviable economic power, the village of Turtis, whose existence depended in the essential of the properties that the lords of Tarsus exploited in the region, had grown and prospered a lot. Counting in that time with some 3,500 inhabitants, a part of the direct nucleos of the family Tarsus Volter, that lived in the signorial residence and was composed of some 50 members, in the village of Turtis lived many families of the lineage of the House of Tarsus, but of collateral bloodlines. 
So in the year 1128, when Bera and Bersha were celebrating the Golem Council of Mozan, the kingdom of Huelva was subordinated to the Taif of Seville. The king of Castile and Leon, Ferdinand III the Saint, reconquests Seville in 1248, but he died there in 1252. His son Alfonso X, the Wise, ends the campaign conquering, in 1258, the Algarve in the regions of Huelva and Niebla. The king gave this region as dowry of his natural daughter Beatrice, who joined it to the crown of Portugal when she married with Alfonso III. As such, annexation affected the ancient rights that the House of Tarsus had over the region. The crown of Portugal compensated the knight Odoleon of Tarsus Volter with the title of Count of Tarsival. In reality, the armorial achievement that Portugal gave to the House of Tarsus was engraved with the legend Con Tars et Val, with which was abbreviated the title of Count of Tarsus and Volter. The subsequent direct lecture ended to agglutinate the syllables of the abbreviation and to form such word, Tarsival. That identified the House of Tarsus in the next centuries. The design of the blazon was the product of a hard negotiation between Odileon and the Portuguese heralds, in which the new count imposed his perspective appealing to difference in the language and to a whimsical explanation of the requested emblems. Assuming that in the ancient Lusitania no one remembered the House of Tarsus, they claimed the print-making of many familiar symbols in the armorial achievement, and they went accepting in this manner the presence of the rooster as representations of the Holy Spirit in the left and right sides of the arms of Tarsus. The barbell unicorn, chimerical animal, as the symbol of the demon that surrounds the umbilicus of the house of Tarsus, and the fortress of the umbilicus as equivalent to the ancient property of the house of Tarsus, the rivers Odiel and Tinto as part of the country, and necessary to defend the scene, etc. And finally they included the image of the wise sword as expression of the lady, in that time the virgin of the grotto, to whom the knights of Tarsus were consecrated. On the blade, the heralds engraved the war cry of the lords of Tarsus, Honor et Mortis. The next king of Castile and Leon, Sancho IV reintegrated the region of Huelva to the crown of Castile and installed as lord to D. Juan Mate de Luna, but he assimilated the title and the arms of the House of Tarsus to that kingdom. As we will see right now, the county of Tarsival, victim of a great mortality years before, was feudalized by a Catalan knight who had given rights of his rising Mediterranean county in exchange of those further Andalusian shires. More than a century had lapsed since Bera and Bersha ordained the Golem to execute two missions, to comply with the extermination sentence of the Cathars, and to edify a Templar castle in Aracena. The first mission, as was seen, was carried out with neatness by the Cistercian Golems, about the second instead with no advance yet, while Ferdinand III, the saint, reconquests Seville in 1248, his son Alfonso X, the wise, seizes in 1258 the Algarve and Tuelva. And King Sancho II of Portugal, a short time before his death in 1248, he conquered Aracena, region that passed to integrate the crown of Castile in 1252. It can be assumed the urgency with which acted the Templars since the same moment in which Huelva was reconquered. In 1259, they had obtained a certification from Alfonso X that authorized them to occupy a property in the mountain range of Aracena and to fortify it conveniently, for the effects to shelter and defend the garrison, of two hundred knights. However, a few years before the omission of such certification, the Templars had localized the cave of Odiel, once charted the plans and excavated the foundations of the castle, all the mountain range of Aracena remained under the Templar control, including the population of Aracena and many minor villages. But the members of the chosen people who accompanied the Templars in the enterprise didn't come to an unknown place. The name of Aracena, in fact, comes from the Hebrew root Arai, which means mountains, being Arunda, the mountainous, synonymous of Aracena. This curious etymology has nothing mysterious if it is thought that the village was founded by the Jewish traders who traveled with the Phoenicians during the occupation of Tharshish, a thousand years before the actual age, which later was called 
Archelasus by Ptolemy, Aracena by the Greeks, and Vriato, which resisted on it to the Roman legions dominated by Arisana. For the Arabs was Dar Hazan, and due to the horrible food that the Saracens made when the Christians took by surprise the village, the Moorish Aracena. Since 1259 were dispatched troops to Aracena from many regions of Spain and even France. By luck, that during the construction remained 2,000 knights camped, assisted by 3,000 servant brothers. Such forces were distributed around the hills and performed a rigorous surveillance to avoid that the near dwellers could get closer to watch the works. The mates of Solomon, the Mason Guild, controlled by the Cistercians, concurred to the request of the great master due to, even if the order of the temple counted with their own division specialized in the military constructions, this fortress would have something different. In first place, it had to possess a great church, and in second term, that church would need to have a secret entrance communicated with its ships with the underground cave, so it was indispensable, the assistance of the College of Temple Constructors. The college entrusted the edification of the church to the master Pedro Milan. This one was authorized by the fiery Gollum Pope Alexander IV, the same who in these moments excommunicated Manfred de Saubia and procured the extermination of the Hohenstaufen and the ruin of the Ghiblian party to consecrate the church to the cult of the sorrows. Such dedication, of course, was not casual, but it obeyed to the Gollum plan by substituting to the Virgin of Agartha, the divine Atlantean mother of Navutan, for a Jewish Virgin Mary, who cried, distempered her heart, of fire due to the pain of the crucifixion of her son, Jesus. The Virgin of Agartha, on the contrary, didn't cry, neither experienced any pain in her heart of ice when his son of stone crucified himself in the tree of terror and died, but she rejoiced and shed her grace over the incarcerated spirits, because his son had died as the bravest white warrior who faced the illusion of the potencies of matter. The celebration of the cult to the Virgin of Sorrows was instituted, as could not had been in any other way by the effable Gollum Pope Innocent III when he introduced the sequence Stabat Mater in the Mass of the Sorrows, the Friday of the Passion of Jesus Christ. The Master Pedro Milan raised, then, for the Templars, the Church of Our Lady of Sorrows, Patroness, thence of Aracena, consecration that contrasted openly with the Virgin of the Grace and Happiness, Our Lady of the Grotto, who was venerated in the neighboring Signory of Tarsus, or Turdus, when the temple was finished, was deposited in her altar the image of Our Lady of the Greatest Sorrow, which is still conserved and received by the urban fourth, the hierarchy of priorate of the order of the temple. Simultaneously was feverishly worked in the construction of the castle, elevated with the church, to seven hundred mounts, fencing with walls and pits an adjacent area of Mudajar Tower. Five years later, the church and the castle were finished, and the surplus troops, as the constructors, brother of Solomon, were withdrawing serenely from the zone. Nevertheless, would pass many years before the local villagers would dare to get closer to the hill of the castle of Aracena. But the task was not at all what the Templars undertook against the house of Tarsus in those years. The castle of Aracena was an obligation imposed by the immortals, to which they had given loyal accomplishment. Now they would wait patiently the return of Bera and Bersha, for make that them use it in their plans. But this patience didn't mean immobility. On the contrary, once reconquered the regions and power of the Arabs, the order launched a campaign of occupations in all the country of Huelva, either seating garrisons and fortress in rescued cities, or building new churches and fortifying areas. The distribution of those occupations would not occur arbitrarily, but it obeyed to a rigorous plantification which objectives near lost the necessity to surround the house of Tarsus and conspire against the pact of blood. To remember the most important sites of those deployments, it is worthy to mention the session obtained over the convent St. Mary of La Rabida in Palos de la Frontera, in front of Huelva, from which I will talk again, or the complete possession of Lepe, the ancient Leptia of the Romans, situated six kilometers from Cataria, with a clear purpose to control the mouth in the river's piedras, from where they supposed that the lords of Tarsus could navigate secretly, or the suspicious interest to reside in the insignificant 
Trigueros, 25 kilometers from Valvedere del Camino, very near to Turtis, where they constructed a parochial church that still exists, is due to Trigueros, ancient Roman population, is nestled in the middle of a fertile and extensive campaign which constituted in remote times the heart of the Iberian Tartessos on its fields, where wisely disseminated tens of dolums and meniers, heritage of the Pact of Blood, that the Templars were dedicated in those days to destroy prolixly. Only one dolmen was saved in the village de Soto, that can be visited today due to the lords Mayano de la Sera, of the blood of Tarsus and traditional candy and honeymakers, prevented the Knights of Satan to fulfill their infamous mission. The village de Soto is located five kilometers from Trigueros, and the dolum is in the cave of Zanacoron de Soto. In the house of Tarsus, as is logic, such movements not passed unnoticed and obeyed to the lords of Tarsus to take some precautions. They fortified also the village of Turtus in the signorial residence because they believed that the Gollum were preparing to outbreak a crusade against them, claiming some heresy, perhaps denouncing the cult of the Virgin of the Grotto, and placed themselves in the area a force of five hundred Almogavers and fifty knights that was the maximum permitted to arm the Count of Tarsival for other purposes that were not reconquest. Unfortunately, nothing of these would be necessary, but the lords of Tarsus didn't achieve once again to prevent the diabolical plans of Bera and Bersha. To all this you will wonder, Dr. Signagel, what happened with the wise sword? Since that day in which Tartessos fell and the Vrayas occulted in it the secret cavern, the answer is simple. It remains in the cavern all that time. That's to say, for some 1,700 years until this moment, it was carried out in this manner, the vow that the men of stone made, the wise sword would not be exposed at the light of day again until the opportunity to leave not appears, until a future man of stone could see reflected on the stone of Venus the lytic sign of Katagar. For it, the lords of Tarsus established that a guard had to remain perpetually with the wise sword. What was not always possible, due to only a few initiates, were able to enter in the secret cavern. As you will remember, Doctor, the secret entrance was sealed by the Vrunes of Navotan since the age of the White Atlanteans, and resulted impossible to localize it by anyone who was not a Hyperborean initiate. That's to say, initiated in the mystery of the pure blood by the men of stone, by the wise warriors. However, except for a few and obscure periods, the House of Tarsus never stopped to produce initiates capable to perform the guard of the wise sword. But they were not such numerous in the times of Tartessos, when the cult of the cold fire was practiced at the light of the moon and existed a college of hierophants. In the next centuries, it had to be occulted the truth of the cold fire to the Romans, Visigoths, Arabs, and Catholics, being reduced to the celebration of the cult to the strictly familiar ambit. Even inside of such reserved familiar ambit, it had to be called only those who demonstrated a convenient Gnostic predisposition to face the test of the cold fire, which in nothing had changed and continued, being as terrifying and mortal as before. Except for those periods that I have mentioned, no member of the House of Tarsus was capable to enter in the secret cavern. The usual was the minimum formation of two initiates by century, in the worst ages, and of five or six in the most proliferate. If the initiate was a lady of Tarsus, was given to her the title Vraya, in remembrance of the Iberian guardians. If he was about a knight, he was called Noyo, which had been the name, according to the White Atlanteans, of the Hyperborean Pontifexes, that in the Atlantis guarded the Ark. It means the basal stone of the infinite stairway that they knew to build and that guided to the origin. It is obvious that, to comply with the vow of the men of stone, the Noyos and Vrayas had to become in hermits. That's to say, they had to dwell in the secret cavern and remain all the possible time with the wise sword, and no one could sever them, because nobody but them could enter in the abode. But such loneliness lacked of the importance for the initiates. The renounce and the sacrifice that demanded the function of the guardian of the wise sword was considered a high honor to the lords of Tarsus. According to what referred by who had entered and departed from the secret cavern, the work realized for many centuries by the initiates that remained there had gifted the site of some amenities. In fact, even though in the beginning was agreed to not introduce cultural objects, 
The truth is that the Noyles and Vrayas were carving patiently the stone of the cavern, and modeled chairs, tables, beds, altar, and a representation of the goddess of the cold fire. And in front of the countenance of Pyrene burnt once again the flame of the perennial lamp. But the countenance of the goddess not emerged this time from a manier, but was sculpted over a giant green stalagmite. Neither existed a mechanism to open the eyes, because they had been deeply excavated and were always opened, ready to reveal to the initiates the infinite blackness of themselves. In front of the countenance was the altar, which consisted of a cubic column topped by two echelons. The surface of the superior echelon reached to the chin of the goddess, and, over it, was a vertical hole in which was introduced the hilt of the wise sword, up to the quillion, in such manner that the same remained straight and aligned with the nose of the goddess, as if it were an axis of symmetry of the countenance. Thus the stone of Venus that was crippled, and the cross-guard of the hilt, appeared in the center of the scene, disposed for the contemplation." and the surface of the bottom echelon, under the level of the hilt, was placed the perennial lamp. Such section of the secret cavern had form of semispherical nave, being the stalagmite with the countenance of Pyrene in a near extreme to the wall of stone. This appeared gushed of lava and salts, while in the roof was presented bristly of greenish stalactites. The floor, on the contrary, had been carefully cleaned from the protuberances and leveled, in such manner that it was possible to put comfortably in front of the countenance of the goddess and contemplate as well, the perennial lamp and the wise sword with the stone of Venus. The necessary nourishment to subsist was provided by the lords of Tarsus, maintaining always filled the pantry of a chapel that existed at the foot of the hill Calendaria. Such chapel that had been constructed to the indicated purposes remained locked most of the year, and was only visited by the lords of Tarsus who went there to pray in the major loneliness. Therefore they took advantage of it to deposit the victuals in a small hind quarter, which unique door guided them to the hillside. The initiates descended there furtively, at night preferably, many times in the year, to provide themselves with food. Normally they found a sumpter and the adjoining farmyard, which they used to carry the lumps up to the secret entrance, and that they liberated later, because the animal returned meekly to the hedge. But in other opportunities the lords of Tarsus awaited in the chapel entire weeks until they coincided in some of those nocturnal visits. Then in the middle of the joy and reunion the Noyos and Vrayas received news from the house of Tarsus. Specially they inquired about the young members of the family, if one of them prepared seriously for the test of the cold fire, and if they noticed possibilities that he could overcome it. Nothing worried more to the men of stone and caliber ladies than to not be replaced by other initiates that the wise sword remained without custody. The lords of Tarsus by their part inquired to Noyos and Vrayas about the mystical visions. The lytic sign of Katagar has not manifested yet? Have they received a message from the liberator gods? When, O oh gods, when would come the day of the final battle? When the total war against the potencies of matter? When would they abandon the infernal universe? When the origin? It always occurred in a similar form until then. Because since the castle of Aracena was finished some tens of kilometers from the hill of Calendaria, a threat halo seemed to spread through the entire region. It was necessary, then, to extreme the precaution measures to supply the secret cavern, and were reduced to minimum the meetings with the hermit's initiates. In that time dwelled in the secret cavern three initiates, an old Vraya, woman of no more than seventy years, who for fifty years never abandoned the guard, a Noyo of fifty years, Nosa the Tarsus, who until the thirty years was a presbyter in the church Our Lady of the Grotto, and now was officially dead, and a young Noyo of thirty years old, Godo de Tarsus, who realized the function to supply the cavern. But Godo, son of the Count Odeleon de Tarsival, was not an improvised in risk issues, taken since he was a child to Sicily by one of the Argonese, who served in the court of Frederick the Second. He was a page in the palace of Palermo, and then shielded bearer of the Teutonic knight in Holy Land. Named knight as well in his twenty years, he entered the order of Teutonic knights and fought for five years in the conquest of Prussia. Since seven years ago he was in the guard of the secret cavern, although he passed for being still fighting in the north of Germany. He was an expert warrior, who knew how to move with precision in the battlefield. His incursions in the chapel were carefully studied, seeking to not be discovered by the enemy. 
I clarify this to discard the case that this negligence was the responsibility of what occurred later. The truth is that the enemy knew such place, and this was not ignored by the members of the House of Tarsus. According to the familiar saga, indeed, in the place where was the chapel of Hill Calendaria, the immortals, Bera and Bersha, had killed the Vrayas 1,700 years before. Since then, the lords of Tarsus thought to change the provisioning point, but the intense surveillance that they maintained in Aracena not revealed any moment in direction to the chapel, and all remained as this for the next four years. Every three or four months, the Noyogoro descended from the mountain range by surprise and unpredictable, and proceeded to transport the provisions to the secret cavern and only once a year he established contact with some of the lords of Tarsus. But the news were invariably the same. The Templars didn't effectuate any movement in such direction. But even if they had not acted now, they were there, very close, and their presence constituted the threat that was perceived in the atmosphere. Naturally, the Templars didn't act because they were awaiting the immortals, and they finally reached 140 years after the murder of Lupo de Tarsus in the fortress de Mazon. A ship of the Templar army, coming from Normandy, landed in Lisbon in 1268, with the abbot of Clairvaux, the great master of the temple, and a custody of fifteen knights. The great master explained to the Queen Beatrice that the expedition had for destiny the castle of Aracena, who would be named a provincial, obtaining all her support and subsequent authorization of King Alfonso III. The presence of Baron Bersha were not noticed there because they simulated to be servant brothers and were dressed like them. Days after the travelers took the ancient Roman road, which started in Lisbon and Seville and passed through Cortejana, a few kilometers from Aracena. Once in Aracena, the immortals approved all what the Templar did, referring to the edification of the castle. In the interior of the church, the floor of the apse, was the trap door that connected with the cave of Odiel. In reality, the cave was not exactly under the church, but it was necessary to reach it by a ramp tunnel, which access was in a wood stairway in the apse. But Bera and Bersha overlooked the details of the construction because their major interest was focused in the cave. They explored it inch by inch for hours, speaking to each other in a strange language that their four accompanists didn't dare to interpret. They were the abbot of Clairvaux, the great master of the temple, both golems, and two Templar preceptors, experts in Hebrew language. It means two rabbis, representatives of the chosen people. Apparently the inspection had positive results, that they divined by the expressions of the immortals because they were extremely serious in all what referred to the cave in their presence there. In any case, they only made one request, the adaptation to some symbolic form which they described with precision the mirror of a small underground lake, which was fed by a trickle of minimum volume. Also, such affluence had to be momentarily interrupted, diverting to the eroded water course of alimentation, and in certain places had to be distributed around the lake, seven menorah candelabrums. Twenty-second day. As Tartessos, as Saxony, as the country of Ock, the populations of pure blood would have to pay a hard tribute for opposing the Hyperborean wisdom to the cult of God the One. The crusade against the Cathars and other heretics of the Languedoc would go on with some interruptions for thirty more years. Thousands of Ockatan would end their lives at the stake. But at the end of the country of Ock would go returning slowly to the mother church. In 1218, Simon Montfort died during a siege in Tolosa that had been reconquered by Raymond VII. His son, Amory, lacking of the vocation of Gollum executioner, which Simon possessed in great level, ends to sell the rights of the county of Tolosa to the king of France, Louis VIII with which the Capetians legalized the intervention and would conclude to conserve all the country. But this was not casual. The frank occupation of the Languedoc would constitute an imperative objective of the Gollum strategy, 
mainly because it would allow to prohibit the wonderful language of Ock. The language of heresy, in favor of the medieval French, the language of the Benedictines, Cluniacs, Cistercians, and Templars. Such linguistic substitution would be the coup of grace for the culture of the troubadours, as the stakes had been for the Catharism. Added to the destruction of the civilization of Ock, the rest great works realized by Innocent III during his ecclesiastical reign, it is understood that when he died in 1216, he had supposed that the plans of the white fraternity were just to be fulfilled. The guarantee of it, the instrument of the universal domination, would be the younger emperor Frederick II, who in those days was totally agree with the Gollum's strategy. However, Frederick II would surprisingly change his attitude and would give a mortal strike to the plans of the white fraternity, and the main cause of that change, of that spiritual manifestation that emerged from his pure blood and transformed him into the Lord of Lords, was the effective presence of the Grail of Christos Lucifer. The Cathars indeed, paying the cruel price of the extermination to the Benedictine Gollum, had condemned them achieved in a hundred years to face an entire population of pure blood against the potencies of the matter. The pact of blood in this way was restored, but would not be possible to win in the confrontation, because it was not yet the time to outbreak the final battle over the earth. The moment was propitious, instead to die with honor and to await in Valhalla and Agartha, the sign of the liberator gods to intervene in the battle, which would come. But, even if the actual battle could not be won, the laws of the war demanded to inflict the highest possible damage to the enemy, and in that case, the major disgrace in the plans of the enemy would be produced by the manifestation of the Grail. For this reason, the Cathars, even by the fierce persecutions of the Crusaders and Golems that were decimating them, and the frightful mass killings of believers— they were working without intermission from Montsegur to stabilize specially the grail and approach to it in physical body. It can be considered that the concrete results of such Hyperborean strategy took place in the year 1217. Then the physical presence of the grail performed the tabula regia and confirmed that Frederick II Hohenstaufen was the real king of the white race, the only with the spiritual conditions to establish the universal empire of the pure blood. And in